Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 354 of Spittin' Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What's up, gang? One more week till we drop the puck. Can't wait. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the Eastern Conference and break down all the other shit that's gone down on since we last met. But, of course, we say hi to the boys first. Mikey G, producer, how we doing? What's going on, guys? I uh, I went to a wedding this weekend in Manchester, New Hampshire. So I Manch Vegas, Manch, Manch Vegas. Vegas. So Want to call their time, cup there? Not a big deal. The whole time I was I was out at night, just thinking I can only imagine Paul Bissonnet going out in this city. So we had some laughs, but uh, great weekend. Excited to talk some hockey, boys. A lot of bushy headed little hicks around, around that area. About twelve years old right now. There was a there was a place kitty corner to the rink and it was like the hot spot in town and like my first month there somebody got stabbed I want to say they were they were killed and they ended up dying so uh, oh, yeah dude, that was Jesus. pretty much yeah, I know <laughs> jeez Buzz Killington right yes, off the hop yes. here that's when you came down and we just used to go out to dinner and hang out that's when me and Wit started cooking up uh, what was going to end up becoming this podcast and, and getting the ideas I think one of the original ideas was uh, was we were going to end up going to a rink. Going in the locker room, we'd open up our gear bag and there'd be a six pack and we'd sit there and it'd be a YouTube show and we'd just tell stories. That was kind of the original concept. But what was the sushi place called? Dozu? We went Dozu? to Dozo a bunch. I think we went to like Uni or U- I don't even remember the name of the other one. But you'd just shoot on down once a week and we'd just, you know, hang out, chill on the couch, grab grab a little dinner, come back and end up figuring out what chiclets would end up would end up being. That's I don't right. know how that happened. And then I wonder, want to call their You're cup. like, bro, this is bullshit. I should be on the power play. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> man, you'll get there. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Wait, yeah, are you in a Victorian right. bedroom right now? What's, what's no, going I'm on in behind a, you? It looks like I'm in <laughs> a woman in your mom's named, bedroom. It looks like I'm in a oh, woman oh. named Gertrude's. It's a, oh, what do you say? Yeah, he's, he's in your mom's bedroom. I said he's like, in your mom's I bedroom. A, I gave him a little soprano. Oh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh. Um, yeah, this hotel. I didn't mean it was Wackner, all right. In Plymouth, I had to switch rooms because the first room... I think everyone at home knows it was 78 degrees. I said, I called down immediately. It wouldn't go down. I said, I need another room. Like, don't even try telling me there's another room. I would have driven back to Milton. But I'll tell you right now, now this room's 65. That's what I keep my hotel rooms at, 65. I sleep like a baby. But it does look like a woman named Gertrude lives here. The the, the shades is just, if you see this on YouTube, I mean, you're looking at absolute absolute travesty of, of the, 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 the bedroom decor in here. You don't fuck around with seventy-eight degrees. Oh no, <laughs> I wouldn't. I wouldn't sleep. I would fall asleep and wake up I, every ten minutes. It, that that does not work for me. Sixty-five is cold. I think. Six, uh, yeah. I think seventy is nice. Seventy is oh, nice. Seventy, you might always, as well. That's a, that's a sauna. Yeah. If it was 70. if it was so cold, I just like I wouldn't even want to get up and take a piss in the middle of the night. Okay, sixty-five but be, is freezing because yeah, you'll be so passed out because it's sixty-five, and apparently you sleep better the colder it is. Yeah, I, I'm sure that I'm sure once you get down to like 30s and 40s, if you're stuck outside for some reason, you're screwed. But I, I think in the 60 range, you'd rather sleep in 63 than 73. That's a fact, body wise. I don't usually go above, above 66 when I'm sleeping. Maybe do a little 69 if I'm feeling frisky. Biz. Oh come on, <laughs> 65 right. is like bedwetting yeah, temp for me. Like I won't. Right. I, I, I'll wake up and I'll be like, oh, I'll just wait to the morning, and the next thing you know, it's 5 a.m. and I got a fucking puddle on my mattress. Um, boys, I had a, I wouldn't say an adventurous week, but something adventurous happened to me. I don't know if you guys saw the clip, um, did a, an arena in Tampa Bay tell any of you guys to go fuck yourself or fuck off rather in unison, the, the dirty and, honey and, video clip. And, and rightfully so. Cause you fuck said you right. don't show up, you don't show up for the pre, uh, what do you call the, the pre the opening band? The, okay. The opening, What's very opening. funny about all this is when you said that, I kind of was like, wow, like kind of just a total disrespect to the bands that end up making it a lot of the times. And it wasn't like you. Usually you show you you have respect for the, the, the movies, you have respect for music, and it was just like I don't show up for the openers. Fuck them. I don't say that, first off. But second, I, I you know what though? This is probably a very good omen for Dirty Honey, because I gotta go back in time a little bit. Many moons ago I was going to see Aerosmith, and you know who was opening up for them? And I was like, oh, I don't know who that is. I'll just drink in the park a lot. The Black Crows. So I ended up becoming a huge fan of them, seeing them in the front row. Uh, I seen who was but you it? didn't go in didn't go in for the Black Crows no I, I was going to see Aerosmith it was 1990 and then another Aerosmith tour 
guess who was hoping for it this time? Guns N' Roses. I was like, who the fuck's Guns N' Roses? So and you didn't go in? Didn't go in, dude. They were, I mean, they were, they were up and coming. I wasn't like, you know, ahead of the scene at anything. So those are two bands I could have saw open. I didn't. So Dirty Honey, you join the list, which means you guys are going to be fucking superstars any day now. So I think it's a yeah, good they're gonna, and they're gonna And they're going to boycott you. You won't be able to get into the arena when they're playing. <laughs> I went and saw a J. Cole concert downtown Phoenix, and uh, Will Smith's son was playing. Jaden Smith, swear like his old man. He was. I, I don't know what he was doing, but it was fucking I, pathetic. The last oh, very the funny, worst. A very funny YouTube quickly. Will Smith. It's from I think the Family Guy. Like his clean rapping. You know, he never swore. Yeah, but it's like an imitation. Just Google Will Smith clean <laughs> rap. It's like wipe your shoes off before you come in the house. Somebody just clean that rug. Woohoo! It's just. <laughs> It's just all this like <laughs> polite, nice rapping. That's what Will Smith did, dude. Yeah, no getting swearing. jiggy with it. I went na, na, of na, 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 na. I went to a concert on Saturday night uh, at I think it blew, I think it's the Xfinity Center now, Comcast Center. I know it is Great Woods. Yeah. Uh, I actually the last concert I went there was eighth grade. I saw Smoke and Groove, so I think it was like Snoop Dogg, some others. It was crazy. Chris Stapleton, holy shit. Is this guy unreal? Talented. This guy, so I didn't know much. I knew two or three songs that I think a lot of people would know. And I'm not a huge country guy, but he's not the twangy, like, my dog died and my tractor broke down. Like, I don't like that country. But the Stapleton, man, I was blown away. He's got his wife on stage. He made it later in life. He actually went to school at Vanderbilt, I believe, for, like, engineering or something I was reading. Dropped out to get in music. And then was just writing songs, like, for Dirk Bentley, um, a couple other guys. I can't think Ken- of their names. Kenny right. Chesney? Kenny Chesney and Marty this guy's voice is unbelievable and he just stood there for two hours didn't move you know obviously he's not going to be out there dancing just stood there his wife's on stage she wrote songs also I don't know how they ended up meeting but I think like I think he's 42 43 and I don't know if he's he's somewhat newly like really famous and successful I believe but I I left the concert eight or nine songs I love now was listening to it the next day it was just awesome and I was really blown away by the guy's voice. He sounds a lot. I know this sounds crazy. He sounds like Chris Cornell, the singer who now died. He was the lead singer of uh, Audio Slave and yeah. Soundgarden, I believe, who had this really original voice. And, and Stapleton's voice, for some reason, reminds me of it. But the, the concert was an absolute hit. And it was weird. It was my first time probably around, like, you know, it was like 15, 20,000 people there and walking into the show. I haven't really, like, since COVID, I really haven't. I mean, I've been to a Bruins game, but I was sitting in a box. This one, it was just Not in the deal. midst of everyone, and I was like, this is weird. I didn't care, but it was definitely a weird feeling having not done that for so long. I don't know if you felt the same when you were at Dirty Honey, R.A., or actually showing, showing well, we, them up. No, we, should probably, we should probably roll the clip so people have a better understanding yeah, of exactly true. what happened. So last podcast, you, were you unfamiliar with who opened R.A. or well, the fact that the lead singer ended up coming up to you and saying hello? A, a few, he doesn't respect openers. No, a few people... I was like, oh, Ari, you got to check out this band Dirty Honey, you know, and I was like, yeah, if I get there, but I was with two other people who probably didn't want to go in to see it. We were sitting on the park, you know, doing the drinking thing. It was no disrespect. I, I'm not familiar with them. So I, and I, I don't typically go to open an act. You know, the last open an act I went to biz, I took my mother to see, I, I hated my mother's then boyfriend so much when I gave her a birthday present, I only gave her one ticket and I kept the other one so her boyfriend couldn't go. I took her to see Michael <laughs> Bolton and the, whoever opened for Michael oh. Bolton was the last fucking time I saw an open an act probably 30 years ago. Mike and Michael it? Bolton gets it going. It was Olita Adams. She sang that song, Get Here, that they played during the first Gulf War on Endlessly. I don't know if you guys remember it. And my, it was my mother. We weren't, we weren't boozing or nothing, so she wanted to go in, so we went in for the open and act. So that's legit, the last open and act. It's not a disrespect thing. I mean, you know, you're buying a ticket for the headline. I've seen the Stones 30 fucking times. I don't think I've seen an opener there once. Live in Color, a great band. Missed them because I didn't do the opener, so... It's just, it's just, I don't know, you know, you have, you think after a certain amount of time, you'd learn to just go in and see the opener considering you've missed this many well, good bands, na- but now I'll mush them. Now, if I go see them, then they're not going to become a star because they only become popular if I don't go see them. It seems so like. they should be thanking you. So let's roll the clip. And, and, and this is kind of the rebuttal that RA got for, for uh, pigeon tossing them. A fuck RA chant can get the crowd going, dude. That 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 place can bust. <laughs> Not the it. first one that happened. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple carpools to work right now chanting it, listening to the oh, show. Yeah, def- definitely. But hey, dirty honey, listen. Next time you're in the area, I promise I'll come see you. I I 
Hint the hot. When you guys are here, I, I don't want to say New England. I'll say in the Boston area next time. Hit me up, boys. I'll be there, front and center. Promise. Since since we're already on the band talk, I got to go back to last pot. I wasn't saying that Lauren Hill and the Fugees. <laughs> oh, I love were, who you no, fucking fuck try to you walk guys. this back, you <laughs> bitch. <laughs> Listen, you tried saying they were bitch. as big and don't even, you were like, whoa, no. the Fuji's, bro. Pump, pump the brakes. What I was saying is I think that them getting back together is big, bigger news than the Rolling Stones going on another world tour. Tour They do it every two years. And to the point where Mick Jagger's going to pubs in, in Charlotte and he doesn't even get noticed. All right, I'll let you take that it over. That picture was really cool that that picture was released. He had his hat down low, but apparently the people to the right were like, They've seen him 50 I, times, R.A. He was style, wearing a balaclava. I, oh, but, but R.A., I'll tell you right now, and you can disagree or agree with me, I think Paul Biznasty Bissonette, I think he got a little bit of social media blowback, and he's just fucking changing his opinion based on what people were telling him because he was pretty, pretty, pretty confident the Fugees were a bigger deal than the Rolling Stones. I think I think it's bigger news that the Fugees are getting back together after the time they've been apart than, than the Rolling Stones doing another world tour. How many times have the Rolling Stones basically said this is Dude, a they're 78 shebang. years old. I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. They said, so, so you're more in awe of the fact that, like, wow, these guys are this old still doing it, and yet, considering how much they've partied, they're still alive yeah, doing it? Yeah, I was yeah. going to say, I'm in awe. They're, they're walking okay. around breathing. And like, okay. the, actually, I, I, going back to the, the dive bar, like, I read up the article, shot the Charlotte, I, the Charlotte News and Observer, I think it's called. Their uh, newspaper did a write-up about it, how Jagger showed up at this dive bar. But they said, like, that's the type of bar where a guy like even Mick fucking Jagger can walk in and – it's like the locals just don't bother him. Now, I could also see, a, you see an old, like, skinny. I mean, he's like 5'6". He weighs 140 pounds, all muscle, like all sinewy. Just with a hat muscle? on, drinking a beer. No one's Mitch expecting Jagger isn't all muscle. No, he's bones and, and coke. He's bones and coke. He's fucking <laughs> chiseled, dude. He's in the best fucking shape of probably any 78-year-old guy on the planet. Dude, he oh, runs yeah. around for two and a half. Dude, my father's a year younger than him and can't get out of fucking bed without assistance. Jagger's doing two and a half hours for 25, 40,000 Yeah, because he's on PEDs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's 78. But so, yeah, the die thing, I think, I guess he stayed for like one quick beer. But yeah, if I, I mean, I wouldn't have left him alone. I would have fucking, I would have had to keep myself. You'd have been dry humping yeah. his leg. I mean, I was well, pissed when in the were... back of your van right now in, yeah. in Southie. You'd be like <laughs> giving him a couple, cup of water and some Cheerios every day to get some more lyrics out of him. I was pissed when I found out they were rehearsing for this tour in Boston for a month. But that's how low key they keep it. Like, Fucking none of my little gossip pounds for hell. Because I, I would legit stock the hotel trying to get Their pictures. rider list is like applesauce, bag of blow, six-pack of beer. I bet you Lauren Hill gets uh, noticed at that bar, though. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Even y, even y Clef Jean would have got noticed. <laughs> I'll be gone till November. Lauren, <laughs> Lauren Hill's tax guy would have got noticed at that pub. Biz, at one of the, actually, I got to go back. This that at One of those Aerosmith shows, me and my brother and my cousin, I was probably like 17 or 18, during they were singing Dream On, you know, it's one of their big ballads. And, like, all of a sudden, I felt Never the t- heard of it. tap my shoulder. Dude, my brother and my cousin were there. They'll vouch. Girl just fucking lunged at me, slapped the mug right on me. It was like, never happened to me before in my life. Not sure it's happened since. Like, like it was like an eighth grade dance. I didn't know. She's a total stranger. She just grabbed me and fucking threw the Started mug on me. Started making out with you? Making out with me. And my, bar- my brother and my cousin, like, cheering, pat me on the back and shit. They still, I mean, it's like legendary story among the family. They still talk about it. But first time legendary. I ever got pearl elaborate like that. The craziest thing is there's now probably like a bar in Moose Jaw that would recognize R.A. before Mick Jagger. And that's, that's not true. even a fucking lie. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Well, speaking of Canada, Mr. Whitney, we have some incredible news for our great neighbors to the north. Stop. Both time, guys. We've been trying for you. Go yeah. ahead, Ari. I'm sorry. That's okay, buddy. Starting Thursday, Chicklets is going to have a merch warehouse in your beautiful nation along with a new Canadian website. So that means no more duties, no more exorbitant shipping fees, which we had nothing to do with. The places set their, set their own rates and no more long waits to get your stuff when it opens for business, the site is storeca.barstoolsports.com. Also going to have exclusive merch only available in Canada. We are so psyched this finally happened. We got these bad boys made up. Show, show them, whoever has them on. So, Those are very sick. And I, we, listen, we understood your, your very valid. I wouldn't even call them complaints because they were, they were very valid. Uh, you know, it, it was expensive and maybe too much cost prohibitive to, to order a T-shirt or two or three. So uh, we're psyched. We have this finally going, and uh, everybody take advantage of it because we don't, we don't want to fucking make you have to pay through the nose to get our swag, especially biz. 
I mean, do you want me to hop in here considering I'm the Canadian on the podcast? I, was, I mean, I'm, I'm just happy that we don't have to hear people uh, letting us know how expensive it is to get shipped to them in Canada. And uh, finally, some of these issues sometimes are not the easiest to resolve. But thank you to Barstool, Grinelli, and the, and the whole merch team. They figured it out. And uh, especially with, uh, with the holidays and Black Friday coming around the corner, the fact that you don't have to pay duty and these ridiculous shipping fees is, is, uh, is good news for us. And uh, now, we're, now we're rolling. Now we're now we're rolling, boys. So Biz, that's that's To uh, your second favorite team because you're a Canadians fan now. Ra, that's Montreal, and G, you're uh, the Flames. Calgary, yeah, Calgary, yeah. Those are sick. I love how the the, the Maple Leafs right where the Barstool logo is on our logo. Um, that's so awesome. we'll be doing a lot of that. We'll be doing a lot of like Canada exclusive merch for them, just because we've kind of left them out to dry for the past two years. It's been tough. It's been really really tough to get this done. But like. W- we got them now. We got some nice. Well, merch, they so. got shafted on the Pink Whitney. They had to wait like three or four extra months. They got shafted on the merch for so long. So, thank you for your patience, everyone north of the border, my fellow Canadians. We love you guys. They can't get you. a cup, but they'll get our merch. <laughs> um, I know we kind of <laughs> got uh, off the rails there a little bit in the intro, but I uh, I had a pretty relaxing weekend. Although I did get to go check out ASU's uh, first game at home to kick things off against UMass. Did they retire Walker's number yet? <laughs> no, Johnny <laughs> Walker has to show his social security card to get in there. Or what do old people get actually? Him and Mick Jagger are ba- battling it out. Senior uh, it, was against, it was against <laughs> UMass Lowell, and it was uh, Shane Doan, Josh Doan's first game in college, three apples and a victory. No way. Yeah, for ASU. They ended up playing uh, the next night, so uh, Sunday night. Um, and they ended up dropping that one. We had two assists in that game. So five assists Just so five far. Points or two yeah, games. five points in two games. Donor was there. Uh, Is I ended ASU up going with my good... ranked like preseason? Or are they? Uh... No, no, they're not. Well, they're not in the top ten. Oh well, they could be top twenty then. I don't know. They're, they're, they're a top twenty are. team, but our our other barstool athlete because we have Johnny Walker who's one of our barstool athletes. We also have Daryl Watts. They just got the number one seed. She plays for Wisconsin. So we got a number one seed under our belt over here. What do you mean seed? You mean ra- the number one they're, team? Yeah, they're the number one ranking, number one ranked team in the tournament. I mean, in the at the whole season. Okay, yeah. I think a seed would going, be like it's a I tournament. said that like an idiot. The number one team ranked going into the season. Because so. seed would mean that if they're heading into yeah. the tournament already? Yes, yes. He misspoke. Okay. Leave him alone. Hey, you just mentioned Pink Whitney merch. We also just dropped some new Pink Whitney merch with 100% of the net proceeds going to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. So if you like to get some new PW swag and help a cause that affects, unfortunately, pretty much everybody these days, uh, it's posted on our social media pages. Uh, I think Instagram is back up and running. So check out Twitter feed, Instagram. Again, 100% of the net proceeds are going to uh, the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. If you want to help out and get a nice uh, PW jersey, do so. I actually saw a guy in a pink Whitney uh, like hoodie. I think it was a hoodie. It might have been the, the Peter Millar. And I was walking out of the concert, and he had it on. I was like, bro, awesome, awesome drink. He's like, yeah, it's pretty solid, dude. Tough hangovers, though. <laughs> I just kept going. He had no fucking clue. Uh, I was just like, this is perfect. Well, speaking of Pink Whitney, hit your local bar and order some. Whether with club soda or as a shot, you can't go wrong with that smooth Pink Whitney. Check it out. All right, boys. Last week, we had uh, Vegas goalie Robin Leonard on the show. Uh, The feedback was great. He was obviously very open, very honest, very funny. Uh, And then shortly thereafter, he went on, I guess you call it a little tweet run over the weekend about his experience in Buffalo, the way teams issue medication to players, uh, his opinions on Elaine Vigneault and a bunch of other things. And, you know, it caused a pretty significant ripple over the, I guess, NHL social media sphere over the weekend. Well, the NHL reached out to him to see if he wants to sit down and chat um, it's become a big thing. And apparently, I guess some folks misconstrued his comments because he was talking about um, the Philadelphia Flyers. Allegedly, this is all, we're just, you know, pa- passing the word along. Allegedly, may have the way they may have handed medications out to their players, while at the same time giving his opinion on Elaine Vigneault. And I think people kind of cross-pollinated them and misconstrued him and thought he was saying that Elaine Vigneault was giving pills out, which I don't know how people thought that, but they did. So then uh, Elaine Vigneault had a comment about it. It's been this whole big fucking hullabaloo. Um, So anyways, Biz, I know you want to chat about it and want to chime in here. I mean, other than the fact that obviously there's a bit of a language barrier there and it seemed like he was on this Twitter storm. So it was definitely misconstrued. Uh, He seemed very hot at the time when he was sending out these tweets, basically like saying, hey, I got more information. And uh, as you said, it kind of just snowballed into a a bit of a fiasco. And Vigneault ended up, I think he made light of it saying, you know, I I would consider myself more experienced than a dinosaur. And then said, you know, we treat our players professionally here. Uh, 
didn't really shy away from the fact that yes have I been hard on players in the past and you know do we do we hold our players to a high standard but you know never would would he be in charge of handing out medication to players like that is just like a ridiculous thing to to kind of misunderstand through Twitter so wait I I don't even know what really how to keep going on this I'll throw it over to you yeah I think Leonard's a very opinionated guy and he told us I mean it's like he's 90% of what he would want to say. He covers up 90% of what he would want to say, and he still kind of slings it around. Um, I think that it's kind of obvious, right? Like Nolan Patrick came over there from Philly to Vegas, so he must have been talking, and Leonard decided to kind of go into what he either told them or he heard from somebody else. And I did think it was a little odd to just kind of go at Philly that way, considering he'd never really played for them. Um now, he told us he despises a coach in the NHL. I kind of have to guess that's Vigneault. He didn't tell us in the interview. He didn't tell us after. But the way he went after him publicly, I kind of, after mentioning to us that there was a guy he really hates, I don't know if that's the case. But I would imagine that Vegas and Pete DeBoer and the kind of staff's like, oh, <laughs> you know, this is kind of the last thing we really want or need right now. But Robin Leonard's his own person. He's going to do what he wants. He's the starting goalie there, and I don't think in his mind it'll affect his play at all, but he's certainly outspoken to the point where he's got some major issues with the NHL. I think he mentioned that he does love the league and love what it's given him in his life, but he obviously also has some... uh, He's got some beefs with certain people, and he's not afraid to share it. But it was it was wild to see the comments and kind of how it was going with the season not having started and nobody having anything else to talk about. You're just kind of diving into some accusations that are a little a little rough to hear. Yeah, especially after having him on the podcast, it's evident that he does want change. Uh, yes. Sometimes, in order to create that, you got to kick up a little dust. Uh, I don't know if if this is exactly the way he wanted it to go in a sense of his his words being misconstrued as far as people thinking that he's accusing Elaine Vigneault of of, of giving his players pills. So I don't know. It uh, yeah, it got a little bit messy there. I hope it can get riled in and there's some good, good, solid communication between him and the league and moving forward. You know, maybe they could take some of what he says and, and, you know, implement it into some sort of change. So whatever that may be. I I don't know. We weren't we weren't involved in these types of discussions. We had him on the podcast. He said what he said. You can go back to last episode and listen to what he said. Uh, none of that was brought up, but uh, he definitely had his opinion on the Jack Eichel situation, which we have, and we I think all kind of share his opinion on how big of a fucking joke that is. So uh, we can leave it at that. Yeah, I'm just curious to see if there'll be any sort of ripple effect with other players. Maybe it'll empower other guys who might not be likely to speak up and whatever issues they might have. Probably not because it is the NHL. We talk about the uniformity and conformity about it all the time. But, you know, we'll keep tabs on it. And just to go back, and, what, excuse me, Biz, what, what you okay, just said with about allegations with the Flyers, this uh, Drew Wheeler, I don't know what outfit he works for. He's since protected his tweets. But he re, he said sources the Flyers training staff gave Nolan Patrick non-prescribed Ambien and Benzos to help with his traumatic head injury while not disclosing the medication given to him at the time. Just you had mentioned that. That's, that kind of added not fuel to the fire. It was just kind of confirming, I guess what people are suspecting about the team that didn't come from Robin Lane or this guy reported on his own. So again, okay. we just pass things along here sometimes that other people say we don't, we can't speak to the veracity of any of it, but it's noteworthy and newsworthy. So we like to share it. Let's talk about some fun stuff, boys. Yeah. Vancouver signed a pair of RFAs defenseman Quinn. Please stop calling me fucking Grinelli Hughes and forward Elias Pedersen. Quinn Hughes deal is for six years worth 47.1 mil, comes out to 7.85 mil a year. He does not have trade protection. He will be a 27-year-old unrestricted free agent when the deal expires. Pedersen has a three-year bridge deal for 22 mil, comes out to 7.35 million a year. Also no trade protection. He'll be a 25-year-old restricted free agent when his deal ends. Reactions, boys? Love it. Love both contracts. Um, ideally you could get them both a little bit longer, but in the end, this is what they got done. Those guys are probably furious. They got to leave Ann Arbor. They've been living it up at Michigan <laughs> parties, hitting up football games, Taking going back to cut. college. Pedersen's like, fuck, I would have gone to college, but the cap hit wise is a great number for both of them. I think you've seen some numbers. Some of these D men have got now there's people who dog Quinn Hughes a little bit like any player in the league, right? I think he's awesome. I love the way that he's kind of changed that entire defense in terms of him being able to play so many minutes. He skates so well. I I actually think that uh, six years for him is great. The good thing also is that at 27, he's going to sign another monster oh contract. So 
He could end up making 120 million. Who knows how that's going to go? But in the end, to get both those guys there and at least get them into camp and get them going so they're not going to miss too much time, I think it's so important for that team to take that next step and just to have these guys finally locked in. And now Brady Kachuk is all by himself. Well, he uh, won. Yeah, I, I don't know what that, that situation is, but going back to uh, to Quinn Hughes, six years at that number. I mean, whew, I mean that is that is that is a great deal for Vancouver. Although you did say that they he, they do lose him for those extra two years. I mean, obviously them being able to lock him up for eight as a, as a max. Um, but he just drives that offense and, and, and people, when you say people knock him, you're probably talking about on the defensive side of the puck, but when you're a one man breakout and you can drive offense from the back end as he does, I mean, that's where the game is headed. And these young guys have all the, they, they got the reins and, and, you know, they have all the, the, the power and negotiations and mind you, that kind of went up when they ended up teaming up and grabbing the same agent. Yeah. So it was kind of bad news for Jim Benning and uh, and whoever his capologist is, whether it's himself or, or, or somebody else. But uh, I know that after this year, they might be in a little bit of trouble, of trouble as far as what the cap is. But, uh, hey, let's see how they do this year. And I tweeted it out, man. This team is looking very good. They got a great one-two punch in the back end. I know people knocked the Tyler Myers contract, but now he's kind of the number three there, and I think he fits in perfectly in in a sense of what his workload will be and as far as their guys up front they have a really really good top six who can work in well together and and I mean they're as far as their their best offensive player they just got him in for three years now how many more gonna be RFA yes he will be RFA for I believe two more years after that all right can you help me out on that Pedersen, you're, you're, I don't know how many. He'll definitely be a RFA when he after this contract. I'm not sure if it's uh, two or three more. I, I'll be that shit always jumbles my brain. I I I have a math fucking issue. I I don't know how many years afterwards. Excuse me. It'll be it'll be one more year because okay. he. So so has Pedersen fin- finished his entry level contract or did, was that after his second year that he just signed no, he, that? He just finished his ELC. Okay, so then you got another three years. I think you're locked in for seven as a player, is what I believe when when it comes to the new CBA. So, um, there, uh, yeah, that's going to be an interesting one when he's got that one year of RFA left and and, and see where he goes. Um, yeah, that's pretty much all I got on that. Vancouver is uh, they're looking good in that Pacific Division, which we'll get to next week when we do the breakdowns. Uh, you did mention Brady Kachuk. He's the well, not the last restricted free agent, but certainly most the most significant one that's left. Um, our boy Strick just dropped this on Twitter a little while ago. He said the Senators want a seven to eight year deal while Brady wants a bridge deal. So I don't know. This, I don't blame him. Uh, cl- I mean, it's a classic it, it, NHL know, thing here. Sorry, quickly. It's yeah. It's like how, and now Shabbat signed. What did Shabbat sign? Seven or eight years? He signed a long one with with the Senators. Yeah. I believe you can quickly check that. G. But eight, in terms eight. of Brady Kachuk, he probably is like I don't know. Wh- he's, so I don't know where this team's going. I don't necessarily want to commit, even though the money's amazing. I don't necessarily want to commit to eight years here. I mean, like I know Otto has an amazing prospect pool. I think one of the number one teams yeah. in the in the league in terms of prospects. But if you're not necessarily in love with where you're living or playing, and the team hasn't had success, it's tough to just hop right in for eight years. So I can kind of understand him wanting a bridge deal, and the team obviously wanting him to lock him up. So I don't think he'll miss that much time. But in the in the end, they can't figure it out quite yet. Well, wait, we just talked about it last podcast. Now, mind you, Ottawa looking a lot better as far as prospect pool than Buffalo, but Rasmus Dahlin just did it. And he's probably wondering the same thing. He's like, if I'm not going to see an improvement here, and I mean, you probably the best example is seeing Eichel get locked in for eight years at 10 a year, and he's seeing the situation that he's going through. He's like, yeah, I'm going to be very comfortable with the bridge. Let's see how things plan out. Because regardless of this prospect pool, all they are is, all they are is prospects. They don't have any games played. We, we don't know what way this organization is going to head. So uh, definitely some 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 conflicting uh, you know asks there. And I think uh, I, I don't blame I don't blame Brady. And, and given that lineup and what they have right now, I think he kind of holds all the cards, and he will end up getting that bridge deal. Yeah, and it's certainly not a money issue as uh, Ottawa has. Let's see, twenty two and a half million caps in cap space right now. I so. think they're the lowest they salary a, cap they in the a, league right now. They got to sign uh, Jimmy. Jimmy Stutzel. Jimmy Stutzel, yep. He's he's only in his second so, year, right? Yeah, yeah I know, yeah. but at some point. Yeah, like, some yeah I'm point. just thinking in, in terms of like, yeah, there's definitely like a bright future there with the prospects, but 
I don't really blame a guy for not wanting to dive in all in for the next eight years there. You know, he's got like Keith on one one ear and Matthew on the other, like oh, like hold out, hold out, be Let's a try to get together at some point. <laughs> one of us, one of us. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, shit. Hey, we we got an apology here. We had a huge oversight on something that happened while we were on break. Um, hand up. I, I, I must have missed it and didn't get called on it. King Henrik re- officially retired while we were on break, and somehow it was an oversight. So we want to wish him the best. Uh, a truly, truly humble superstar. We were very fortunate to interview him a couple of years ago, and he really is just a regular guy, super nice guy. And uh, the Rangers are going to retire his number on uh, January 28th of 2022 so king henrik you're the best thanks for everything you've done to be the first game <laughs> ever where it's all women at the game <laughs> you're like holy Just, shit, yeah. 20 they're gonna be squeegeeing the here. ice everyone's gonna be all horned up out there but uh and, and the send-off he deserves guys i mean it was a really tough ending to, to the heart yeah. condition he ended up having before he ended up playing for the washington capitals had to sit out the entire season i'm sure everybody was concerned about what was going on with his health he kept giving updates he did an awesome interview with kevin weeks um, I don't know if it was for NHL.com or or uh, e- e- uh, what's the other one the the, the show with uh, NHL Network, excuse me. So if if you want to check that out, but uh, it's cool. I think he's actually in NYC right now, and I texted him to come on the pod. He says, "Hey, give me some time. I'm working on something really special right now." So I don't know what that is, but uh, something at some point will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was a fifteen dollar haircut that he uh-huh. gets. I got to go see his guy after my piss poor experience here. Do it like when you go back and look at. If you want to go back and read Six Ten's blog, he's our Rangers blogger. Does a great job. He did a real big number crunching on Lundqvist. Dude, his numbers in the playoffs that like run of like maybe five eight years. If the Rangers even had one more goal scorer on that team, they probably would have won two Stanley Cups. Like Lundqvist was that good for that long. That team really fucking didn't help him out, man. Offensively. No. Fair point. Fair point. Uh, moving he got right. that gold medal. At least yeah. he got the gold medal. I mean, he's that was pretty. He's got a lot of other things too. So, congrats, King Heinrich, once again. Enjoy retirement. Uh, let's see. Last Wednesday night, we got our TNT debut for exhibitions. I thought the game presentation was pretty good. There were a little minor hiccups, the audio and video and whatnot, but it was essentially a dress rehearsal. What did you think? What uh, What did you think? I got what, a major uh, issue with that angle, that camera angle. You know the one I'm talking about, the down low one. Okay, yeah. They can't be showing games on on that, right? Biz, you you got to go in there. You got to tell them. I guys. didn't. I didn't notice it that much. I just yeah. Noticed how the, right here we go. No, all, all all I noticed was the graphics. I noticed uh, Rick talking about how he was running uh, bar mitzvahs uh, during his playing career, talking about when guys would cross check him in the back, and then he'd come up with the heel of his fucking skate and blade their cock off. He's so a loyal. <laughs> I just couldn't believe the camera angle. It was down low and making me a little dizzy. Now, maybe it's something where you just got to get used to it, but just give me the old school, regular camera angle of an NHL game. Sometimes I think things can be over overthought. But other than that, I mean, it looks cool. It's new. It's different. You're saying I'm full of shit that I didn't notice it. The only thing that I noticed on social media was people saying that they didn't think the talk's mic was turned on when it first kicked off. And that was the, and then, and then of course, during the feed, it kind of broke up a little bit. So they were working that out, but no, I didn't notice the camera angles with. I like, I like the score bug with the scoreboard. It was nice and small up in the corner. You just had all of the game basically in one little tiny box, which, you know, it's not a huge deal, but it, it helps the, the viewer experience. What about you, G? I mean, I think for a company that's never broadcasted hockey before, I thought like the future, it got me so excited to watch hockey. Just the way I, I, I loved everything about it. I just thought the whole setup in between periods as well was great, and I can't wait to see uh, Busy Boy up there. Wait, so when you're, you're talking about that angle, you're talking about the whole game feed, like where it was. It wasn't where it was the placed? whole time. It wasn't the whole time, oh. though. Boys, I can't wait for Biz's debut. I got my OCB rolling papers all set to go that night because <laughs> OCB is the largest rolling paper brand in the world and has been one with nature, crafted naturally since 1918. So you know they've perfected the process for a consistently great session time after time. And now's your chance to join the OCB family forever. You got to hear this deal. OCB rolling papers are giving a lifetime supply of rolling papers, cones, and some fresh new swag to their loyal fans. I wonder how they figure out lifetime supply for certain people, but can figure that out later. But anyways, make sure to check them out at OCB underscore USA today for a chance to win. All you have to do is follow them at OCB USA on Instagram, like the OCB high haul post, and tag two friends in the comments to win. 
There's also a shortcut on ocbusa.com slash chicklets with a link to enter on Instagram right now. You must be 21 plus to buy the papers and follow the social accounts. Good luck. But seriously, if you partake, I mean, papers for life. I mean, they might not last you for life depending on how, how long your sessions are. But it's an unreal deal. Whatever you take in, whatever you like, OCB, I've been using them for months now. They're super papers, so... Enter. Try to win. One uh, one thing I got to go back to, so you're pretty critical of it already. You don't like the suits with the sneakers. Oh, yeah. I forgot I had this down further. Yeah. Who did I see with them? Oh, yeah. The, the guys in the pro- uh, podcast that, I mean, uh, the telecast that night. I've been saying it for years. I n- haven't necessarily said it on the show. And you guys make fun of the way I dress. I, I you know, I laugh at it all the time. I always say I look good when I have to. And I think nothing, there's nothing to detract more from a nice suit than a pair of fucking sneakers. You, it just, it, it defeats the purpose of wearing a suit. Like, you just, you, I don't know, you look like a fucking 15-year-old. You don't know style, though. Okay. I, just, <laughs> I mean, I just think it Good looks rebuttal. I think Good it, rebuttal. I think it's just, I mean, do you wear sneakers with your suits with? I actually, I actually never have. I actually okay. never have. But, but. You can still argue but, about it. I'll, well, no, but I'll say this. If you dress in sweatpants all the time and you have, like, numerous amount of, like, Former NFL, M- MLB, like NHL guys who obviously have really nice clothes and suits and they have these people dressing them, putting these nice sneakers on. I would assume that they know more than you. Now, it is an opinion, right? So you're not ro- incorrect. You just don't like the look. I just think it, it, it does. It's not something that like bothers me in a sense. that I'm like, they look like 15 year olds. I think most of the time guys look pretty good on TV. Avery would disagree. Avery dogs everyone's suits. Maybe he hates the sneakers as well. All right. That'd be a good guy to ask. But if it pissed you off, it pissed you off. Things that bug RA, I never mind. Who's the first R- guy you've seen do it? Robert Kraft. Bingo. I think he, I, I think he, I think he wears the Air Force Ones when he like, does it, doesn't he? Yeah, he's the so first I, person I've seen do it. So at when I saw you tweet that, I, I, I was actually con- I, I was actually considering at some point to rock those Law Vin sneakers with my suits. Now, these guys, especially if it's a double header, which they were there, and I don't think it was Wednesday, the first broadcast. I believe it was Thursday. They're sitting there six hours at the desk, so I can understand why wearing – you know, dress shoes might not be that appealing. So I might consider doing it depending how I feel after my first couple nights wearing like nice, nice uh, dress shoes. So you're seeing more and more guys do it specifically on these NFL feeds. And I think that you kind of alluded to it, Wit, was was seeing these like you'll see like pro bowlers who are on like the, the NFL network or whatever it may be, and they all got the nice dialed in suits with you know, they some of them are wearing like Nike sneakers and stuff, which I think are that's a little bit much. But uh, you know, they kind of have these like dress type sneakers, like the Cole Hans or whatever it may be. So I guess I was pretty indifferent about it. But once you ended up uh tweeting that out, there was a lot of people chiming in that that really agreed with you. Yeah, so. I just think it looks better with, with shoes. And shoes can be uncomfortable, but here's how infrequently I get dressed up. I was at a funeral a couple months ago for a family member, and I had you know, a full suit on. One of my, my father-in-law was like, hey, come here. He's like, get against the wall. And he's got his iPhone. He goes, I got to take a picture of you. I, have never, I don't think I've seen you in a suit since you got married. So I got people taking pictures of me at funerals because that's how infrequent I wear a fucking suit. R.A. puts a suit on and reaches in the pocket, and there's a Motorola Razor because it's been fucking 17 <laughs> years since he put one on. <laughs> His old cell phone. Uh, uh, what was the other thing about suits? Oh, Biz, the, didn't you get the, like ten new ones? Yeah, I'm hoping that they get right. in on time. Oh, so if, if not, if not, I'm gonna have to wear my gray one, and then after that, I'm going to NYC with you guys. I think we're gonna end up filming another sandbagger. But to kick off the season, uh, we're gonna go do a live stream, watch uh, Yans' first game in Philly. Unfortunately, Hazy with that was it an abdominal surgery he got yep. or groin abdominal abdominal so he will not be in the lineup but they're going to be playing their first game uh, in philly i want to say it's the night of the 14th against vancouver oliver ekman larson's new squad and then garland's there too some some familiar faces for us and uh, we're going to be live at the sports book having a good time probably gambling on the game i believe teddy purcell will be joining us and he'll probably be the guy who we get in the sandbagger with we don't know who his partner's going to be but uh yeah i i hope to have those new suits but if i don't wit I'm going to have to go back-to-back gray suit, the one I've had for like four years. This thing's been dry cleaned 30 times. It's gotten the shit kicked out of it. It's got Off cum stains now. on oh. it. Oh. It's got it's got the Motorola flip phone, like RA in the one hey, pocket. Hey, no, at least I get the like new slender style. I mean, you guys saw when I went on Fox when the Bruins were in the cup. You even said I look good. I, you know, I don't you have those. Great. 
I don't look like I, I got drafted by the Knicks back in the 1996 draft with those big boxy fucking suits. On I should just Ralph Sprewell. Hey, I should just go to like a, a, a pre-owned suit store and get the NBA style and just go like just yeah. go off the rails first. Penny night Hardaway, at just... 14, 14 buttons. Well, we got keeping with the sartorial theme here, Biz. The Coyotes. They come out and they said they yep. were going to relax the game day duds. And it, it was funny. It came out. I, I don't know if that was a panda bump as well from Lana. But the day after he was talking about individuality, the Coyotes come out and said, hey, we're going to relax them. Now, I don't know if they can wear whatever they want, if they got to have limits. But I think it's it's fun and it's good that teams are finally uh, going to approach this way of thinking. Well, we, we ended up talking to Butchergrass, who's going to be our guest. And Ooh. sorry for, for, for stealing your thunder there, R.A. Well, and when I did that EA shoot with uh, Austin Matthews, that was the one thing that he said. He goes, I want us to have no dress code. We can stroll in with whatever track seatos, whatever we want to wear. We're the hype beast now. The hype beast generation. So that's the first little bid for the Arizona Coyotes to steal Matthews over from the Toronto Maple Leafs. So I would imagine that uh, Matthews to the Coyotes confirmed. Jamal <clears throat> Adams. At some point. I think Jamal Adams is the guy's name. He's like a safety on the Seahawks. He went to the post game presser with a black uh, suit coat and no shirt on underneath. <laughs> Just a monster chain and an enormous tattoo, you could see. So that would be money to see an NHL guy with just a straight up suit coat, chest hair ripping. I'm not sure. Vetchkin. If you guys saw those Mike McKenna tweets I included in the outline, but. He, I thought they were pretty good. He said, people realize that dressing up 12-year-olds in a shirt and tie for hockey games just perpetuates assimilation and suppression of personality, right? I mean, I think he was probably stirring the pot a little bit. And what? Was, What'd he say? He said... A suppression of personality by making he, kids at a young age doing it. Yeah, it might have been a bit hyperbolic, but... But I, yeah, I, I mean, you know, I thought... talking about like, McKenna. What are you talking about, bud? Well, in other words, like when you're telling young kids from that age, like we're talking about letting guys show their personality, but when you're making them wear suits and ties at fucking 12... That kind of takes away from their personality. That's what Mike's saying, I'm, I'm assuming. And he says, you know, people love going nuclear with this, with these responses. Oh, yeah, this because one guy said, so would you rather have them show up with pants that are down on their ankles, big, ugly, Jankos. puffy jackets? That's what I wore. And he's I like, turned out all right. The janks. <laughs> he said, if the suit requirement went away, you would see some slick, clean looks from players, and it would be marketable. That's what he was really talking about, was the marketable aspect of things. But uh, either way, man, I mean, fuck it. Let, let guys wear what they want. I mean, one of your best I'd players come in like, wants stuff. I'd come in like Roddy Roddy Piper with a kilt, just just flash the, the team as I go by into the locker room. Was Somebody's it Roddy Roddy Piper who wore you? Yeah, maybe the bow the bow rat one Keeney. But, but what was funny about? I mean, McKenna played not covering the nipples twenty years as a pro, and it's like it was funny reading all the people on Twitter like who like dude when I was in high school we played way better when I wear a fucking suit to the game. It's like come on, dude, you're talking to a guy who played pro hockey for yeah 20 with years, your Aldo you know I mean? sneak and, or your Aldo dress shoes on. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Z Cavaricis. He got each pair at a different Aldo in the West Edmonton Mall, too. <laughs> oh, we haven't hit that one for a while. <laughs> yeah, that's a recycled one. Oh, that's a fun Going back to the well. Chicklet's greatest hit right there. Oh, fuck. Uh, Toronto Maple Leafs, speaking of that. What do you think Don Cherry's thinking about that one? Oh, he's probably disgusted. He probably wants, he wants a three piece suit every guy walking off the bus. I would hit up Welka, who does the T-shirts of Boston, and be like, "Yeah, I want forty-one different T-shirts. Actually, eighty-two different T-shirts for every game. Just wear a different T-shirt to every game. That's what I would do." With what? With sayings on them? Or? Whatever. Just it's a, if we were going to go to another city, maybe something to do with that city. Kind of some obscure references. I would have some fun with it, man. You know, like when we were in Detroit, I had four T-shirts made up for our Detroit trip just to have a little homage to you know Tommy Hearns and the Supremes and whoever else came out of Detroit. So. I hope certainly more teams wouldn't do it. be opening bands T-shirts that you'd buy at the concerts. Yeah. But. Not, well, once they make a pig, definitely then I'll be in the front. I, be, I bet you there's players who who on the other side of it w- like love wearing suits and they'll never stop wearing suits even if the Lung team does allow them to wear. Yeah, yeah there's a, yeah, there's a good example. Yeah, you know the whole look good, feel good, play good man. I don't think I've ever seen them not in a suit. I don't think guys have said they ever saw him in jeans. Wasn't that a thing? Didn't a couple Rangers we talked to say they, he's never worn jeans? Maybe I'm making that up. Maybe they said yeah, never worn sweatpants. I'd, I wore sweatpants I'd, every day to the rink. I'd bring back jams with some of those shorts back in the fucking 90s. Oh, yeah. Jam shorts. <laughs> Listen to jock jams while you're wearing them. <laughs> uh, let's see. Whit, we just mentioned Toronto. Well, they extended head coach Sheldon Keefe with a two-year deal. He's going to be signed through 2024. Didn't want him going into this year as a lame duck. Uh, let's, let's see. Tampa Bay extended general manager Julian Breezebois' contract. His deal was set to expire after this season. Well, the owner did the smart thing. 
They didn't announce how long it is, but you got to imagine it's a couple of years. Also, GMs entering their final year. This is per Pierre Lebrun. Uh, the Burger Van up in Montreal, Don Sweeney here in Boston, Bob Murray in Anaheim, Don Waddell in Carolina, uh, Rob Blake in L.A. He said there could be others. Those are the ones he knows about. Um, you know, Burger Van, who knows he's, if he's going to sign through this, this year or what. That team had some. Is that typically common where they don't disclose like how many, how many years that GMs get? It's not like public knowledge knowledge that the players yeah the gm coach stuff sometimes it's it's a little tougher to find out who's who signed for when interesting yeah. i would say out of all those general managers sweeney probably the the most notable well, who's not for signed what he's yet? done yeah who's, who's not but, signed well, well, well yeah don waddell I, I suppose you can maybe make a case for him as well but i don't i don't know i mean because we're not we're not going to count the 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 waddell offer sheet that to, to montreal then considering it was probably the owner who forced his hand yeah, I mean, I yeah, I mean, obviously the owner had something to do with that. He was a little payback thing. I don't think it really mattered either way. But yeah, it's interesting though. I mean, Rob Blake, LA has been struggling the last few years. We're going to talk about them next week with the West. But you know, people have high hopes for that team this year. So it is tough for these guys when you're a lame duck status going into that last year without a deal. You know, you don't know if it's a do or die year for them. So either way, moving right along. Uh, team. Oh, quickly, Keith. you mentioned yeah. Sheldon Keith. I'm through two and a half episodes of the all or nothing on Amazon prime on the Maple Leafs. Oh, awesome. We, I, same, awesome. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, okay. I think it's actually better than the 24 sevens used to be because it's the entire year and they are in depth. They go into a lot of things that I didn't necessarily think they would. So you're getting some pretty sick coverage from inside the locker room, from Dubas, from Sheldon Keefe, who has the, uh, an absolute mouth, like a sailor. He could fit right in this podcast, <laughs> but I think it makes a lot of sense to resign that coach. Uh, they got to get some. They got to get something going in the playoffs. But the regular season has been nice, especially last year. So I think that it makes sense. But in terms of watching some awesome hockey coverage, some inside info, check that. Check that series out on Amazon Prime. Yeah, jumping ahead a little. I'm glad you dove into it. The, the footage was unbelievable. Wit. I mean, 24 seven was. I think the, the the best we've seen. And then we've had we've had some of these shows since. None of them have got anything close to 24 uh, seven. I mean, swearing matters so much when you don't have to bleep out swears. Not just as like ah, they're swearing, but. You could tell while they're saying, you can hear the emphasis, and yeah, what's his face? Keith, High he, stakes, man. He swears like a sailor. in that locker room. But like the, uh, the the things that stuck out to me, like Jumbo Joe with, with um, Eel is on Winnipeg, like fucking Joe is human, and then the ref was like, Joe, calm down. Joe, calm And Joe kept yelling at the ref. He's like, all right, whatever you want. Like It was just real like, like fly-on-the-wall shit that we never get to yeah. see. And like the leadership meeting they had, is it typical? Oh, I don't know about if you've been ever been one of those biz, but is seven guys? <laughs> is that a lot for a leadership meeting? Is that a typical number or what? Because yeah, were- no, I, yeah. When I was in the American Hockey League, we used to. I used to get invited to those ones, but before <laughs> that, no. What, why the fuck are you laughing? Wait, hey, were you ever because- involved in a leader? <laughs> Wait, were you ever involved in a leadership meeting with? Uh maybe a couple. Uh, yeah, I had an Aon in Pittsburgh for like three weeks and then an Aon in Edmonton. So I was a leadership committee guy. For three seconds. I'm going to say seven. I'm going to say seven guys is a little bit, but five, five to seven is, is pretty standard, I would say. I, was, I wasn't like laughing at you. We got it's invited funny to that you were one like, meeting. Yeah, in the AHL, like, it was just like kind of funny. I mean, I, I oh, wait, oh, like, we're not yeah. supposed to have them at that league? It's like the organist is in the room with them. Like, <laughs> They're like, how the fuck? Did like, this uh, guy biz, uh, collect the money in the cup for the chicken parm subs and get out of the locker room? <laughs> biz, hey, so one question I had for you. Okay, so actually, sorry, all right, to cut a, you off. What were you going to ask about the leadership meetings? If, he asked if that was a lot. No, of guys. if seven, because I, I, you know, I know they had the, the captain and the two assistants, but I didn't think there'd be four other guys. It just seemed like a lot to me. I, I guess seven guys for a leadership meeting for a, for a locker room well, with twenty three guys. Well, some teams they have that many guys where their input matters. Yeah. Some other teams maybe they don't have. I mean, Christ, you. I got notes here for the divisional breakdowns. Some of these teams, half the guys haven't even played fifty fucking games yet. It's 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 actually wild how young the league's getting. But for a team like Toronto, I think that that would probably be. You know the minimum amount of guys you'd want in that uh, in that locker room, getting people getting their opinion and, and seeing how things go. Wit, I, I had a question for you. So you guys were involved with HBO twenty four seven the year where the uh, was it Bugsy Malone who ended up putting the room in the hallway? No, we were never in HBO twenty four seven. Oh, what was that? Were, 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 that, that you have a f- they did that, but that was when we were gone. That was uh, Bugsy and I weren't on the team anymore. That was when they played the oh. outdoor classic. I think that was actually the year Crosby got injured when the game got delayed, and it was at night against Washington at Heinz Field. I think oh, that okay. was that year when they followed them, um, and they had like redone it, or so- somebody did that same. My, my apologies. I was going to ask you if if you think you think it becomes a distraction. 
with the camera crew following you around and I you know, know. I, I, I I actually never got to experience that. Uh, most of the time, though, you hear that guys become boys with the cameraman, and they're pretty good at just. Obviously, you know they're there, but they do their best in terms of like, you don't really see them or you get used to them in a sense. But I think there's definitely times where coaches are still gonna flip out and know like that's not going in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But lots of open stuff. I, I love the pot biz with um when Keith was telling Felino not to engage with Lowry on Winnipeg and he he could tell Felino wanted to. He's like, Don't do it. He's like, Well, I don't mind. He's like, I don't mind doing it. And he's like, just don't. He's like, Oh, okay. Like he just got on the team, so he's like, you know, he wants to make this impression with with his teammates and the coach is telling him to like lay off. It was it was pretty funny. And I think the fan favorite probably was, you know, was uh Jack Campbell, man. Like, oh, yeah. like, did you see when he got sunk by Keith? He was given fist bumps, and he and he yeah. Subi put his out. And he went. That's by a funny and clip. He, but then when <laughs> I felt, I was heartbroken for the guy, and I fuck with the Leafs more than anyone. Man, when they hit the clip of him like sobbing in the room after Game Seven, like you just your heart broke for that poor guy. He was just because everybody speaks so glowingly of him. They say he's such a wonderful person, a wonderful human being. And Been so, through a know, lot. To have that man, it was it was actually heartbreaking to watch. But at the same time, it, it provided a lot of dramatic for for what we were watching, dramatics for what we were watching. My favorite part was seeing millennial players singing Motown. Personally, I was like, "Holy shit!" They know the words to this fucking song. <laughs> uh, who who was the one guy who stuck out to you, Wit? As far as like maybe a guy who had more personality than you originally thought. So far, two and a half episodes in. I mean, I wouldn't say Joe Thornton. Like, I didn't know he had a personality. I obviously, knew he did. But just his whole like aura around him cracked me up. Like he when he hurts his rib, he's walking out of the locker room. He's like, I'm just gonna take this with me. Just like the way he talked. He's driving around his Porsche, listening to Brian Burke dog him on the radio and he's fucking <laughs> laughing. It's like Jumbo Joe just loves the game. <laughs> Seriously, oh, he is a stuff. fucking character, man. So if you haven't checked it out yet, it's on Amazon Prime, All or Nothing. It's a series they've been doing for a while. And if you're a hockey fan and you saw 24-7 on HBO years ago, it's like Witt said, it's comparable to that. Go check it out. You don't have to be a Leafs fan or not. Uh, moving right along, Montreal extended forward Jake Evans with a three-year deal worth 5.1 mil, kicks in next season, 1.7 average annual value. Team Canada general manager Doug Armstrong named the first three members of the Olympic team. No shock here. Sid, Connor, and Alex Petrangelo, his defenseman. The teams were, uh, who were playing were asked to declare three players. That's why this – because I was like, what's this all about, three players? But the Olympic Committee asked uh, teams participating to do this. So he said, all right, here's Sid, Connor, and Alex. Obviously taking care of his boy, who make, probably is the best Canadian defenseman, so it's an easy call. Yeah, it makes total yeah. sense on those guys. Um, for U.S., I'd have to think uh, Matthews Kane and Seth Jones, I guess, would be my three. I don't know McAvoy. if that – What? McAvoy, I mean, McAvoy, look at the, yeah. Look fuck. At the, hey, look at the American back end, man. You got Adam Fox, uh, yep. McAvoy, and they're young too. You got Carlson, hey, Wierenski. You got Jones. You got Wierenski. America's yeah, got a wagon. It. I mean, yeah. hopefully, fucking Eichel can play. It looks like he won't be able to. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's exciting. I, I, I wonder if all the other countries will name their three. Maybe Canada was just first to do it, but those three names made total sense. You got to remember, Petrangelo in the playoffs last year was something else. He was a he was beast. at a fucking another level in the in, yeah. the in the spring last year. Yeah, when the stakes get high, he comes to play. Yeah, he does. Uh, let's see. Oh, speaking of St. Louis, did you see the uh, Barubi? I guess he collided with David Perron in practice. So the next time out, they put a, like a, ch- a, well, a chalk line out in the ice with spray paint with all like cones around it. So he skates up and looks at it, gets all off at. It. I sent the link to you guys. I don't know if you checked that out. Pretty funny. You get you get about one of those a year. Yeah, pretty funny stuff. Uh, but, 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 let's see. Oh, uh, wait, I'm sure you saw this one. Edmonton, they unveiled the Joey Moss sculpture in the locker room. Great gesture by the team. And he's got his hand up because he was always giving the high yep. fives. It was a beautiful thing they, they did for Joey. So, uh, it came out awesome too. That's yeah, it really thing. did. It did. It was nice to see they did that. Uh, also, I can't imagine it, how much the guys like miss having him around because it was just every day. It was so constant. You'd see Joey no matter what. Guys would fuck with him. He'd give it to you right back. We talked about it a lot when he passed away, even before that, when I kind of talked about my experiences in Edmonton. But it, it, it must still hit guys hard, you know, especially the staff that worked for him so long that he's not around. But the statue came out awesome, and, and it's perfect that it's there. Well said. Well said, Whit. Uh, speaking with Edmonton, uh, their coach, Dave Tippett, said that Josh Archibald is going to be out indefinitely. He did have COVID in the summer, and he has since been diagnosed with the heart condition, uh, myocarditis, which I guess is apparently an effect of having COVID. Um, so he's uh, going to be on long-term. I uh, might, may or may not play this year, but 
I don't know, just this, I hope this story, I, I, last thing I want to do once the season starts is say the word fucking COVID or vaccine anymore, but, you know, again, it's part of the fucking NHL news. So uh, let's see. Nashville announced that assistant coach Todd Richard suffered a heart attack. He's been away from the team to recuperate. Uh, they said he's resting com- comfortably, and hopefully we'll see him back on the bench soon. So get well, Todd. We want to see you back out there. And also want to send best wishes to, well, my favorite Bruin to wear number eight before Cam Neely did, Peter McNabb. Uh, the Avs analyst, he's been diagnosed with cancer, but he's going to continue to work. Uh, fortunately, it was caught early, and we're all pulling for him here at Spit and Chicklets. Get well, Peter. And uh, trivia, what, do you know the last player to wear number eight before Cam Neely was, uh, wore it? Reggie Lemlin. Guy. Reggie Lemlin was a goalie. Come on, at least fucking try. <laughs> I don't know. You just said McNabb. Peter McNabb was a, wasn't a goalie. I know. You just said he was the first guy to wear number eight before Neely, I thought. No, I said. So I just I, threw out I, Reggie I, Lemlin I, fucking around. All right, eat, no. The, well, the last player to wear number eight before Neely were it. Lyndon Byers. Oh, LB. LB, yeah. I must have so people who don't know, LB, LB, I, I would say he was a straight up fighter at that time, right, R.A.? Right, for the oh, Bruins? I mean, that's yeah. pretty much what he was for his career, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and then how long has he been on the radio? I don't know if he still is, but he became a morning radio sh- radio show guy on WAAF, right, for all those I, years? Yeah, I don't know if he still is or not. I don't listen to it anymore, so I'm not sure. I actually did a couple shows with him a couple of years ago on EEI, but oh, him and, and him and Neely, they were, running, they, they were wingmen. Like, back in the day, you'd see them in town at concerts, whatever, the two of them out raising hell together. Cool Remember story, when Drew yeah, Bledsoe right. went to that concert and tried crowd surfing, and he's like 6'6", 250? Yeah, he gets, and he got dropped? Dude, he like no, he crushed got, he some got people sued. in the crowd. <laughs> he got sued. He's legit. Drew Bledsoe, I think, is 6'5", 6'6", 240, and was at the stage. At, I think it was at the Paradise, which is on Calm Ave on BU's campus. This like, little awesome music venue. And he, he tried crowd surfing, and he crushed a couple people. <laughs> yeah. Well, who was that band again? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't even God. know if it was definitely the paradise, but that kind of rung a bell. But I just, you just, you just talked about two Boston athletes running a muck at bars. Thought of blood, so jumping was it, off the stage. Was it Everclear? Maybe. Let me go. Let me. Yep, Everclear settles lawsuit with fan injured at Boston show, nineteen ninety nine. <laughs> what did he do? Like hurt his neck or something? No, he he landed on a girl. I mean, he's a football player. He stage stage dived and he hit some poor lady in the crowd and like fucking crinked her neck or some shit. And they ended up fucking suing the band. <laughs> Father of mine, tell me they where had some jams. <laughs> they did have a couple of jams. <laughs> that was like soft summer going in my How was it the band's fault that he went crowd surfing because they invited him up? Because he's probably um, up on the, their well, stage. Yeah, they, exactly. Like It's not typical to have 6'6", six, six, 260 guys up on stage diving it's off like into the, the fucking crowd. It's like the guy who sued Winnebago because he put it in cruise control and then went to the back to make a pot of coffee not knowing that it didn't like control the steering wheel. He didn't realize <laughs> it just control just control the speed. And then he won the lawsuit. I think he won like one point seven million or something. Actually, I got I got it right here. The fan who sued Everclear, two members of the New England Patriots, and the Boston nightclub after being injured at an Everclear concert <laughs> on November thirteenth, nineteen ninety seven, has settled out of court for one point two five million. Ooh, nice. According to that's the, a good concert. Oh, right? Better than your Chris Stapleton night with. Oh, here it is right here. Uh, according to the Globe, Patriots lineman Max, Max Lane, who's a monster, <laughs> and quarterback Drew Bledsoe will each pay five hundred grand, while Everclear and the Paradise Club will each pony up a buck and a quarter to Tamika Messier, who originally filed the lawsuit back in December 1997. Holy fuck. So she sued the two players. Wow, the players had to pay more than the fucking band in the venue because, well, they Makes did land sense. on her. They did jump. Yeah. Well, I Comes can... off the catwalk. <laughs> Just <laughs> off like the top rope. It's like Sting. Walk. Yeah, yeah, elbows up. Yeah, well, so that well, that's a good because Biz, you said why the the, the headline said Everclear, but they, when you read down further, it's actually they paid the le- the least of it. It was Bob the two guys who landed on them. Nine. Well, I know it wasn't Tell for the pre-show because nobody shows up to those. Fuck, uh, hurry! All right, let's go, boys. Stop busting my balls. I'm kidding. All right, most guys have tried different ways to last longer, but thinking about Stanley Cup odds and call the trophy odds don't always work. Well, the folks at Roman, an online men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes. The secret to longer-lasting sex. Roman Swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, and fast-acting, and the best part, they don't require a prescription. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipes packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. You just take the swipes out of the packet, you swipe it on, you let it dry, and you 
good to good to good to go. That's it. So go to GetRoman.com slash chicklets, and you can get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoman.com slash chicklets. Check them out if you haven't yet. They work. Oh, so I heard. Uh, all right, boys. Season previews. Nice to do these in September and not in the middle of the winter when our equilibrium's all off and shit. It's good to be back on our normal NHL schedule again. And we're going to do the Eastern Conference first because, well, we are based in the Eastern Conference and on the Atlantic, so we'll do the Atlantic first. Uh, one thing, too, Biz, we got to mention. Why is Detroit in the Atlantic and Carolina in the Metropolitan? Makes no fucking yeah. sense. Yeah. I don't know. We were, we were texting about that and it was grinding your gears. And I thought like the, the, the biggest explanation was probably the original six matchups. And given that Detroit is not that relevant right now, maybe they, uh, maybe they need a little extra spice to create those old rivalries and to maybe draw some, uh, some attendance and some viewership. That's the only logical reason I had for it because I mean, from a logistical standpoint and travel, it doesn't necessarily make that much sense now, does it? No, and even on the original six pot, now the Rangers are the only original six team in the Metro division, so they don't even have a divisional rival. That is 06. I don't know. Either way, we're not going to beat it to death. We're going to move right along. And we're doing alphabetical order, so don't cry. Oh, yeah. they're gonna lo- Our fans are going to be yelling into their fucking car stereos right now. We're starting with the Bruins. Here we go, Bruins. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> All right. The Boston Bruins. Last season ended. They lost in the quarterfinals to the Islanders 4-2 to because they started to Rask instead of sitting him when he was hurt. Uh, but either way, they brought a whole bunch of new guys in. They really toughened up the team after the Islanders pushed him around quite a bit. They brought in Nick Foligno, Eric Haller, Thomas Noshik. They signed Linus Olmach for the goaltending. Brought in Derek Forsbert. Forbert, I'm sorry, Derek Forbert. They said goodbye to Tuka Rask and David Krejci. They may be back Ouch. later. Uh, also, Sean Corrali, Nick Ritchie, and Andre Cache are gone. Their cup odds are 14-1. to 1. Uh, Right now, this Boston team, their core is dwindling. I mean, they got Marshawn and Bergeron left. Uh, they're still a contender. The clock is ticking, but... You know, I, I, they got to win it one more time in the next, I'd say, two, three years here with, before this uh, era ends. I got to think that this is probably the uh, – maybe the, the toughest preseason outlook for the Bruins in the last, I don't know, 10 years. And I, I think mainly it's because you lose Krejci and you didn't really replace him. And I know Charlie Coyle's like kind of penciled in right now as a second-line center. If you want to win a Stanley Cup, I think he's your third-line center. And then to have to, to have Krejci leave. Now, who knows, by the way, like he could easily come back once that season ends. I don't think that's that crazy to imagine. And, yes, he would have to go through waivers, but all he would do is tell every team, if you take me, I'm not coming. So it's pretty evident. That the Jason could, Spezza treatment? Yeah, he could end up at the – yeah, <laughs> Put me on. Anyone takes me, I'm retiring. Krejci's just like, listen, I'm going to the Bruins. If you take me, I'm not coming. But I, that that does that's besides the point because the team going in right now, they still have that line. I, I actually like the nickname, the Perfection Line. Um, but after that, it's it's tough. And I know Felino has a lot of grit, and I think Boston fans will like him. Uh, but you just look at, at losing your second line center, and how do you really recover from that? Now, I think Swayman could be phenomenal. That's another question mark, though, because he hasn't really done it. And, and Tuca, I don't know if he if he will be back. I don't know if he plans on playing for the team again. But in terms of goaltending, there's a question mark. And in terms of offense from another line besides the top three, it's another question mark. So I love McAvoy's game. I, I think Grizzlick's an awesome player, and I, I do think that this is a playoff team, no doubt. But I don't know if they have what it takes to compete for a Stanley Cup. And I think just in terms of going into a season, other years in the past friggin' decade have been way, way more exciting for Bruins fans than right now. Well, I mean, easily the best line in hockey, in my opinion. I mean, you could argue that uh, McDavid and Dreisaitl, but they don't really have that third guy. Mind you, you could probably throw me with them and compete with uh, the Bruins' top <laughs> line. But over the past five seasons, I want to say Marchand third in, in point production, and then Pasternak is at ninth, and, and you know he missed some time, and then you add Bergeron with his responsibility in the mix. So they're dialed in for that top line, but I agree with you, R.A., that window is closing and dwindling. That second-line center, Charlie Coyle, the offensive production is going to have to jump up. If there's kind of one guy that really needs to elevate his game, it's Jake DeBrusque. I know he had an off year last year, and that third line is kind of where the question mark is at. I'm actually... I think that their fourth line is maybe one of the best in, in, in the league. I really like that no sick pickup. I liked what he did when he was in Vegas. He had some good, uh, you know, some uh, good production during their runs. 
Um, I liked what Curtis Lazar brought last year when he got, uh, came over. That Trent Frederick adds that toughness. And just going to their back end, I mean, between – I don't know, is Grizzlick and McAvoy going to play together this year? Because right now I saw that Forbert was penciled in with McAvoy. But, I mean, going to Grizzlick and, and, and McAvoy, that was – Top top five pairings in the league last year, so I would not want to break them up. Yeah, I'd be surprised. Right. I'd be shocked if they did that. Correct. And then picking up Forbert, who's a great penalty killer. I, I mentioned that I played with him before. I think he had a great year in Winnipeg last year. That was a, a great job of uh, addressing uh, the back end. Uh, that I like that Mike Riley and what he brought. And then we know how much they miss Carlo come playoff time last year when he went down with injury. Um, as far as in the net, Linus Allmark seems to be one of the better value pickups in net this entire offseason. He was probably the, the toughest loss that the the Buffalo Sabres face other than Jack Eichel not coming back. So I'm interested to see what he's able to bring. But, you know, as, as far as their team outlook, I mean, I just think 100% they're a playoff team. And I don't think I don't think they're that much worse, even though they lost Krejci given the other areas that they addressed in free agency. I thought Sweeney did a great job. So this is still a, a top team in this division, for, in, in my opinion, uh, going into the season. Guys, I actually think uh, they, they said, the Bruins said that they're going to have Jack Studnika, uh, the 2017 uh, second-round pick, uh, start as a second-line center, and Coyle will be back on the third line again. Oh, okay. Well, okay. I, th- I think, right. I think Dialed he's— Dialed in there, Mikey. There you go, Ooh. buddy. Great job. Yeah, I, I guess, sir, I, I, guess I should— burn that website that I was looking at that had him listed as that second line center. Stay but yeah, off Reddit, a- Biz, will you? <laughs> well, let, let's, also, let's also think realistically that he's going to have a short window here of getting a look. Dude, Nika, if it's two games, he doesn't do anything. He ain't playing second line center the third game. Fair I think enough. he scored tonight, though, boys. Scored tonight. And then uh, you got to think that Halsey's going to elevate Coyle's uh, you know, production if he is on that second line. And then going off to the right side, that Craig Smith, you guys uh, you guys seem to enjoy him and what he brought. And he, he fit right in when he came on over from Nashville. Yeah, he's one of those guys, very versatile. You can pencil him in anywhere in the top nine, and he'll get the job done for you. He's, he can score, he can pass, he can shoot. Just a, a terrific, versatile player. So looking up and down that lineup, uh, you know, the Krejci second line center issue is like that. That's like their one thing where it really hurts them. But they have strength, all four lines and uh, and some versatility from guys. So I don't think that they look much worse than they did last year. Yeah, I mean, and I, I remain steadfast that if and I, I'm a Cassidy guy, I always have been. But, you know, I think he went with his loyalty when he should have went with, you know, the fact that Tuca was at about 80% in Swayman, those guys played so much different in front of him all year. You saw it. And it's funny. I talked to Jose Theodore when I says, the guy, does the team play different in front of a goalie? And he, he says, oh, my God, yeah. It's like night and day on some teams. And it really happens. And I think the Bruins were a good example of that. It's not that they like a guy different. It's just the, the goaltender style. But the Bruins rallied around Swayman all year. And I, I still can't believe they put, couldn't put him in there because I think he would have been a difference in that Islander series. But Last thing I'll say here uh, before we leave the, the Boston Bruins talk is the most absurd power play going into the year with Bergeron, Marchand, Halsey, Pasta, and McAvoy. They can fucking snap it around. I don't know how much uh, ice time that second unit will be seeing. So stay out of the box against the Boston Bruins. Okay, before we move along to the next team, Biz, do the Bruins make the playoffs? A hundred percent. What? Yes. Granelli? Yep. I concur. Bruins make the playoffs. I just said the Bruins' uh, clock is ticking. Uh, the next team, the Buffalo Sabres, uh, their clock is broken. Oh, Jesus. Last season ended, uh, probably not a moment too soon for them, although I will say the team finished a way stronger under Don Granato. They played actually pretty good hockey those last couple of weeks, but, you know, it's Buffalo Sabres. It, it's, it's a tough situation up there. Um, they're going to say hello to a bunch of guys making seven hundred fifty grand. goalie Craig Anderson, goalie Aaron Dell, defenseman Will Butcher, and defenseman Robert Hegg. They're saying adios to defenseman Rasmus Ristolainen and forward Sam Reinhardt. Their cup odds are 300 to 1, the longest odds on the board. You know, I feel like we beat on Buffalo enough, guys. I feel I generally feel bad for their awesome fans, so we don't need to take too much time. And Everybody beat up on has them to say one positive thing about this lineup. I'll let uh, you start with. I really am excited <laughs> to watch Casey Middlestad, who hopefully can yeah. make a big step up, and Rasmus Dahlin, who can hopefully take that next level. Other than that, it's the worst team in the league. We're not going to spend too much time. But when you're good again, Buffalo, someday we'll be chatting about you for 10, 15 minutes every episode, we promise you. Now enjoy the Bills and just hope Jack Eichel is allowed to get the surgery he wants. 
Um, I think I'd rather watch their alumni play this season <laughs> than the actual Sabres or the University of Michigan, if we could just swap them out. But, uh, I mean, uh, I don't know. You mentioned it. Half the team's making seven hundred and fifty grand. I mean, uh, Dylan Cousins is another young guy. He was drafted, I believe, seventh overall by them. So it's just really hard when you don't have that, like, a lot of great leaders to take focus away from these young guys who have to all of a sudden stay, step in and make big impacts on the top lines. Um, you know, they lose Reinhardt as well. Um, and, and even going in, I mean, going back to what I was saying about Boston, I mean, the fourth line here, Kajula, Eakin, and Okposo, they look like the most dangerous line compared to the rest of the lineup. So... Uh, this is going to be a, a very long year for the Sabres, and uh, I, I, I will concur what you said, though. Uh, they, they did do a lot better job with Granado as opposed to Ralph Kruger, but uh, this is going to be uh, – this is a lottery team, folks. This is a lottery team. Yeah. Question think, before we move on. Certainly. Do yeah. they make the playoffs in the KHL? <laughs> uh, oh. I don't know. I – I don't know either. How much, how much Russian gas would they be Could they win a Calder Cup in the AHL is probably a more fair question. And by the way, yes. no disrespect yes. to, the, to the 750K guys. That, it was just every every time they signed the guy, it was 750K for like three weeks straight, it felt like. So it was more of a Twitter meme than anything. Obviously, no disrespect to any of the guys. And I also never made 750K in the NHL, so I'm not even <laughs> chirping that. So Did you never so. make 750 I, no, I, I think I you did made, one you year. You made 900 one year? One of, them, one of the years was a lockout year, and one of the years I think I made 725. So, Thank you. So I, technically not. I, we don't have to do the roundtable. Four of us, Buffalo's not getting the playoffs this no. year, right? Okay. No. Okay, no. next team uh, in the alphabetical list, in the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, Stevie Smokes' his plan might be going a little slow than hope far. I think fans might have thought they'd be a little further ahead at this point. Last season ended. Uh, they did not qualify for the playoffs. They were seventh in the Central, last year's Central. They bring it in. Uh, goalie Alex Nedeljkovic, defenseman Nick Letty, forward Pius Suda, uh, defenseman Joran uh, Osterley, and they're saying bye to Richard Panik and goalie Jonathan Bernier. Their cup, I got to, no, I fucked that up. Those, their cup odds, I screwed up. I'll relook, I'll look them up in a second. Um, but they did lose a player forward, Jacob Rana. Just signed a three year, $15.75 oh, million dollar deal. He's going to be out at least four months with a shoulder. He got hurt the first fucking 10 minutes of camp. After signing his deal, gets out there and gets hurt. That's awful, man. You feel awful for a guy like that. Yeah, yeah. they trade Manta for him, and that's the main piece coming back. Looked awesome when he came over at the end of the season, and that's just such a kick in the dick to train all all summer and get ready for for a season in which you're going to get tons of ice time. You're going to be one of the top dogs there, and to have that happen into the first skate just is awful luck. But I'll say this about Detroit. Similar. I won't say similar to Buffalo, but similar in a sense that they're not going to make the playoffs this year, I don't think. And they haven't really gotten to their window to try to compete for a Stanley Cup by any means. But if I was a Detroit Red Wings fan, and I think I said this last year, after all the success you had for 20 friggin' years or whatever it was, I actually wouldn't be too disappointed where you're at right now. And the main reason being they are building this team from the yeah. goal out with a ton of size. And this Maurice Sider kid, I think he was picked sixth overall. He's going to play this year. He was defenseman of the year in the Swedish Hockey League last year. He's a stud. They got. I, I, I mean, I love Dylan Larkin. I, I just think that if you're a Detroit fan and you saw what Eiserman did in building those cup-winning teams in Tampa, I'd be very confident and happy that he's the guy redoing it in Detroit. And maybe it's not this year and maybe it's not next year, but at some point this is going to be a good team. Lucas Raymond is a really high pick. I think he's with the highest pick Detroit's had since Steve Eiserman. Maybe that's wrong, but he's one of the highest picks they've had in 30 fucking years, and he's a stud from Sweden who I don't know what the impact he'll make this year is. But Detroit won't make the playoffs, but they're on the right path. And I think if you're a Wings fan, after all the success you've had, all you can ask for is to have a plan in place, and, and that is going on there. Yeah, Stevie, uh, Sticky, Icky, Wee, Eiserman seems to think the back end is going to be a lot bigger and more mobile and contribute it more offensively. This Philip, how do you say his last name? Ronick? It's Heronic. H-R- I just say Heronic, but I don't know. I Heronic? think it is Ron- Ro- Yeah. Heronic. He led, their team in, he led their team in points last year. It seems as if though maybe he's going to be bumped back to that, uh, that second, uh, that second uh, unit of defensemen. Is that how you say it? Second unit? Second, second pairing, pairing, second unit. You second know. pairing. However, uh, you want but to call it. He, he signed a pretty good deal three years at four and a half a year. Um, but they got to see, see some stuff from the young guys. Philip Zadina, 
He was the guy that they drafted, I want to say, six overall. They got a few guys six overall. And you mentioned Raymond as well. Not sure if he's going to start the season in the NHL. Uh, but, yeah, they got to start seeing some, some more stuff from the young guys. And I'm sure they're going to get a lot of reps this year in, in a year where, the, where they're not looking too good. But they got the usuals as Larkin, Bertuzzi, and Fabri, and then a few other guys in the mix. But uh, it just sucks because, like, they had a few other big guys on the back end that Dan DeKaiser – he had back surgery 2019, and he just hasn't been the same since. So I don't know, guys. Uh, I know Letty's going to help out a little bit and help out those younger guys, but uh, this is this is definitely not a playoff team. Agreed. Agree as well. Uh, you know, after you have a dynasty, you need to pay the piper, and the, the Red Wings, frankly, are still paying the piper after all those great years. I know the last cup was what? Not to rub it in with 08. I know it's 13 years, but that you know they're still contend for a few years after that. And then you got to bottom out, but hopefully they'll get back soon. They're a marquee franchise. And uh, Biz, after spending a, a weekend in Detroit downtown at the uh, Old Chilele, I can see why Stevie Y might ask guys about smoking grass all the time because that place smelled like Cheech and Chong's living room for the whole fucking week we were out there. Yeah, you can definitely find it easy in Detroit. That's for sure. You can find anything there. <laughs> uh, that's what I heard. I don't can't confirm. And by the way, their cup odds were 150 to 1. I wrote them down wrong. I just wanted to get them out there. 150 to 1. So none of us think they're going to make the playoffs, right, G? You don't have them in there, do you? Correct. I do not. Okay. All right. Moving right along. Florida Panthers. Pretty decent season last year. I know they only lasted one round in the playoffs. They lost to the eventual champion Tampa Bay, four games to two. Very entertaining series. Uh, but there's no reason this team can't build on on what they built last year going into this year. Uh, they said bye to our friend Keith Yandel and goalie Chris Dreger, who got picked in the expansion draft. Uh, they're bringing in Joe Thornton and Sam Reinhardt. Uh, their cup odds are 17-1. to 1. This is a team, we've said it before, they've been in the league, Christ, a quarter century now, and they, they can't really get that traction. They got, I thought, a lot last year in the playoffs. If they can have a great season this year, they can maybe finally get something going on the, on the east side of Florida. What, what do you got for the Panthers? I got, I got a team that you got to be really excited about that I think is going to compete to win this division. Um, now, a lot of that depends on goaltending. I don't really know how this is going to play out with Spencer Knight. And I, I, I understand that they got a goalie making ten million, but at some point is he your backup? I don't really know what's gonna go on there. But I just look at Barkov and Huberdo and I think Reinhardt was an unreal move getting him oh, in yeah. there. I, I look at I look at what Sam Bennett did when he got over came over from Calgary, and I think with Joel Quenville and Ekblad coming back after getting injured in the middle of what was his best car- best career season, I just think there's a lot of things there to be really excited about now. I don't know if in the end they, 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 they can win a Stanley Cup, but I, I also think that this is a time where you're actually very excited. In terms of Bruins fans, this year this year being a season you're kind of eh, maybe a little wishy-washy on. If you're a Panthers fan, the, the 11 of you, you got to be fucking fired up for this year because they have never looked as good as they have going into a season than right now. I mean, you pretty much touched on it all. Going back to top five pairings in the league, Uyghur and Ekblad definitely up there. Um, Duclair, he's finally found a home. He gets that three-year extension, and, and I couldn't agree more as far as those pickups. Bennett looked like a completely different player when coming over from Calgary. Point per uh, you game. Know exa- point per game. You know what you're getting from, from Barkov. <clears throat> and, and as far as guys up front, probably the most well-balanced uh, forward lineup in this division, or one of them. You got Vetrano, who's a 20 goal scorer on the fourth line. Hornquist on the fourth line as well. Noel Achari, who I loved him in Boston. I know they couldn't keep him because of salary cap issues. I, I, is that the case? Is that why they got rid of him? Who, oh, Noel Achari? <clears throat> Noel Achari, and he's going to be their fourth line center, it looks like, at least going in. Him or Thornton might switch in and out, but. Like I said, as far as balance on that forward lineup, man, that is uh, that is looking mighty good with plenty of offense coming. And that Forsling kid too, Chicago seemed to give up on him a little bit early. I mean, I think I know they said that probably about a, a, a handful of prospects recently, but he's going to fill in good. They got him at a good AAV, and he'll be playing with Montour. It looks like on that second pairing, another guy who came over from Anaheim, who's uh, who's having success. They seem. To, they feel like they got rid of every good young D prospect they had during this like five year period. So, just a, a very good lineup. But uh, Wit, you kind of touched on it. That goaltending, uh, like who, who's who's going to take that net, and and can Bobrovsky get back to playing like he once was? But I guess if not, they do have Spencer Knight. But it's such a fucking waste where you look at if this team ends up finishing at the top two of the division, and if they want to make a run, like they could have been able to use that cap space to go million. add that. One- 
10 million to go add that one I mean even with 10 million maybe two extra pieces so who knows maybe uh maybe Zito's got a trick up his sleeve if uh if uh Spencer Knight ends up taking over net taking over the net but uh, but, uh, definitely a playoff team in my books. And as I said, a, a very, very lethal offensive team up front. Also, just quickly, Duclair, they re-signed. He was great there last year. And then the other, uh, I won't say question mark, because last year Carter Verhage was unreal. I think getting the chance to play with Barkov. But as long as he can kind of repeat that, I don't think he needs to be a point-per-game guy. But if, you know, he's a 60-point guy, that makes a huge difference. And, and the stats last year showed that that was kind of his pace. So we'll see what goes on. But, yes, uh, playoff team from the Wit Dog. Uh, playoff team, absolutely, for the Florida Panthers. And, Biz, just to go back to Noah Chari, he actually was unrestricted free agent um, after the Bruins. He was like – the Bruins had this run of like five years where fourth liners were so good that they would cash out yeah. they'd become free agents and fucking sign these monster deals elsewhere make a lot of money, which would be good for them. That's why I was pumping their tires earlier. It just seems like every year they have an unbelievable fourth line. And even dating back to when they, when they won their Stanley Cup, who was it? It was Dan Pae, uh Thornton. And and uh, who was the other guy? Craig Campbell. Campbell? Soupy. Yeah, Craig Campbell. So yeah, they just uh, they do a good job. But I mean, this this is probably definitely one of the most most lethal fourth lines. I know I've been pumping all the fourth lines up probably because that was where I played. But uh, Vitrano, as I mentioned, a, a proven twenty goal scorer, over probably averaging twenty goals over the last three years per year. Achari had a twenty goal season, and Hornquist. I would say arguably top three to five net front presence in all of the league. So he's going to help out on that power play as well. Lethal. His, like, he's got one of the funnier nicknames in the league. I horny? think I'm horny, right? I mean, that's, I know it's like a fourth grade giggle, but it's just like <laughs> horny. I would laugh if I was on his team every time he said it. We all think he's going to the playoffs, Grinnell. You gr- agree with us or what? Uh, I do, and I think Spencer Knight wins the Calder. Woo! What's, what are his odds, do you know? That might be a nice little wager. I'll look it up for okay. you. Okay. All right, moving right along. The Montreal Canadiens, can they repeat what they did last year? They went nope. on a Stanley Cup run. They lost in the finals to uh, Tampa Bay. Had a hell of a run. Um, but th- losing Corey Perry, uh, they lost. Yes, Perry caught in the Emmy via the off a sheet. Uh, defensive stalwart Philip Deneau. Of course, no Shea Weber. He's going to be out hurt. Uh, they did bring in some reinforcements. David Savard on D. Christian Dvorak. Cedric pa- pa- Paquette, I'm sorry. Cedric Paquette, I lost a two in the last three days. It's fucking me up. Matthew Perot and Mike Hoffman. Cup odds are 45 to 1. Um, yeah, I don't think they're going to go on the miracle run they did last year. Biz, let's go to you first on the Habs. Well, they have a better lineup to start the season than they did last year, and yet I think that they're going to miss the playoffs. I don't. I think this division is just too strong. Um, I got Toronto making the playoffs instead of them. Um, I'm interested to see what Suzuki can do at that first line center position. I think that that trade when they ended up getting rid of uh, Cop Kaniemi, Cop Kaniemi, Cop Kaniemi, and getting into <laughs> how do you say it? Cot like a like you sleep on a cot. Ka, cot like the show in Vegas. Cot Kaniemi. And I think that they improved from when they ended up uh, Carolina offer sheeted Kot Kaniemi and getting in Dvorak in there. You got Drouin, who obviously ended up leaving the team last year for the reasons he did. He's p- coming in with that fresh mindset. But if you look at their wings, man, they're they're pretty strong. They got Caulfield, Anderson, Gallagher, who all proven guys. Well, I mean, Caulfield did a great job in playoffs. Toffoli on the wing. I mentioned Drouin that Armia broke out last year in playoffs. The, the one question mark is Hoffman. Like, how long is this guy going to be out? I know he wasn't ready coming into camp, and, and he didn't p- pass his physical. Any word on what's going on with him? You, know, you basically summed it up right there. He didn't pass his physical. I mean, I don't know if they put him on LTII yet or what, or if he's going to be ready before uh, season starts, but that was the last update I got. But, yeah, he's been he's bounced around quite a bit the last few years. I think the- I mean, I— Oh, go ahead, Buzz. No, I, I was pre- I was pretty much done. I mean, Evans just got that new deal. Fans seem pretty high on him. They think they got him at a good price, but uh, I don't know. It's just uh, it's just such a strong division. It's hard to, hard to put these guys in the playoffs. Yeah, I don't have them making the playoffs. Um, I I don't think I don't think it's in, insane for them to, for them to possibly get in. But it really depends on Price. And if you remember, Price had that amazing run in the playoffs, but he struggled in the regular season. 
So I don't know if, if in the end, Price is going to have a bounce-back type season. I don't dislike their forwards that much. Like you mentioned, Biz, there's a lot there. Toffoli, I think, was on pace for 40 goals in a full season last year. Suzuki was awesome. He looked better and better as the season went on, and he's just a, a true, I think, will be, if not now, it will be a true number one center. Uh, but no, no Weber. I know he's older, but still ha- not having him is a killer. And then the Dano issue in terms of having that defensive stalwart center that, you know, offensively there were some issues last year, but he could really play against top lines. They, they lose him. Um, I have them missing the playoffs. Uh, I don't think it'll be by a lot, but, but they're not one of my four teams from the Atlantic. I agree with you. Uh, I thought it was a pretty great run for hockey last year, even if the final was kind of a, a dud in the end. Uh, but, yeah, they, they, they're not going to be able to overcome the loss of Shea Weber. He's just too much of a beast back there. And David Savard, he's a, somewhat a suitable, suitable replacement, but he's not Shea Weber. So I don't see Montreal making it in this tough division either. Next up, the Ottawa Senators. Uh, last season ended. They did not qualify. They came in sixth out of seven teams in the north. Uh, they brought in defenseman Nick Holden and forward Zach Sanford via trade. Uh, they said bye to Evgeny Dadnoff. Their cup odds are 125 to 1. Uh, this is a team I think that should continue to mature a little bit and gel, but making the top four in this division is going to be tough. Uh, I don't see it happening. Whit, we'll go to you first on this one, buddy. Yeah, um, like I said, I mean, this is this is a prospect pool that, that the whole league's jealous of, but in terms of a team that compete for the playoffs, I don't, I don't think they're getting in. Now, last year they were actually way better than I thought. Ari picked him to win the cup. Um, <laughs> he, ended up, he ended up being just a, just, just a tad off. But I do think that they will they will this year also be a pain in the ass to play against, right? Yeah. They're not well, they're year. not going to be a team that's like a pushover. They play hard, they have a ton of skill. Now they gotta get Brady signed, like we mentioned before, but it, it's it's up to guys to take the next step when you're a team like this, right? Like that Brandstrom was traded for Stone. You know, he, he was the biggest part of that deal. He's a defenseman. He really hasn't shown anything yet, and he's super young still, but like this is the season. This is the type of guy you need to make a big jump. And that needs to happen with a couple of different players. Like, you look at Josh Norris, right? I think that, that there was a good rookie season for him. But you just need to take that next level. It's like every year for your first three, four years in the league, you should get a little better, whether it's whether it's something small or something large that everyone could see or, or something tiny that just the coaches see. You have to continue to improve. So that that's the question that remains to be seen. I mean, I don't know. I don't know goaltending-wise what will be there, but – they will not be an easy team to play against, but I don't have them getting in the playoffs this year, if that yeah, makes any usually, sense. Yeah, usually not a good sign when you don't know half of their lineup. I like that Batherson <laughs> last year. He really broke out of his shell, but uh, yeah, all in all, just a, not, a very, not, not a very good team. But you said that, D, that DJ Smith, he'll squeeze every bit of ounce of energy out of those guys and get them to compete, but it's just like they're just like nowhere near where they got to be. Yeah, they will be competitive, and I know what's picking on me about betting on them to win the Stanley Cup. You put Cup a future year. on them, did you right. not? That doesn't mean you think they're going to win. That just means if they do win, you're going to profit off it. I don't. Know. I thought Witt a Gamble would understand that. And, and I'll I tell think you, what. you could say it, it, it means you think they might win. Why else <laughs> well, would you spend the money? Well, I, uh, like if they do, I want to cash in. I mean, it's not. I that also I, predicted I, I, Matt Murray have a great bounce back year last year. Dude, you I just, gave Martin I Jones the Vesna one season. That was my okay. the whole basis of my prediction last year. If you guys remember, Biz, was that Matt Murray was going to re, you know recapture what he did in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago, and unfortunately he wasn't able to do that. But I thought that team was competitive as hell. I mentioned the gambling statistics; they were top ten on like the puck line bets, money line bets, and they were the only team in the top ten who didn't make the playoffs. Competitive as hell. I'll be betting the shit out of them again this year. Okay, but none of us think they're going to the playoffs, right? No. Nope. Okay. Correct. Wah, 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 wah. All right. Next up. Tampa Bay looking to be the first three-peat since the Islanders won four in a row back in the early 80s. Of course, like I just said, they beat the Canadians in five games, and they've still managed to reload. Uh, they did lose Yanni Gord, Blake Coleman, and Bockley Goodrow, but they're bringing in Corey Perry for the little veteran leadership. Zach Bogosian's coming back. P. Uh, P. Yeah, I'm sorry, P. E. Bellama, great de- uh, depth forward, and goalie Brian Elliott to back up. What's his face? Uh, brain fight. Vasilevsky. Cup odds for Tampa Bay, 7-1. I mean, it's a fucking no-brainer. They make the playoffs in this division. Biz, what would say you? I would say their biggest question mark going into the season is replacing what they got out of that third line. They, I mean, they lost the whole thing, and you know, it was proven how, how big they were in order to repeat a Stanley Cup champion. So, But 
you know, going to what I said about Detroit and Buffalo, like when your prospects and these guys are you're drafting or having time to develop in the minors and learning how to play the game at a professional level, that's where you have the advantage. So they keep that core group together and you just need to fill in those extra holes. And, you, you know, you saw you saw when uh, who ended up going down with injury where they put in Joseph. And he ended up stepping in the lineup and, and, you know, they didn't skip a beat. So this is, you know, this is the advantage you have. And it was, oh, it was much, uh, uh, Kalorn, thank you. And, and it's, you know, much like how when you go back to the, the era where Detroit dominated, you would see their high-end prospects have to go spend a couple of years in Grand Rapids. So they've done such a good job of, of drafting and developing these guys to be prepared for them to step into bigger roles when they're finally you know, ready to do so when they lose guys based on the salary cap. And I don't think they're going to skip a beat. Do I think that they're going to three-peat? No. I just think that, you know, eventually all that hockey does catch up to you. Uh, but I tell you what, man, they're they're going to be, you know, as, as dangerous as they usually are, and, and they're definitely going to make playoffs. There's no questions there. Best goalie in the world, no doubt. Um, not only in regular season, but the, the playoff numbers are absolutely fucking redonkulous. And even going back to last year, they did what they did without having Kucherov in there. And now he's going to be healthy and ready to go for puck drop. So just an absolute wagon again. It's kind of cool to see these southern markets flourishing. Like the, like them in Florida are going to be neck and neck in the, at the top of that division, I believe. And uh, that's exactly what the game needs. And the playoff series last year was something else too. With with we finally got to and see the hate. That. We finally got to see that hate for him. And yes, you lose one of the best third lines I can ever remember, right? In going back to back with those three guys, but when you still have Hedman, Sergachev, McDonough, Kucherov, Stamkos, Palat, Braden Point, and Vasilevsky, you could still win the Stanley Cup and killer. I, I, it, it does it. It does it. In a sense, like. They lose all these key pieces uh, in the bottom six of the forwards, but like, then the Bruins lose David Krejci. Like, what's worse, right? Like, you, you'd much rather lose these guys in the bottom six where you could fill in. And by the way, like Ross Colton looks sick. I think he scored the cup clinching yeah. goal in Game Five. He's going to get a much bigger role this year. Yep. He looked awesome, young American kid. Big Glenny Balls fan. Yeah, big Glenny. <laughs> and and in the end, like just to have that entire core and fill in the blanks, like you mentioned, Biz. That, that is the difference between this team and the rest of the league. So I have them in the playoffs, and I have them possibly doing it again. I, I, I picked them to repeat. I'm not going to pick them this year, but I, I wouldn't be shocked if they're in the cup final. All right. Um, definitely in the playoffs. I wouldn't be surprised if they three-peat at all. I mean, Vasilevsky's that, yeah. that fucking good. He's, he is that good. Like what you just said, I mean, that listen to that roster. Like, well, how, how couldn't they fucking three-peat? I mean, they, I think they would need a calamitous injury or uh, some guy to shit the bed to not. I, I think I don't, I don't think they're the favorites, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But and all if you four ever us, need a, a comedic relief, right, you can watch funny shows, you can watch funny videos. Or just watch Tampa's fourth line this year because Pat Maroon and Corey Perry on the ice together all season is going to be a full-blown comedy show. Yeah, we uh, need a behind-the-scenes of that. The shit that they're going to be saying and doing on the ice, we really need an Amazon Prime all for nothing following them around. Seriously. I, I would pay fucking PPV every team in the league, you know, if, if you could do that. Uh, okay, we got one more team before we bring in John Buchagross from ESPN, of course. That is the... Toronto Maple Leafs last season ended. Uh, I guess you'd say typically they blew a three to one lead. This time to Montreal in the first round, lost the series four games to three. Um, let's see, they did, uh, bu- 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 they lost Hyman. Yeah, that they, was a big loss. They, they yeah, I was going to say they won the regular season north, but yeah, uh, lost Zach Hyman, uh, Joe Thornton, who they brought in for the playoffs. Nick Foligno also gone. They brought in uh, goalie Peter Morazic. Uh, forward Nick Ritchie, forward Andre Kasha, uh, forward Michael Bunton, and forward David Kampf. Uh, their cup odds are eleven to one. Um, you know, same old story with Tampa. It's been since nineteen sixty-seven. And Toronto. It's, it's what I say. I'm sorry. I'm looking at Tampa above it. My fault. Nothing would surprise me here other than them winning the cup. I mean, I, I just don't see them winning the cup with this lineup. I mean, I don't know if they have top-flight goaltending. I mean, we saw what Peter Morazic did in Carolina last year. He was the starter most of the year, and he ends up getting pulled from playoff time because he wasn't up to snuff. And they're bringing him, him to be bringing him in to be the guy. I don't know, man. Uh, I see more misery heading for Toronto. I do see him in the playoffs, though. Biz, they your favorite team. What's up? I don't think the goaltending got worse. 
Um, I don't think that they addressed it by getting their guy. They don't have the money to. They got a decent one-two punch. I like Mrazek. I know he didn't have a huge sample size. I want to say he played 12 games last year. Uh, I think he had his best save percentage of his career in that small sample size. I don't mind their D. Um, where I guess there's a, a bit of a question mark is the five and six. That Sandine and Dermott. Uh, I think I Sandine think that they, could be good, dude. I I know, but come playoff time, he's not a big yeah. presence out there. You know, you need those big bodies, the guys who can remove guys from the front of the net. And he wasn't doing it enough offensively to outshine maybe the, I don't want to say the lack of defensive ability, but just, you know, it's just like, well, what is he? If he's a puck carrying defenseman and you got him as a number five and he's not getting his touches and his reps, is he as useful as he was, let's say with the Marlies? And, and, you know, lighting up down with the minors. Uh, you know, Dermot, I think he fits well as a, as a bottom pair, pairing guy, but, you know, nothing to write home about. We got Riley going into his last season um, under contract. I don't know how, how much that's going to play a factor, but I do like their top four on the back end. Where the issue lies is I, you know, we got those four monsters up front. So they got two unreal center, one, two punch with Matthews and JT. Then you got Marner on Matthews wing typically. And then uh, William Nylander on that second line with JT. I, I, that's looking how it's going to play out. I think that a very good cheap replacement for Hyman is going to be bunting, which he's good. Very good player. I was high on him. I talked about him at the end of the season when he was with Arizona. He had 10 goals in the 20 games. Great anticipation. He's an absolute pain in the ass to play against. And given the fact that he's never played enough NHL games, I want to say he's 25 or 26 years old, and he's still up for the Calder with crazy odds. And if he's going to be inserted on one of those top two lines – R.A., I would look to put a future bet on him. A lot of people have been talking about that online. Do I have to think he's going to win it, or can I just put the bet in (laughs) hoping he wins it? (laughs) Plus 3,500, too, Biz. Plus 3,500. And if he's playing with one of those top two lines, eh, I wouldn't say that's a bad number to bet. Right, R.A.? You typically like those big, uh, those those long-term plays. Yeah, but now they were dogging the age thing because of Kaprasov, so I think with him being older, they would never allow it to happen again. I don't know. You're, you're getting that East Coast Maple Leafs bias. Very okay. true. I think, get, I think if he scores talks. 10 goals, he might get it. But I could easily see him getting 20 on one of those top two lines. And then I don't know. I don't know who's going to insert on one of the other top two lines. Some so like some people are saying maybe Nick Ritchie. Who's I don't, one of those I don't big, why isn't why aren't they saying McKay, McKayev or whatever? Is, however you say it, that I guy think can he, skate, dude. I, I know, but he's one of those guys. He's got all the tools, no toolbox. I mean, look at his numbers from last year. What the fuck did he do in playoffs? Absolutely nothing. I want to see he had no points in seven playoff games. So it's that bottom six where things get a little bit interesting. I like the fact that they do have that toughness. One thing that they kind of shied away from for a few years there. They do have Richie. They got that uh, Curtis Gabriel who's been running around like an absolute maniac in preseason. And then and then Simmons. Are they going to get the same production from Jason Spezza that they got last year at his age at making, what, 750? He's making like the veteran league minimum. So... A lot of question marks. There's going to be a lot of pressure on that top four guys making all the money that they make. But this is a playoff team. I don't know whether or not they're going to get past the first round. I'm going to have to see how the fuck this season shakes out. They're going to be in a. I think that they're going to be in a dogfight to make playoffs with Montreal. I think they're going to finish four or five. I do think that they step in. But I think this, the, th- those guys are more experienced going in, especially William Nylander after the playoff he had last year. Um, and, and, of course, we know what Matthews and Marner can bring in the regular season. And I think that uh, back-to-back uh, Richard, Rocket Richard trophies for, for Matthews. I think he's going to get 56 goals this year and win the Rocket. You think they end up, you think they end up being the fourth? I, I bet you, I'll bet you that, that they're one of the top three in that division. I think that they uh, Boston finishes ahead of them, and I think both Florida teams do. And I think that, that I think Toronto they finish that ahead of seat. either Boston or Florida. I don't know though. Okay. I, I I think they're te- dude. They're good. I mean, like think about this team last year. You know, granted, it was the North. Everything was completely different. But dude, with those top two lines get going, and they're able to stay healthy. I think the biggest thing is the goaltending. And is, is Jack Campbell like? What are you going to get there? And when Mrazek's playing, it's the same question. But 
in terms of Toronto, like I, I like that team. I like bunting. Uh, I don't think Richie will end up on the top line, but in terms of toughness, maybe a guy in front of them on the power play, who knows? But I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not as down on him as you are. I'm not really down on them, and, and nor do I care if they, they finish first, second in the division. Because last year they won the North going in, and then they ended up getting beaten seven by Montreal. Oh, yeah, it doesn't was, matter now. It, do, it doesn't matter. If, any, if anything, and I, I, and I stress this the year that Tampa ended up winning all those games in the regular season, and then they got bounced by Columbus. I'd actually like to see them face a little bit of adversity in the regular season and catch their stride late in the season and take that momentum into playoffs. I don't give a fuck what they're doing in November. November, December. I want to see what they're doing in the second half of the season and how they're able to figure out those top two lines because, you know, given the fact that they just don't have the money to snap it around, they're going to have to find some cheap replacements. I think that they found it in bunting. I just don't know who the other guy is going to be in the top six. Biz, is it better to have tools and no toolbox or a toolbox and no tools? I, that's a great That's a great fucking question. Say it again. All right. Is it better to well, have... All, all the tools and no toolbox or toolbox. Wait, how many times no have tools? you said this about a player where you you see him in training camp and you're like, best skater, best hands, uh, scoring like a maniac, and then all of a sudden they get in the game and it's like, where the fuck did all that like, go? Why did they bring out? Their brain shuts <laughs> off. So it's all the tools, no toolbox. I mean, you, you've heard the saying before. Oh, no doubt I have. I was just kind of thinking. I mean, I think you'd rather all the tools – and no toolbox because at least you get the chance. If you just got toolbox but no tools, you're just a scrub on the street. You got even nothing. That you there's no. no I got two hundred games played. You don't even get in training <laughs> camp. No, you could play. The, you could play the. You were DJ. That's tool. That's tools. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I like that. Clip. I think you were kind of more tools than toolbox. And and, and we're gonna throw it to Butchergrass here, and a lot of pressure going into this season. I'm sure for uh, for Dubas. But I would assume if 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 they miss playoffs, his job's on the line. Is that is that a fair? It's got to be <laughs> no. I mean, yeah, they're a cup contender. Well, they see themselves as a cup contender, and if they don't make the playoffs, that'd be pretty fucking embarrassing. So, you know, and it's that's a place that you know they don't think twice about firing someone that quick. Then again, they brought him in of all this hullabaloo, this young, brilliant, analytical mind. I don't know. Do you want to throw out the baby with the bathwater? At the same time, how many shitty seasons can you can you put up with this? You know. Did I just Not fucking many. put your brain in a pretzel? Not many more, all right. I, I couldn't even watch that uh, that little documentary you guys are talking about because I was so heartbroken. But I will say this. I will double down on last year. Not with the first-round playoffs, but if they don't make playoffs, I'll chop the whole fucking thing off. <laughs> no. I'm going straight mangina if they eunuch. don't make playoffs. This is going to go full eunuch if fucking the Maple Leafs don't make the playoffs. But we all, we all have them going I'll in. I'll have Rick talk it, do it live on TNT. <laughs> I'll have him. I'll give him a cross check at the back. I'll have him lace up the skates, and he's gonna go full fucking heel right into my cock. Uh, chop the whole guy. I'll keep the ball sack. It's bi- but he's going full chop off. Hashtag, hashtag biz brist twenty. <laughs> oh fuck me! All right, like you said, we're gonna send it over to John Bouchagras from ESPN in one second. We do want to let you know that the interview is brought to you by Sezzle. Sezzle is a buy now, pay later solution that allows you to get what you want today while paying for it over time and for interest free payments over six weeks. Sezzle is now available at the Barstool Sports Store and more than 34,000 exciting stores in the United States and Canada. There are no hidden fees and no credit check if you pay on time with zero impact to your credit score. Sezzle is easy to use, offering instant approval decisions with no long forms to fill out. You just sign up and get an instant approval decision. You can use it to cuff some chiclet swag and then simply pay it off over a few payments in six weeks. You can't beat it. So go to the Barstool Sports Store now to shop and pay later with Sezzle. And now, our pal, John Bouchergrass. Well, it's been way too long since we've had this fella on the show, over four and a half years ago. <laughs> For the last 25 years, you've watched him crush it as an anchor on ESPN as well, as well as call play-by-play for the Frozen Four. He's a huge hockey guy and as excited as anybody that the NHL has returned to ESPN. We'll be seeing him talk puck once again very soon, and we cannot wait. Welcome back to the Spit and Chicklets podcast. John Bouchergrass, how fired up are you for this season, my friend? Hello, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> love it, love it. I am... Uh... No, I am pumped. This is like for someone my age um, to be pumped about still working 
And I, when you come into work and have this infusion of excitement, that's a that's a huge gift. You know, there's, there aren't many 55 year old second grade teachers who are like, yeah, I can't wait for this year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so yeah, I'm I'm really. It couldn't have happened at a better time, and it's perfect. I I mean, are you the point man, pretty much for everything there. You're going to be wearing a lot of different hats this mm. season, right? I'm a third line grinder. I'm the okay. I'm no first liner. <laughs> Do a little bit of everything. Uh, we are going to have a cool weekly show. Some weeks, more than one a week, called the Point, um, which we're real excited about. Hour long show on ESPN two, sometimes ESPN. Take it on the road to the All Star game. Just a way to. Andy Tennant is our E60 guy. You've seen those great stories, E60 and the Sports Center featured. He's the, he's the, he's the man behind this. And so we're going to give the NHL players a great platform to tell stories, um, show them off, and, you know, get Mark Messier, John Tortorella, you know, Kevin Weeks, all kinds of great in-studio people to talk hockey for an hour. And uh, our, our debut show is October 7th. Uh, Thursday, October 7th, to talk about the season. Torts will be there and Messier and Weeks and Emily Kaplan talking about some news. So it, I, I can't wait. That's really cool. It's kind of if NHL Tonight grew up, uh, if NHL Tonight had a baby and then uh, that, that child grew up, you always want your kid to be better than you at everything, better looking, smarter, the whole thing. This is the point. So, oh, so I'm hoping great. the point is better than uh, than the NHL Tonight in some ways. So, yeah, I'm really happy to do some play-by-play as well um fell nice. in for in the crease in some intermission so yeah i'm i'm really happy you mentioned nhl tonight and it's it's so crazy how long ago that was now but i yeah. remember that was the best it was barry melrose was on and ray ferraro was it both those guys at different times yeah uh, barry was there from show one he got fired and then of course i think there was a lockout and the show started after the lockout and it was barry right from the get-go ferraro would come whenever his teams wouldn't make the playoffs he would show up in the spring and be like a guest analyst while he was an active player. And then when he retired, ESPN brought him on the full time to do, um, you know, Stanley Cup stuff in between period stuff and, uh, and the NHL tonight. So, yeah, that was I mean, just think that's 2004 when we lost hockey. So, I mean, if you're 16 years old or younger, you've never seen, um, you know, ESPN do hockey or NHL tonight. You're really probably more like, you know age 20 or younger because you know you're three or four you're not going to remember watching nhl tonight at 1 a.m you know following a sharks kings game you know so uh so yeah so it, it, we, we kind of missed a generation so we're going to try to win them back and uh, of course the older folks a lot of nostalgia and some people kind of straddle it i'm glad joe thornton's still in the league because he was still playing when nhl tonight was around so that's kind of cool so yeah it's uh we're back and the music's back. Just got to bump that music. Exactly. That's all you need. That'll, that'll catch on quick with the people who don't know about it. But the interesting thing for you is once hockey went away, you're such a hockey guy. It's like your true love. And, and in talking to you, we've known each other for quite a while now. It was almost like you saw on the horizon poss- the possibility of ESPN getting hockey back. And the whole time you'd have contracts come up. I mean, you had a great gig running Sports Center and, and being an anchor. But you kind of knew there was a chance this could happen come 2021, right? Yeah, yeah, I talked to a couple teams, you know, in these last 17 years, a couple teams about play by play jobs, uh, NHL network, you know, and um, I just, you know, this is still the place, you know, to, to be it's hard to lose some people can leave ESPN, obviously, I couldn't. And uh, then I got involved with college hockey 2006. I did write my column. I started writing an ESPN.com column in 2001 did that for about 15 years. When my son graduated from high school and I wrote a column about watching his last game, I felt like I just emptied the tank and I had nothing left emotionally. And I uh, just felt like for 15 years, I kind of poured my hockey soul out there as a parent and a, and a viewer. And uh, so, yeah, so the college hockey helped kind of keep that alive. And then, of course, we got the World Cup. And that was real a big thrill to get the call games with NHL players, not an NHL game. But I called that crazy North America, Sweden overtime, which was a blast. And then, then again, the Frozen Fours, which are in NHL rings. So that was kind of cool. And that gives me, you know, some experience of maybe what I'm going to deal with when I call my, uh, you know, when I call my first NHL game. And, and uh, so, yeah, so it's been a long road, 17 years. Always thought it would get back and kind of saw it come in the last three or four years, especially, and was pretty confident we were going to get it. But you never know. I mean, you know, Apple could wake up and write a check for $2 billion and blow everybody out of the water, you know. So I never really was totally comfortable until the announcement came down. How, what's the enthusiasm in the building? Obviously, you, Linda Cohn, Steve Levy, uh, Barry Melrose, it, mo- the most known for hockey. But are, are there a lot of actual fans in the building that we just don't hear yeah. about that, that work that work there? 
Absolutely. I always have like real hardcore people. You know, we got a lot of people from the Northeast, but even across the country now as hockey's grown. Um, so yeah, there are a ton of hardcore hockey people. So, you know, when we got the announcement that we got games, we had plenty of infrastructure in place for people to produce and direct and, uh, and coordinate and produce and, you know, suits. And so, yeah, just had to hire some broadcasters, some new analysts, and uh, uh, play-by-play people. But yeah, we had a pretty big infrastructure in place. Um, really, you know, real hardcore hockey people. I don't know how much you guys talked about it last time you were on. It was four and a half years ago. A lot new, a lot of new listeners. You grew up a hockey fanatic. You're actually born in Pennsylvania. You yep. ended up uh, moving over to Boston and then spent some time living in Ontario. Who, who did you grow up rooting for? Who was your squad? Well, yeah, my dad was born in South Boston. Mom and dad are from South Boston. And my dad moved to Pittsburgh at a young age, thought he'd be there for a couple of weeks and was there for 30 years and, uh, and raised us out there. So I was, I, I was kind of a hybrid. My dad was a Steeler season ticket holder. So I was a big Steeler fan as a kid, a Pirate fan as a kid, Celtic fan. And then a Bruin fan, because the Bruins were the most popular team in Boston. They're like Tom Brady. They're like the Red Sox of 04 to 07. Just massively popular. My dad was in his, you know, late 30s, early 40s, gigantic sports fan. I was at my dad's hip. I always said, if my dad was a crack dealer, I would have grown up a crack dealer. I was going to do whatever he did. And But he was a gigantic sports fan. Still time. Sport- yeah, still got time. I'm holding out hope. Um, <laughs> just get the 401k dips. The 401k dips, I'll be ready. Um, so yeah, he, he would listen to Bruins games on the radio and I would listen right with them. And you know, when you, when you're raised on, and you learn about a game and listen to a game and consume a game on the radio, because there weren't many hockey games on TV in Pennsylvania, you kind of invent the game in your head. You, you use your imagination. You just, you know, I, I heard these games and listened to these games. And to me, it was a lot like, it was like Gothic to me. It reminded me of going to church. You know, my, my parents are very Catholic. So when I went to church, I heard the organ, I heard these old big churches, uh, you know, you, it's, it's about blood and, 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 you know, murder and violence and there's organs. And it reminded me of Maple Leaf Gardens or the Boston Garden. It's like, it's the same thing as church. And so I just kind of used, you know, I heard these fights and these bench clearing brawls and, you know, and just, it, it was such a mythic thing for me having invented it in my head. And I think that's why it's so searing. And that's why it always went like kind of right to my soul. And it was always just kind of there. And then even when my career first started on Cape Cod, my first boss was Fred Cusick, Hall of Fame broadcaster for the Bruins. His daughter was my first boss in television. And so, like, that's how my career began in 1989 with uh, Martha Cusick as my boss. And so I just always was around hockey. And I went to Providence five years after Cape Cod, my first kind of mini break. I was at the last game at the Boston Garden, a preseason game against the Canadians. And, and uh, two great years in Providence, my first Frozen Four, where BU and Chris Drury won. And then with ESPN in 96 and I'm doing NHL tonight. And then it's just kind of grown there. So hockey has always been part of my career, thankfully. Even so much. So I, I was reading up on a story and I hope it's true about you when you were living in Canada, uh, traveling down to Pittsburgh. Is that whole with, without tickets? I'm well, breaking t- news. I've never lived in Canada. I'm not James oh, no? Duffy biz. No, I'm John. Oh, I know, but, but, but sorry, a part of it had said something <laughs> about how you lived in Ontario. No, like I you're never GM have. of the. We're interviewing GM of the Leafs, right? Fuck yeah, off! Right. It, it, I'm gonna I'm gonna read what I, I, what I had here. Well, first, you, you had me as 56 years old and living in Ontario. So uh, T- time out. I, go, I never knew he lived up north. Were, were no. you Were you in Steubenville, Ontario, and you drove down to no, Pittsburgh? Steubenville, Ohio. That's an H, not an N. Man. Oh, Sorry. for Christ's sake! For home Christ of Jimmy the sake. home of Jimmy the you look like the third pet shop boy. Don't think like the third pet shop boy. <laughs> now what's oh, what's oh, worse? The fact that the first man. what's what's worse the, the first time uh, uh Grinelli calling you Boosie or, or, or me co- saying that you lived in Ontario. Oh no, yeah. my name has been my name's been butchered all my life. I am not sensitive to my name at all. Booger sauce, bucka gross, boosie gross. So yeah. So it took a while for people to see the Bucci Italian play. All right. No, it's my, all good, Biz. And but I, yeah, thought, no, I, I I, I want to hear the, the story. Ontario rain were in Ontario. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I want to hear this story though about you traveling to Pittsburgh. And my apologies. I thought maybe you yes. had your your dual citizenship or something. Yes. We can relate. Well, Nana was born in Newfoundland. My dad's mom emigrated when she was 18 to South Boston from Newfoundland. So I got a little bit of blood there. Um, but no, yeah, me and two friends allegedly took one of my parents' cars when we were 15 years old, and allegedly oh, drove an hour away uh, in Pittsburgh to. And allegedly bought a ticket off a scalper and then gave it to somebody else 
to let us somehow sneak us in the civic arena, which back then had glass around the premise. You could see inside. So the guy was creeping around, looking at us, keep going, keep going, creeping around, keep going. And then he's found this door. He opens this door and three of us sneak in to, uh, to, to, to the game. It was the North Stars game. It would have been 1981. And yeah, I'll never forget it. And then we left after the second period because we wanted to get home to, to, beat, uh, to beat our parents from coming home just in case they came home. They, they didn't. So we made it. And about an hour, about a half hour out, we were low on gas. We had no money for gas. And my buddy Steve pulled out three rolls of pennies. And we bought gas with three rolls of penny at this little uh, gas station to, to make it home to Steubenville. But Sneaking yeah, it's all allegedly. Sn- all siph- allegedly. Siphoning Save gas. for a fight. <laughs> Save <laughs> pennies. Yeah. Put them in a sock. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that was uh, that was all allegedly uh, that we did that. But, yeah, that's how much we love the game. Started a street hockey league in Steubenville. I would make a newspaper every week called the Hockey News. I would trace on the Hockey News, paint it in red. I'd write articles, keep stats, uh, write features on my friends in the street hockey league. And like, and I would bring it to class on Monday, and they would pass it around during uh, in high school during uh, the, the day, and they just loved it. Would and, you be uh, ripping so, every guy? Like, would it be like joke would. write-ups? I did. I, I definitely brought the heat. I look back and I can't believe I wrote that. And like chirping the commissioner. Why we need a new commissioner. Luke Lancey sucks. Get him out. All right. That kid's 12. No such thing as Steubenville, <laughs> Ontario, for all you people wondering who are listening. No, and we got no, a lot of Canadian listeners. <laughs> oh, oh, shit. God. Biz, we're going to teach post postal codes after this episode. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Oh fuck! Well, hey, the, uh, the the writing ended up leading you to to write uh, a book on Keith Jones. I also read that, yeah. so hopefully, I didn't fuck that one up. And that's true. No, no it was Jones, actually you... Eric Lindros. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course he, he had he had to retire because of his knee injury. He tore his ACL, and they took the middle third of his patellar tendon to fix it. And he came back, and then suddenly he's like, "There's something wrong with my knee." You know, they do an MRI. They're like, Jonesy, your, your ACL is fine. I thought he was faking it. He couldn't He couldn't jog across the street. He's playing NHL hockey, and Jonesy can't jog across the street. He thought he was going to get run over by a car. And uh, finally, they realized, he went to this one doctor, the middle third, usually your patella tendon grows back. But in his case, it didn't grow back, and that's why his knee, he couldn't play anymore. If they had used a cadaver like they usually do, he would have been fine. But that, you know, they, that middle third of his patella tendon they took out to use for his new ACL didn't grow back, and then he had to retire. Came to ESPN and had a great relationship. He kept, you know, he kept telling me these stories after stories after story. I go, Jones, we should write a book. And this local Philly publisher got a hold of me, and and so we did that. But writing a book is hard. Oh so, no shit! It, it, I don't want to do that again. You know, maybe fiction. That's what I that's can't what even I write properly in my notes, Booch. <laughs> <laughs> let alone let, let alone a book, man. That's unbelievable. <laughs> that's yeah. So, that was fun. One it sounded like a great idea, but then like you're a couple of days into writing, you're like, oh shit. Well, what happened? My basement kind of flooded, and so I had a got a I had a huge I was I got this offer to write the book. I'm like, I don't want to write this is hard. And then my basement floods, so I'm like, I got to redo the back. I got to grade it differently. There's like this bad slope, and I needed ten thousand bucks. So I said, all right, I'll write the book because I needed ten thousand dollars, and uh, and so that's why I did it because my basement flooded. Or I never would have wrote. That's probably what you should have turned to the drugs. <laughs> yeah <laughs> selling them anyway <laughs> quick crack dad do you have any extra crack <laughs> he's going between the glass this year right jonesy yeah for tnt yeah he's going to be between the glass do a bunch of stuff so i'm glad he landed on his feet obviously when nbc lost the coverage um you want those guys to you know to find a new place and luckily jonesy did darren pang will be there as well biz pet shop boy number three you know so it'll be a good cast <laughs> I don't know. I don't know the reference to Pet Shop Number Three, so West, I'm gonna have to yeah. get it afterward. But look at it up. But, yeah, but, but Movie going in back, Ontario. Yeah, <laughs> fuck. I'm never gonna hear the end of this. I'm gonna reference be lost on younger podcasts. I'm gonna be getting oh, tweets for, for, for a long time about it. But but going back to all these old stories that Jonesy was telling you, I'm sure you had to probably leave a few out of the book. But you yeah, guys have the so best many- one I did. Oh, but you, you guys have so many guys that you guys sign with ESPN. I would imagine that that's going to be part of the highlight of your job now is getting to hear all these amazing stories behind exactly. the scene. And you guys got some fucking heavy hitters. I mean, Messier has <laughs> got to have a couple in the closet and, uh, yeah. and Chelios and you, and you've actually worked with Chelios before as well on ESPN. the world cup. At, at the, the World, World Cup. Cup, him and Holly, him and Holly. I mean, getting oh, a beer with those guys afterwards was just <laughs> epic. Yeah. Oh, oh, a beer, a beer, a beer. <laughs> <laughs> twelve. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, but yeah, to get to know Torts and get to know Torts and Mess and Chelly and uh, and yeah, even Hillary Knight. So I'm sure she got some great Olympic Village stories. 
So, uh, yeah, it's a great cast. I'll be working with Boucher and um, AJ Malesko. In fact, I'm doing uh, just a little news for you guys. I haven't even tweeted this out. I'm, I'm doing breaking. opening night. School. I'm doing opening night in Vegas. The play by play. I can't oh, believe that's like, awesome. Fuck. Really? Congrats. Congrats. No way. I never Congrats. thought they would have me first... do that. I was pleasantly surprised. So, uh, yeah, to go out there and do the first game in Kraken history. Seattle, right? Yeah. History. Yes. That's fucking and, uh, awesome, in, Booch. Congrats. In Vegas. Yeah, I can't believe it. So, it's um, I'm really uh, – I'm just absolutely on cloud nine. So, um, yeah, I can't wait for that. So, I'm looking forward uh, – that's two weeks away. C- congrats, yeah. Boosie. <laughs> 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 no, that is sick. And I was gonna ask Best if you knew which, I was gonna ask if you knew the the games you were doing yet because it'll everything's probably changing. You're like, when do you do Sports Center? When is it NHL or is it no more Sports Center at eleven? Like, how is that all gonna work? Yeah, I'm not gonna do Sports Centers for a couple of months, a uh, couple of months at least. I got a contract with a certain amount of days in it. Yeah. I went to ESPN a couple of years ago and kind of I took a self imposed pay cut and just kind of I wanted to work less and recharge and kind of you know wait and see with this. That, I, that this I kind of made a bet that this was going to happen. I kind of, um, I'm not sure financially it was a very smart move to give back that much money, <laughs> but um, so I only have 85 days in my contract, so they got to be careful how much they use me until hopefully we redo one. My contract's up in 11 months, so I could be a big UFA next summer. So, um, you know, oh, yeah, yeah, so I'm sure there'll be a huge bidding war between all this, Steubenville yeah. Channel 9 and Kate yeah. 11 News. <laughs> With all this time off, you must be golfing quite a bit. TSN 12. Um, not as much because I, well, I I sold my place in Connecticut just in case I wasn't going to be here in a year. And I left my local golf club that I belong to. So I actually have played less this summer, but actually I'm playing better. So go um, figure. I know, but I am not- headed to, I'm headed to Wisconsin this week. And I'm, you know, I'm a big Steeler fan. Like I mentioned, I saw the schedule come out. John Anderson, Green Bay Packers season ticket holder with his family going back uh, centuries. He's from Green Bay. I go, John, Steelers at Lambeau. I've never been to Lambeau. Let's go out, play golf for three days, get me on Milwaukee Country Club, top 100, haven't pegged it, the old top 100 board. Uh, got on there, no big deal. Um, playing that Friday. And so a couple rounds of golf, Steelers, Packers, Sunday, and then come back Monday and it's all hockey. Oh, told you. Man. oh that's a nice trip before you get going with the madness yeah. of the NHL, right? Exactly. So, uh, so um, I thought stuff. I thought you guys crushed the uh, FDNY NYPD game. Turned out to be one of the funnest hockey games I've ever watched. And will that be your crew when you're doing your play by play with Weeksy and Ryan Callahan? That you guys no, had uh, great, great uh, vibes, rapport, together. chemistry. Well, those, those guys are so awesome. That's, you know, I like emotional people who get fired up. That's kind of those are my favorite people to be around. That's why I, I kind of gravitate towards hockey, just because it's uh, that kind of person, emotional and passionate and fun. And, uh, yeah, we had a great time. Uh, it just let it fly. And those guys were getting texts, you know, Yandel was watching with Kevin Hayes and, and they, they were getting, a, they were getting a big kick out of it. And so, yeah, I, I went in with like a little bit of low expectation because like, man, the garden's unbelievable. The vantage point there for a broadcaster is unbelievable. So I had a great time. So, you know, I'll be working with a bunch of people, like I said, Boucher and AJ opening night. I'll do a Sabre game with Callahan against the Bruins in October, which okay. is kind of cool. That'll be an ESPN plus game. I can't wait for the guy in Southie turning on Nesson that night saying, oh, hey, boy. where are the Bruins, for Christ's sake? You know, <laughs> where the they're going to the call, the call their son, you know, <laughs> Billy, where oh. are the bees? What's ESPN Plus? Oh, you got to download this app now. <laughs> yeah. So it's going to be, I think it's going to be interesting. There's going to be a lot of phone calls from, from uh, 50 and 60 year olds to their kids. How do I, what's a fire stick? Uh, I- Roku. Oh, you. Uh, that's my billion my billion my billion dollar idea booch is to is to teach boomers how to stream it's it's incredible yeah. like what once they get exactly. it, it there's such a market for it too i'm telling and, you it's funny you say boomer my idea is get chris Furman to do it give a simple three-step thing and he, <laughs> he, if i can do it you can do it you know i mean and just let them know hey get espn plus now and get the bundled hulu disney ES, that's the best way to do it all nhl.tv is going to espn plus you can see every game except the ones on TNT, every single game will be on ESPN plus. It's, you know, uh, so you can, it, it's baked into the package. It's not like a UFC fight where you got to pay extra, you know, for, to get the fight. It, it's all in that same little fee. So I think it's going to be a good place for hockey people uh, to go to tons of content, college hockey as well. So um, I'm excited. I hope there's, you know, as, as little snafus as possible and that, you know, things will go smoothly and people will, will, you know, realize what a great product. 
Now, just to clarify what you were just saying, now a lot of people yeah. were asking people who do yeah. who did subscribe to like Center Ice or NHL TV. If you have ESPN Plus Hulu that that package, you can get you'll be able to get every out of market game home and away like before. Or, or, or right. that man, real okay, go cool. that's Same awesome. Thing. Yeah. Same okay. thing as yeah, NHL TV. Yeah, I'm not sure if they have both feeds and everything NHL TV had. I'm sure they want to transfer over it as much as possible. But obviously, right. the Center Ice package is a separate thing. So if oh, you get right, that was with Direct TV, right? Yeah, you'll you'll still get that if you get Direct TV or uh, and yeah, I don't know about cable. It's like it's going to be offered on Comcast. I don't know. I um, I cut the cord a while ago. I just get the the Fubu and the and the Disney bundle. That's that's what I get and. Um, that's enough. And Netflix. Those are, those are the three things I get. So, yeah. So, you know, and it's, so every on market game uh, will be on. Uh, but we do have 70 exclusive games. We're producing them all. So, again, if you're a Red Wing fan or a Bruin fan or uh, I like King fan, there's going to be some of your games that are going to be on ESPN Plus. They won't be on your local feed. So you got to be proactive and be ready for that. Yeah, I already got my dad all prepped. So I know you don't subscribe to HBO Max. <laughs> no, I know I should because there's so much good stuff on there. I'll probably have to eventually. There's just way too much stuff. On just there. ask him, all right? Have you yeah. seen Ted Lasso? No. Or why? <laughs> Fuck Christ! That's on yeah, Apple. That's on Apple Plus. I bought, a, I, I bought Plus an package. iPad. <laughs> I, I, bought, I bought an iPad about ten months ago, and I, one of the perks of that was you get Apple TV for a year. Exactly. So I was. I, I am on the Lasso. I haven't seen the last two or three, but yeah, it, it, it's a great show. I'm a big fan. Yeah, yeah, I, I wasn't even going there because it's not even on HBO. I was just, I like ball busting RA. <laughs> I, I, know. I had to get one back Bush, for the Ontario. Yeah. I'm, I, I still got to get Grinelli <laughs> and Wit. <laughs> uh, so, Pooch, I think, you know, and NBC last year, it was kind of a lame duck status. It was their last year. I thought they became kind of somewhat vanilla. What can we expect different on ESPN uh, to maybe goose it a little bit this year? Well, they're definitely going to, you know, throw out all the toys um you know i'm kind of curious to see what the broadcast is going to um you know look like in terms of some different things different cameras lots of cameras uh they, they want they, you know they have a big initiative to make the intermissions a big deal and not just you know three dudes behind a desk in a suit just going blah 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 go to break you know it's it's tough and i and i've, I've been pushed them espn plus let's don't wear suits let's sit in a couch or sit yeah. at a bar and get a sponsor and just talk hockey like dudes would talk hockey, like you guys talk, you know? And uh, and I would even say, what, what, let us swear a little bit on the SBM Plus. You know what I mean? It's like, it's uh, you know, th- just try to bring some of that realness to the, to let mess be comfortable, let Chelios be comfortable, um, see how fast they might get fired. You know, let's go, let's just let it go. Just ripping um, the bong. They're saying the wrong thing. <laughs> but uh, so, yeah, so I hope we stick with that initiative. It's easy to sink back down into, comfortable but i do think michael quaid who's overseeing our games andy Tennant, who's overseeing our studios um i think we're gonna you know you hope you but you know for a lot of times the traditional hockey broadcast is awesome you don't want to tweak with it too much so it is a fine line but i'm hoping with graphics and, and other things we really infuse some life i thought there would be a, a some life infused when they made the announcement I, I was even blown away the day we made it and the day after uh you know the, the reaction from fans around hockey i know the players wanted to be on espn you know espn is kind of part of the landscape of america you walk through a airport it's on yep. it's on you know one of the bars you go in your hotel you know you have it on your hotel Bobby package Jones. whatever so it's all that all that stuff it's just you kind of always see it and now, like I said, we'll have an hour-long hockey show on once a week and even more than that in the playoffs in the first week of the season. So, yeah, I hope that it does help the sport and the players are pumped. We just got back from Chicago for the players' media tour thing, and we had this gigantic 100-foot screen, video screen on the ice at the Blackhawks practice center, having the players do their fun stuff with the cameras and everything. And you could tell they were like, wow, ESPN is spending some dime on this uh, week. And so to be out there. I talked to OV, talked to – it was so fun that we had the players listen to the ESPN theme music. And it, it basically, hey, could you put the last, I asked all the same questions, You're looking right in the camera. This we got a bunch of content for the for the start of the season, and uh, a lot of you know some of the Canadian young Canadian kids were like, "Is that football music?" Like they they didn't know the music. So I had Ovi in there. I go, Ovi, put the headset on. I want you to listen to a song. Tell me, do you know it? And uh, if you like it, and um, so he goes, he starts listening. Goes ESPN hockey music, and then, and then someone else said, "Can you hum along with it?" He's like. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> so he uh, he takes it off and i go you know that song and obi goes of course i know that song it was like obi doesn't miss anything like obi is like paying attention if you think obi doesn't know what's going on hockey wise record book wise like that was pretty impressive a guy who had never been on espn knew that was espn hockey music somehow he's I, a lot of guys didn't a lot of guys few- didn't know 
He's done a few commercials with you guys, hasn't he? Yeah, he did the Vista Sports Center commercial when he was 24. And that's when I was writing my column. This was 2010. And I had like 10 minutes with him. I said, uh, and I to do a little column because I was always looking for something. It's tough to write one once a week, 3,000, 4,000 words. And that's what I brought up to him about what do you think about breaking Gretzky's record? So I wrote that column where I forecasted ahead till he was 40 years old. Here's the path Ovi could get uh, to break Wayne Gretzky's record of 894 goals. And I'm, it's probably a ridiculous thing to bring up when a guy's 24, but I did something about him. So uh, yeah, that column, luckily it's aged well. And so in Chicago, the last thing I asked him, I go, Ovi, how many goals does Gretzky have? He says, 892. I go, 894, pretty close. How many goals do you have? Seven. Three zero. You said each number individually. I go. I go. Who's the first person to ask you if you had a chance to break the record? He goes, you. <laughs> I'm like, wow, that was so cool. He remembered. He remembered. He remembered that. He, that he knows that. Like I said, he knows what's out there. He, I think it's a big deal to break that record for his family, for his parents, his you know his mom and dad, his country, of course. And uh, and I think, like I said, it's not difficult for him to do it. I think it's more likely uh, that you know he'll. he'll uh, it, more likely he'll get a thousand goals than not break the record. Then, then really? he yeah, I mean, you when you first you were the first media person I ever saw really put it out there and talk about it. I was like, what? Because you never imagine it's possible. And kind of how you mapped it out is the way it's going. And the right. the wild thing is now that it's become pretty realistic. It's almost like the next two years matter a lot. Like if he gets a hundred in the next two years, or then you're like, all right, it's kind of a foregone conclusion. If you one of the years he gets twenty five, it's a question. He doesn't need 100 in the next two years. Uh, here, I got it mapped out. It, he's right now at 730. If he gets 37 goals this year, pretty reasonable. 32 next year. And then 40 at age 37 nice. because Phil Esposito and Brennan Shanahan both had 40 goal seasons at age 40. So that's why I did the historical. Uh-huh. It's not out of the question. Um, and then 27 goals at age 39 and 25 goals at age 40. So 37, 32, 40. One more real good one, 27, 25. That, that gets him with 926. It's like this isn't this isn't even close if he doesn't get hurt. And like I said, it's probably gonna be more. Like if he pumps in 50 this year, and like you said, 42 next year. Now that's that's 92 instead of 69. Now he's got stuff to play with. Now again, he could tear his quad next year, and that, that's a problem. You know, what I mean, anything could happen. Yeah. So that's why I get when people are still a little skeptical. But again, like 37, 32, 40, and 220 goal seasons at at 39 and 40 and with the way he is and he could play till he's 45 we know all these guys who can't nowadays so i really think it's an inevitability and it's the biggest record chase since aaron chased babe ruth i think for the two yeah. people involved and the record itself people don't care about football records when brady breaks drew Brees' record that's that's not a big yeah. deal which is actually probably a strength of football they don't ripkins it. was big Rip, that's a good call. That's actually that's you're right. That's a better call. So that that it won't be maybe as big as that, but it's certainly in that top three yeah. uh, to top four. And, and Boots, yes. they added cross checking to the to the penalty book, like uh, as one yeah. of the calls this year. So more power plays, more chances for over to to score. That's right. To score, yeah, they, call at the bus stop. He just stands there at the bus stop at, at that at that left circle. He doesn't even flex his knees, you know, just to save his energy. And then he gets ready when it shows up. But yeah, the NHL was there when we had our week long Chicago thing, and and they brought it. You know, Stephen Walcom was there, and and they show the the point of emphasis that was going to be cross checking early. So we're going to have a lot of power plays early. So yeah, those power play specialists are going to get a good start. Since you have all these uh, goals written down in, in the trajectory, uh, how many goals has he scored from that spot on the ice where he stands in the power play? Do you know that? Oh, uh, they have every goal he's ever tracked. I don't know off the top of my head, but it, that wouldn't be hard to find. They have every goal he's ever scored. I'm going to say 400. <laughs> from the, like, I seriously. Mean, from that one spot? From the top of the left face-off dot. Yeah, Maybe 300? Half. Yeah, I would say like 250. I'd say probably go 250, 300, because I don't think half have been there. But like you said, a third, you'd think a third had come from there. Who, who are some of the young NHL stars that really garner your attention? Like, who do you really want to yeah. really focus on coming into this season? That was fun being there. Um, yeah, because they send the top dogs guys. to that week. Yeah, Chickren was there. That guy's an absolute, you know, rom com star. Stallion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> built, built like a linebacker. Um, you know, Roman Yossi was there, uncomfortably handsome. Uh, he's older yes. now, though. But, um, but yeah, actually, you know, Robertson and Chickren and McAvoy is amazing. But Jack Hughes, I'm telling you, that dude has such charisma. He's like an X game athlete, like, he's got a total X game vibe. The NHL should push him forward. I mean, and get him out there and follow him around and mic him up. 
put him forward to get that, you know, 16 to 25 year old crowd. I think he's, he's the king of that demographic right now. He is really cool. And um, I had a big kick talking to him. He's, he's really cool. But any, hey. um, any teams that kind of stand out to you as like a possible, I don't want to say surprise, but a team, a lot of people may not think about that could go, go on a little bit of a run this year. Yeah, not not really. It seems like, you know, it's still you know, out west. It's not as strong, obviously. It still yeah. seems like it's Vegas or Colorado. Um, and then in the east, it's, you know, the east is interesting because the Penguins are aging. The Capitals are aging. Um, you know, the Bruins are in a weird spot. They're aging. To it. Yep. And um, so who will young players step up in the brusket 28? You know, they're relying on some of those young guys to break out. Um, you know, the Flyers got the worst goaltending in the league last year. You'd think they'd bounce back, but uh, and can Tampa get three in a row? You know, uh, I don't think an American-based yeah. team's ever won three in a row. Only I think it's just the Canadians and the Maple Leafs who've done it. Uh, Islanders, um, right? And the Islanders, of course. Yeah, you're on oh, my yeah. bad. Um, so, so yeah. So, you know, can they do it? Losing that, that you know, the, the Gord, Coleman, and Goudreau line that I was they didn't do it until they got those brought those guys in. Now they're gone. But can they recreate it enough? They got the best goalie. They got a stud defenseman, and they got Kucherov. So they still got guys in their twenties in their prime why they are a legitimate threat. But yeah, no one really stands out to me who can make that big jump up. It's, you know, teams like, well, LA start to come back with all those young draft picks. Some of those teams like that. Um, but I think it's pretty open this year, which makes it fun. Who was the most improved team over last season? Oh, most improved team over last season. Uh, what's which, which yours, Witt? I, I think Philly's going to be way better. I'm not necessarily saying like what they did has made them that improve. I just think that year was such a disaster, and this year they're going to be very good. Yeah, yeah I mean, their goaltending goal is yeah. historically bad. Like it, it was just you know they're it's just so bad that they have to get better this year uh, just from that. So we'll see if that defense they recreated that is uh is strong enough. But yeah, I, I think Philly could have a bounce back year for sure. But. Um, other than that, I, I, I don't – nothing jumps out of me because the West, no one really scares me that much. I said Chicago just given the fact that obviously they've addressed goaltending. And, they I mean, that young kid who stepped in last year did a pretty good job. They got their ace on the back end. I mentioned yep. them getting Taves back. They said Kane's been a little banged up the last year and a half. You would have never noticed. Uh, they ended up picking up Tyler Johnson. So they're top nine forwards. Like even having Dylan Strom as a third line center. Like I think they're very, very strong up front. But I think, I don't know if it was you, Wit or even you are a last podcast who mentioned uh, New York. Because if they start getting contributions, and you mentioned getting the younger guys, like getting contributions, especially from guys on entry-level contracts. Like um, uh, who's who's the one? Uh, Capo Caco. Like he yep. hasn't really popped off yet, and then of course uh, Lafreniere, and then they 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 have a, a ton of weapons. They have an unbelievable back end, and then they got a pretty good tandem in net. So I think uh, I think New York, I, it's tough to say most improved because they really haven't added much. But just from getting contributions more from the younger guys, I think uh, that that's that seems to be a sneaky pick for me. Yeah, I think it's one of the best stories bringing Reeves in and really, you know, they've been so public about that. The whole Wilson incident was just, you know, one of the biggest stories last year. It's going to be fun to see that first game and just to see, will they really be that much of a different team? And, and was that really a problem? So I think that's a very interesting story watching the first 10, 15 games. He was already showing Kravtsov how to fight. He's like teaching <laughs> yeah. guys how to throw punches, getting ready for the Washington game. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, that was good stuff. I think he's teaching the whole team, too. Right? Didn't you guys have a blog about that where he's teaching the whole team how to fight? <laughs> uh, do the Kraken make the playoffs, Booch? Yeah, I think they're, well, they're in a weak division. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems like they'll have a hard time sco scoring goals. But, man, they got good defensemen. They got a good goalie. Um, two good goalies. Two good goalies. And, you know, I think they're going to be, you know, someone like, you know, they, Yarn Croak and McCann, those guys could pump in 25, just like Vegas' first year. You never saw William Carlson's year coming. Eric Hollis his season coming there you know no one saw that and um so yeah i think because of the because of the division how fast gord looks like he's coming back way earlier than they thought um and they got room to make a move if they get off to a good start i wonder after first 25 30 games if they're in a position do they then kind of maybe trade some people and start thinking for the future because as well as vegas has done they haven't won a cup and they're getting older quickly. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's been an amazing story. Their success. It's been a, the, one of the most successful, maybe the most successful uh, expansion franchise of all time in any sport, how quickly they became good. And, uh, but what if they don't get it and they start going the other way, Seattle might like say, see, we might want to take this slower. So I think it's going to really dictate for them. Where are they in early December? 
What did you think of their logo and uh, the unis? The whole, the whole, basically outside the box from what we usually get from the NHL. It's just huge. The amount of revenue they're bringing in for the league oh. and for themselves, especially post lockout. That I mean, the, NH- the NHL could not have timed this any better. It obviously pops. I think the blue ones really pop more than the white. Um, that's an, an amazing uniform, an amazing logo. Uh, they can't keep stuff in the stores. Um, so yeah, it, it's important for the league. And uh, that was a great identification, Vegas and Seattle. And, um, yeah, they really hit it out of the ballpark. And they let those, te- those teams be competitive. It's like, why would Starbucks open up a new Starbucks somewhere and, you know, and then let rats kind of, you know, walk around the store? They wouldn't do that. You know, you've got to give someone a chance to succeed. And by doing that with the NHL, it's just so smart. You don't want crappy teams. I mean, Atlanta had the Flames. Then they had the Thrashers. Yeah. They never had a chance for hockey to work there. And that was – Really, pretty revolutionary of the NHL, and I bet it will be copied in the future by other other sports when they expand. Uh, I got a couple, um, not rapid fire, but just easier questions that I want your opinion on. First is uh, how many goals does Austin Matthews get? You're usually good at these predictions. All the way with the used to have the column, you'd always be banging out these things preseason. Nailed them, nailed them. Uh, yeah, uh, he's the best goal scorer in hockey, you know, right now. Uh, I'll go 60, uh, 61 for Austin Matthews. Wow. A mats. Amats, as his peers call him. I didn't realize that. I learned that in Chicago. They all call him Amats. Amats, no shit. Yeah, all, all the guys that play with him at U18, U17, you know, they all call him Amats. I was like, oh, I, I never heard that. You don't. So, uh, you, so yeah, so that, that was that was. All right, he's got 61. Good. What about do the Edmonton like, Oilers shit, make the playoffs? That. Edmonton does. Oh, no, make no, the do they win a round in the playoffs? I think they get in. Uh, yes, they will win a round in their division. Oh, shit. I don't know about that one. I yep, don't they'll know. Win the two, they'll win the two, three series. <laughs> Fair enough. And last one, what do I got for you? I'm going to save these. Last one I got for you. In, oh, who wins the uh, division with Tampa and Florida? I don't even know what it's called. The Atlantic, I believe. The Atlantic. The Atlantic. Um, Carolina, I, Tampa, Florida. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll – oh. uh, Carolina's in the other division. Yeah, oh, they're in the other one? one? You're yeah, talking I, Bruins, Maple Leafs. Oh, Tampa. yeah, that makes no sense to me. Dude, fuck. I, I, I looked at it today. It's like, why is Detroit in the Atlantic and not Carolina? Yeah, I always like, fucked that up. Tampa and – no, it's it's all known now, I think, all most of it. Because, yeah, Tampa and Florida are in the same division as Bruins, Buffalo, Toronto, Montreal. But – they get Detroit, but Carolina's in the other one. I don't know. I don't know why. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, 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 wa- like, huh? I want to. I want to take Florida, but you know, the, the goal. I'm just not sure about the young goalie and the older goalie. So uh, I'll have to go Tampa again one more time to uh, to squeeze it in. Because remember, if they're not right, they'll fix it. They'll give away every first round draft pick they in the future to fix that. You know what they don't have. They've shown that they do that better than anybody. And like I said, they have the core Hall of Famers: Hedman, Kucherov, and uh, and Vasilevsky. So. Um, I'll stay with Tampa Bay. I was just going to ask, is there any other storylines going into the season that you're really going to be focusing in on? Like, is there really, I mean, yeah, it's, you know, to me, it's, it's about Seattle. It's about McKinnon and, uh, in Colorado. I tried to have him eat a Kit Kat with me out there in Chicago. He wouldn't do it. He was not interested in sharing a Kit Kat. He wants to put that story to bed with his fanatical diet. But, uh, yeah, if a teammate eats sugar, he'll have your family kidnapped. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's wound tight. I mean, you guys have seen it before. He's an he's a very serious guy, and uh, I like it. Though. He, he just kind of simmers there sitting in that chair when you interview him. Um, but yeah, but yeah, can can he get over the hump? Because let's face it, he's uh he, he wants he, he's suddenly a a vet, a grizzled vet all of a sudden. After seeing that Jordan documentary, I kind of like, there's a little bit of resemblance there, and like just the intensity and like how he. I don't want to say barks at teammates, but he's like keeping them massively, massively accountable, like almost to a a point where it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I mean, Hey, like that's, that's his personality. And he, I feel like he's like, he wants that cup at a young age, much like Sid did. Right. But that's too late for that now. Like, I mean, he's in year nine, you know, it's like, what, when did that happen? You know? So now he wants to get it. Now he's in his prime, his, his last prime window here is probably four to five years. He's got the defenseman, and now it's just, you know, can Darcy Kemper be the guy to be good for two months? You don't win with good goaltending. You win cups with great goaltending, and you got to be great for two months, and that's what separates the men from the boys between the pipes. Gee, I know you wanted to jump in on something, Mike. Yeah, Booch, big, uh, big college hockey guy. Who do you think wins the national championship this year? 
Well, the final, the Frozen Four is in Boston, which I'm pumped for. Um, nice. And so, um, I, you know, it'd be great if they got there. It'd be great if Michigan, with all those number one draft picks, gets there. It's good. And, uh, you know, it's always good to have, I always say I want three, three brand names and a, and a Cinderella story at the Frozen Four for ratings and interest. So, certainly, uh, St. Cloud State is loaded. They should get back there again this year. And Minnesota is really good. So, we could have a Minnesota, St. Cloud, UMass, um, and Michigan frozen four, we, we'd get some Buku ratings and that'd be a lot of fun. So, uh, yeah, I can't wait for that to get going. I hope I still call those games, uh, some regular season games in the frozen four in Boston. I think it'll be my 10th. I think. Uh, oh, Jay- oh, 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 sorry. Go ahead, I, I know. Well, there's I always just... ta- oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I know there's always talk about getting the, you know, international audience, of course, the Olympic Olympics are next year, but I yeah. feel like there's a lot of potential fans here in the States that they still haven't reached. Like what, what can the league do? Or maybe the networks now that they're on ESPN and TNT, you know, those leagues at the same uh, networks that carry the NBA, you know, do you think do they think they might get some crossover like guys who watch those uh, or guys and ladies who watch typically watch those networks for the yeah. NBA might get lo- roped into the semi NHL action. You hope, but as you know, there's a hundred slices of entertainment nowadays. It's really difficult um, if you can just hold your head above water, you're winning. You know, the NFL is the only outlier that just continues to explode. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I'm hoping between us and TNT, a little more reach um, that we can at least keep bringing in the young fans and, and be a be certainly an alternative, give it a shot. I think it can only help. I think the league and Gary Bettman realize that this is a, a position they can can grow from. They bring in Seattle, bring in Las Vegas. And uh, so, yeah, so I'm hoping we'll see. Uh, but like I said, there's so many slices out there, but we know it's a great game and we have some young stars and it's, and, you know, so it's up to us to try to push it and, and uh, hopefully that can get them more in the mainstream. Austin Matthews, I think is a big part of this. If they can somehow get him out front and, yeah. and create a persona for him, he's so unique, such yeah. an interesting, the way he dresses and of course his heritage coming from Arizona. Um, it's just, he's, he's a guy you'd like to see them hopefully, put front and center and, and really become a star. Also with the Hispanic background, like the multiculturalism as well. And there's yeah, one amazing. thing I, I did yeah. that EA shoot with him and he said, if there's one thing I, I would love you to pull for on the podcast, it's like convince, convince them to do no dress code. These guys want to be walking in just like the NBA guys. They want to have their Gucci track Cedos or whatever the yep. their, their Drew sweaters, like the, the the Bieber line. I guess that's the new cool thing. And they want to have their own style. They don't want to be the black suit, black tie guys anymore. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, hey, whatever it takes. I don't know. You know how slow hockey is to change, especially with all of Canadian influence still in the front offices. They like their suits and they like their uniformity. Um, and that is a great thing about hockey, the uniformity, the sacrifice, the selflessness. That is why we love the game, a big reason why we love the game. But there's got to be a balance where you can figure you can. That's still a hardcore value of the sport. You'll still block a shot. You'll break your leg for the team. But, yeah, if you want to wear jeans and, and one of your 300 pairs of tennis shoes you have to the game, I think they'll still block a shot and break their ankle for the team. I don't think that's going to change. So, yeah, those are things you have to think about. But there, there's still an old school, hardcore feel in the NHL offices that's that's still you know it, it's still a bit of a resistance to that there's a little that's resistance silly. to change it's a real thing there the, like, the the crazy thing for me is that like the best a lot of the best parts about hockey and what make it so special are kind of the same things that are holding it back from growing a little bit that's what I'm saying yeah it, it's it's very odd in a sense that the humility and the players all being about team and rarely ever saying I is great, but in the end, it almost helped the sport if there was a bunch of guys that weren't like that. It's just it's it it's up to guys to really end up not only be good enough to be able to do it and realize that they're still going to have a job and have a team who wants them, but be willing more than anything to risk having a team mad at you if you do or say some things that'll get a lot of clicks and get a lot of views, but may not be popular with the team. So it's interesting. Yeah. And we see that with baseball. They've done a nice pivot. They, they allow bat flip style. Yeah. You know, Fernando Tatis Jr. It's like, that's that's funny. And his little stutter step at third base. It doesn't offend everybody. It's like, yeah, let him have his moment. It's cool. And the pitcher will have his moment. And occasionally yeah. they'll chirp back and forth. And you want conflict. You want that. that. That's part of the game. And, of course, hockey has plenty of that. That's another great part of the game. It's real organic hate and conflict within the realm of the game. So, yeah, you can't. There is a way to have all both. Uh, to have both baseball did it and they probably had very similar hardcore uh, treatment uh, that hockey does. And I always use the football analogy. When a guy comes over the middle and he gets trucked, there's not a fight. Like there's not a fight. Every time a guy hits a hard hit on a wide receiver, even if it's an illegal one, they don't fight. 
you know, they, if there's a penalty, there's a penalty. They know it's part of the game and they move on. So that's part of the next thing about hockey. You're allowed to hit hard and don't have to fight. But again, that standing up for your teammate, uh, standing up to a bully, that also is attracting. That's kind of, that's an interesting part of the game. That's why we love it. I think the young guys just need to, to do it. Just celebrate however you want right. and don't worry about yep. the repercussions. Just, just do it. Like what you might I get agree. hacked and whacked all the next game and all the guy might slash you. But you know, if, if you want to be an individual, you can still do it. Like there's nothing to hold them yep. back. Or if you're the Maple Leafs, like Austin Matthews, go to the front office. Can we dress the way we want to dress? Just try it one game. Let, let's do yeah. one game. Let us dress how we want to dress. And uh, we promise we won't look like hobos. We'll look cool and give us that chance. So, you know, that's what it will take. At some point, you just got to do it. You're better off asking for forgiveness than permission sometimes. Oh, yeah. And uh, just, just go ahead too. and do it. <laughs> Booch, earlier in the interview you, you alluded to the e60 now you, could you tell us about any of the type of features that you guys are going to have or are they all top secret going into the yeah, year like, well like we had to sit down with evander kane talking about the whole gambling thing and that was you know we're not going to be afraid to do those stories we're not going to be you know we're just not going to be a pr arm and we're not going to you know we're, we're going to if there's a big controversial story or something or in-depth thing we're going to cover you know we're going to sit down or we're going to, we're going to talk about it or have that journalistic side. So that's, that, that's, got, that's an example right there. Um, and so those are the kind of stories we won't shy away from that. If, if there's a controversy, we're going to take it on head on. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to, we're partners with the league for sure, but we have to tell these stories in a complete transparent way. And we will. Okay. I agree on the, on the dress thing too, especially these guys who have like a half mile walk to work and picking up a coffee. And it's like, they got to put this monkey suit on just to walk 15 yeah, right. yeah, to go right. change and put on this sweaty, gross equipment. Anyways, it, it makes no sense. Right. But, uh, I want to get to another thing. Um, you know, we've seen Scott Van Pelt and uh, Stanford, Steve, they've been doing the bad beats for a while. Awesome segment yeah. that those guys do. Uh, are we going to see more gambling talk given that teams are now in bed with casinos essentially. And the whole concept of gambling has done a 180 since, you know, 15 years ago, five years ago, maybe even. I certainly would like to sprinkle it in the broadcast. If there's an over under situation looming late in the game, I think P- it's okay to talk cover. about that. Little Absolutely. Cover. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, those, those empty netters are very stressful they're, for people. They're huge, John. I mean, it, especially you know, when they pull the, when they pull them so early now, right? Cause you, oh, you know, yeah. Now it's three minutes. Uh, Patrick Gras yeah. was great. He was pulling his goalies with like five minutes left. <laughs> Absolutely. Revolutionary. No one did it before him. He revolutionized. Jock Lemaire would do it with 14 seconds left in Minnesota. Ugh, he would worst. not pull that goalie. Here comes Wah with three or four minutes to go, and he he revolutionized. He changed hockey. Um, one of the biggest coaching, you know, changes uh, in the last twenty five years of what Patrick Wah did. He was ahead of his time. I want to say sportsbook haven't adapted to the the in game line as far as when the goalie is pulled to. So they say it's one of the easiest thing to capitalize on far as making money and gambling in sports is that empty net. No, really? for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, oh, I think, like- so when I was in Vancouver, I was just walking by a bunch of guys and there were a couple of guys outside having a cigarette and they were like, Hey, what's up? Listen to the podcast. And they traveled in. Cause this guy was doing this like gambling thing. Now RA might be like, Oh yeah, this guy's got him hook, line and sinker. But they said that, that they basically had like a couple of them had like went part time on their jobs because they made so much money in gambling on hockey puck lines. Like where they had like an algorithm down where they would all kind of be in this like text chain and, and they were basically drinking one of the guys Kool-Aid and they were there to see him. And he was kind of giving like a lecture on it and how to keep capitalizing off it. And, and I don't know, maybe the sports book will will catch up now, given that it's, you know, the gambling is kind of being elevated and it's everywhere, but who knows? RA, here's your time to shine, buddy. If they can't figure it out, make up all that money you've lost. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you might have to sign me up for a hundred year deal for that. <laughs> but no, well, the, well, the thing with the puck line talk too is like you, you got to be clear because puck line is one minus one and one and a half or plus one and a half. And you know, right. I I don't advocate betting the plus one and a half at all because you know sometimes you're playing one hundred and ninety to make a hundred for a, a guy to ba- a team to basically lose boots. You know, you're getting the yeah. goal and a half. Well, if they lose, you still win. It's like, well, if you like them a win, then take them for the, the money to win. It's just, it's, I just don't right. understand it as a gambler. Hey, to each his own, but the puck line, it, you know, there is two sides to it. When we say puck line on the show, it always means minus one and a half because that's where the money right. is. Got it for sure. For sure. But we will be more transparent with that too. I'm sure. Like I'm doing uh, one of my, the point shows I'm calling a game. I'm doing it, doing it from Vegas opening night since I'm there. And uh, doing one probably from that studio. So uh, we'll try to bring some that night. Nice. When, when are you going to be out there? 
Uh, well, for opening night, you know, doing the open night game, but we're going to do the point um, that you know, the day before or the day of the game from the Daily Wager studio in Vegas. And then we'll oh, nice. hop over the arena and call the game at night. So, uh, and Sean McDonough and Ray Ferraro have the Tampa Bay game, the first game, Lightning Penguins, when they raise the banner. That's our first ESPN game since game seven, 2004 Cup Finals, Calgary and Tampa Bay. So Tampa Bay had our last game in 04. Torts was yeah. the coach. And now they have the first game here with Torts in the studio for us. That's wow. great, too. Sean McDonough is going to crush great. it. He's awesome on play-by-play. No, I think great. he's going to. I think he's going to be great. Well, you I mentioned too, you're, you're, so. you're going to be in uh, Vegas for the All Star game, so so will we. So hopefully we can catch yes. up in person there and do some stuff together there. That'd be a blast. We appreciate you uh, coming on, dude. We're excited for this year, man. Uh, I'd love to come on out there. Uh, don't forget Bourbon Neat, and yeah, um, yeah I know it's going to be trained. a great year. <laughs> it's going to be a great year, and thanks for what you guys are doing. A huge contribution to the hockey culture these last few years. We oh, beat thanks. it to Thank we you. beat it to death uh, the 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 Eichel situation, but yeah. I, I just oh, want yeah. to get your your opinion Great on call. it. I mean, it's you know, with especially in an Olympic year and it being so important for Eichel. Like, are you guys going to talk about that uh, quite yep. in depth? It, it, it's in our first show. In fact, I saw the rundown for our next for our show, October seventh, our first the point, and uh, it's right in the A block. In fact, I'm talking with Messier first. I talked with Torts about it, how he would handle it in the room, and then Mess comes on. I'm going to hit him with these. I'm going to hit him with the issue as well, and it's weird. It's the league's got to try to step in. I'm sure that's why I hired Pat Brisson, thinking maybe he could facilitate a two, three, four, nine team trade, whatever it took to get this done. Um, but it's a bad look for him, bad for the Sabres, bad for the league. I get the Sabres need their assets. They just can't. This guy's a absolute top elite, more than a point per game guy, um, and you can't just give him away. Uh, but he has to have surgery, and so it's complicated. But eventually the league and Brisson and the Sabres have to get together and they got to figure this out because it's it's not a good look. Oh, did you get any sleep this? Uh, maybe for a call the trophy future? Caprizov oh, was pretty much the chalk last year, but... No, it's Cole, Cole Caulfield's going to pump in. And this guy's elite 500 goal scorer in his NHL career. Just stupid release everywhere. Wow. And he could get... He, yeah, he's going to get 500 when it's all said. Matthew's going to get 700. So uh, at least, so uh, so yeah, he, he'll get thirty. I think he'll get thirty to forty-two goals this year, right around there. Uh, I probably, I probably, I know what the over/under would be. I would probably put the over. What would you say, thirty-five over/under for him? That's a good number. I'd probably take the over, but I could see someone taking the under because that's still a great year, thirty-two, thirty-three. But if he plays right. with Suzuki, who's dirty, I like him to pump him in. Uh, since you don't mind uh, making predictions, uh, would you say <laughs> would you say Patrick Kane is the best or going to be the best American born player ever by the time he retires? And yep. do you think that by the time Austin's done that he could surpass that? That's a great question. Last year I did a column, I kind of a guest appearance, top 20 all time USA born players. So Google Bucci Gras, top USA 20 hockey players. So it'll come up and I do have Kane number one and I got Matthews. I projected forward. So like this was like 20 years down the road. What will be my list? Because I wanted to have Eichel and Matthews on it. And uh, and I project Matthews to be number two. That's where I said he's going to score 700. And uh, I got like Eichel, like five, like four or five. I'm still very bullish on Jack Eichel when it's all said and done. Wow. Booch, I know they got uh, new owners a couple of years ago, Arizona Piss. Sorry, I'm not trying to pick on your team, but I think I'm it's gonna, worth I'm going to go take a piss during yeah. this segment, okay, guys? <laughs> Just give yeah. me a few. You know, they basically get stripped for parts for the most time, most part. The positivity of the you know new owners has kind of dissipated, I'd say. They're playing in a lame duck arena. The future doesn't look great there. It's a challenging time to be fans. I mean, is Arizona destined to go to Houston in three to five years? I hope not. That's such a great market. I think if the rink is in the right place, now you got Arizona State. You got obviously, you know, what all four sports teams there. Um, it's a cool place to be. It's got a vibe to it. It's got a it's got a beat to it. You know, Scottsdale and Phoenix. I, I don't see why you would leave there. It's only growing. They're only building more houses. I think you got to find a way to make that work. Yeah, and and that's an arena in you know the Phoenix Scottsdale area. It's just it's not going to work exactly. in Glendale. You know, no, at this point. no. So they're doing them a favor, I think, giving them uh, evicting them, and uh, hopefully it works out in their favor. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's a place that you want to work. Um, that's, you got to hand to Gary Bettman; he does not abandon places. Like he is patient. We're not going to do that. We're going to make this work. They laughed at him in Raleigh, and but now you kind of see that map kind of making sense now. Wherever I say a hockey team is the best way to create hockey fans, I'd have fifty teams. I mean, wherever you go somewhere, youth youth participation explodes. 
adult participation explodes, you create hockey fans. It's the best way to do it is a hockey team. You see it in Vegas, see it in Seattle. Vegas will always be Vegas' team, the Golden Knights, more than the Raiders because they got them right from the start. Uh, they were organic. They were hatched there. And that team's going to have a relationship with that with that hockey team um, more so than the Raiders. And uh, so, yeah, I think they got to make it work in Arizona somehow. The Toronto Maple Leafs, how does this season end and where does it end? I'm always oh, bullish on them. I am bullish on them. I don't like their goalies. I think they might have to fix that. I don't see them winning with their goalies. But uh, I still believe in those guys. I believe in Marner, the way he can drive offense. And Matthews, like says, the best goal scorer. It's, you know, Tavares, I just, I just don't think that was the right move at the time. But I'm still bullish on them. I just think there could be a time where they get it all together. But it's just not as apparent as some of those other teams. And and I, I just don't know. And I just hope we get Austin Matthews in America. Do you, do you think Dubas's job would be on the line if they, uh, if they face another first-round exit? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it has to, this is his plan and, you oh, know, yeah. but you know, it's, you know, it just can't, this is, you just can't keep doing the same thing. And if there's no hope and it's like, now what do we do? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think it would have to be, it'd be only fair. Yeah. Well, there's so many storylines that that's what's exciting about this year, because you usually have all the teams and the players and possible award winners. And we also have like the entire new broadcast with ESPN and TNT. So right. being a part of that is a, is a joy for us. And we've known each other a long time. I'm very happy for you to be doing play by play in the NHL. I feel like that was one of your dreams. So it good was. for you. And yeah. thanks for coming on. No, thanks so much guys. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to start the season. I guess, can't wait to see you in Vegas. I guess last uh-huh. thing, is there a potential uh, uh, maybe sandbagger in the future? I don't know. Are you are you guys uh, allowed to do those, ESPN and mix in with Barstool? I don't know. It's a touchy yeah. subject. I, I think me and Ferraro versus you type two would be a good match. That would be a real good one. Okay, we'll do it, home, we'll do it in Steubenville, Ontario. We'll do it at your home <laughs> course. Steubenville <laughs> Country Club. I'm an out-of-town <laughs> member. 200 bucks a year. Yeah, uh, you're a, bit, a little, bit, little bit conflicted here in an Olympic year. With Canada and U.S. <laughs> going at it, eh? But, hey, That's but right. Thank, thank you so much for coming on. And next time, maybe we'll touch a little bit more on college hockey and talk about how uh, Michigan's got a higher cap than the, the Tampa Bay Lightning. <laughs> That's right. They're over the cap. Good call. Thank you, boys. Well, All right, Bucci. Pleasure. Thank you. Fellow son of Please. Boston. Take care, Bucci. Huge thanks to Bucci coming on with us, man. Such a great guy. He's been doing it so long at ESPN. It's great to have ESPN with hockey back and Bucci in control. So, Big thanks to him, and we also want to let you know that that interview was also brought to you by Simply Safe. There's big news for our favorite home security company. Simply Safe just launched their wireless outdoor security camera. That's right, Simply Safe, the system that U.S. News and World Report names the best home security system of 2021, just got even better. This brand new outdoor security camera is engineered with all the advanced tech and security features you want and need to help keep you and your family safe. It has an ultra-wide 140-degree field of view so you can keep watch over your entire yard. It has 1080p HD resolution with an 8x zoom. That means you can zoom in and clearly see things like faces and license plates to capture critical evidence. It has a built-in spotlight with color night vision so you can keep an eye on what's going on day and night. And it's super simple to set up, usually takes just minutes. And it has an easy-to-remove rechargeable battery so it doesn't need an outlet and can go anywhere on your property. This camera has it all, and it integrates with your Simply Safe home security system, extending its protection to the outside. Together, it means every door, window, and room are protected, and now your property will be too. To learn more about the exciting new Simply Safe wireless outdoor security camera, visit simplysafe.com/chicklets. What's more, Simply Safe is celebrating this new camera by offering 20% off your entire new system and your first month of monitoring service free when you enroll in interactive monitoring. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash chicklets. All right, boys, moving over to the Metropolitan Division. Uh, lots of talk, which is the worst division in hockey. Some people think this one is it. Some people think it's the Pacific. Uh, either way, we're going to tackle the Metro right now. Uh, let's see, alphabetical order as usual, Carolina. Um, this is a contender that had a complete rehaul of their goaltenders. I think that's pretty unusual to see in the NHL just to have two whole new goalies when you have a pretty successful run in the playoffs. Last year they did lose in the quarterfinals to eventual champion, uh, eventual champion Tampa four games to one. Uh, they were third overall in the regular season. They say bye to Dougie Hamilton, huge loss. Alex Nedeljkovic, Peter Mrazek, James Reimer, and Warren Fogley. I'm sorry, Fogel. 
They're bringing in Ethan Bear, Ian Cole, Tony D'Angelo, Brendan Smith, Freddie Anderson, Anthony Ranta, Jesperi Kotkaniemi, Derek Stepan, and Josh Lievo. Carolina's cup odds at 19-1. to 1. Um, This is a team, like, you know, this is their window right now, I would say. I know they had a nice run a couple of years ago when the Bruins knocked them out, but this is a team built to win now. Rod Brindabaugh is not going anywhere. Solid team. Whit, let's go to you first on the Canes. Very excited to see this team play. Um, I think that they're fast, they're hungry, and their coach gets every single ounce of, like, skill and hard work out of the team. So when you look at, like, the lineup, it's changed a lot, which is, which is kind of surprising in terms of you're talking about the goaltending. That is by far and away their biggest question mark and worry as a team and a fan base because – Ranta can't even stay healthy. Like, this guy, I mean, he's hurt every single season. So if Frederick Anderson somehow has injuries, like, then you're, then you're wondering what's going to go on. The, question, the, the, the big thing is, if, the, if both those guys are healthy and play well, then it's, then it's like, holy shit, we got a great setup in net. Uh, a, a solid two-way tandem. I don't know if that'll, that'll be able to happen, but they're forwards with Aho, Svechnikov, Tara Vine, and that's a that's a ridiculous line. I like Nita Ryder. I think that he'd probably be better than last year, but Trocek is good could easily get you 50, 60 points. Stahl's the third line center. He's the leader on the team. I I just think Stepan coming in is a is a veteran type guy for a young team. And then on the back end, like Jacob Slavin is one of the top defensemen in the league. Um, they really are deep at every single position. And I and I like Tony D'Angelo, say what you want. Like, this yeah. guy could be a major factor coming in because he has a lot to prove. Who knows how many really chances he has left in the NHL, but the last time he played, he had over 50 points with the Rangers. So if he's getting power play minutes and, and, and minutes Dougie Hamilton used to get, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if he got 45, 50 points again. And, and this is a playoff team for me, no doubt, and a team that if everything fell right and everything fell correctly and the goaltending was there, they could compete for the Cup. I mean, yeah, you summed it up perfectly. And, and like, it's such a cheap replacement. And, you, and if you can get that type of Dougie Hamilton production, it's going to shift some things around, though. Like, all of a sudden, your power play looks different. You know, your your, you know, your back end just looks a little bit different. And the fact that they got Ethan Bear. Um, who's the kid they ended up losing to Columbus? Jake Bean, who was a, a guy that they were going to look to to come up and, and, and make an impact. So things look a little bit different, but they're so well slotted up front in their depth that, you know, I think it takes a lot of pressure off their back end and, of course, their goaltending. So this is a very, very solid team, and I believe that they're a playoff team. Grinelli, playoffs? No doubt a playoff team, and I wouldn't be shocked if they make a run. Yeah, well, it's, it's another thing, too. I mean, the goalies they're bringing in, Antti Ranta is going to presumably back up, back up Freddie Anderson. And, I mean, Freddie was a damn good goalie in Anaheim. I think Toronto, he was good at times, excellent at times, and I don't know if it was the pressure of his injuries or what. I think maybe a new setting, especially somewhere like Carolina, where he's not going to have 7,000 fucking cameras in his face after practice every day when he's not playing. Maybe it might have a nice effect on his game. But either way, I hope he bounces back. He's a, he's a good guy, a good goalie, and I'd like to see him have some success down there. It, it, it's a great place. You can just go get lost and focus on hockey, and you don't have to deal with all the hoopla. Yep, exactly. Um, so we're all in consensus that they're going to make the playoffs. Uh, next up. Columbus Blue Jackets, last season ended. Uh, they did Whoa. not qualify. They finished last in the Central. Um, they lost Seth Jones and Cam Atkinson over the summer. They're uh, bringing in a new head coach, Brad Lawson, in addition to defenseman Adam Boquist, forward Sean Corrali. They bring in Jacob Voracek back in a trade. Uh, and Jake Bean, like you just mentioned, Biz, their cup odds 150 to 1. Uh, you know, this is a team, like, I, I know they're not great on paper, but they seem to go fucking all out. I know they signed Elvis Merzlikens, who's a great young goalie. I think they might contend for a playoff spot in this in this division. I think they might play above their weight class. I think they might come up a little bit short, though. What do you got for us, Biz? I just think that uh, the inexperience on the back end is just it, – it's too big of a hill to climb. They have 5D in their lineup who haven't played over 150 games in the NHL, three, three of which who haven't even reached 50 who are slotted in right now. So there's going to be – a ton of weight on Wierenski's shoulders, and especially at the fact that they're going to be missing him the first 20 games of the season, because I don't know if you heard, what 20-game suspension for that ball drop on 19 in the sandbagger. Player safety hit him with. So they're going to be, with, <laughs> they're going to be without him. To st- no, I'm fucking around, folks. But on a serious note, though, you got two young goalies in, in net, and they're going to be sharing time. And I know that they're 
strong in that position, that's just going to be a lot of pressure on them and Wierenski at the fact that they just have no experience back there. You said that they, that's the type of team where they kind of take on the fan base's mentality and their work ethic. Um, maybe not Line. Uh, maybe so, though. Maybe he has a, a, a bounce back year because I don't think he settled in great when he first got there. I don't know if that had anything to do with torts. So maybe the coaching change will, will lighten things up around there. He will be playing with a guy who's got some experience in Voracek, but uh, they just, they're just they just like really not that deep in their bottom six. Uh, as I said, the inexperience on D is really, really going to catch up to him here. That's just like weird. I mean, have you ever seen a team that doesn't have – like has so few games on the back end? Not a playoff team, so I, I, don't, I don't think they get into the playoffs. And then the other thing is like Jack Rosovich, he had a nice run when he came over and there was – uh, I think him and Tortorella ended up having a couple issues, but he's kind of their number one center right now. It's like that, you know, he's not a number one center. When you don't have a guy that can really run the power play and, and be a first line top centerman, it's just really hard to compete at the, at the, at the playoff type type level that they're they're hoping to get to. So I also don't know about line A. Like he could get 40 and you wouldn't be surprised, or he could get eight and be healthy scratch. It's like the guy's such a wild card. He seems to think that he kind of knows it all, I think. Like, I sense from his, like, press conferences and stuff, he's just like, blah, whatever. I don't know. I, 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 if this year he lights it up, like I said, I wouldn't be shocked, but I'm not, I'm not really sold on him in that trade. Now, Dubois, I don't know what he's going to do in Winnipeg, but still kind of a tough deal the way, the way Line A looked last year. And in the end, it's a, it's a team, once you lose Seth Jones, it's like Wierenski's kind of all alone there and – yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see them getting in the playoffs. Uh, a little bit like Ottawa in terms of they'll play hard, um, and, and and they won't be like a pushover by any means. But I don't, I don't see them getting in the tourney. You're almost better off getting rid of Line A at this point, and just getting worse before you get better. We've heard that before. The Yotes. I mean, is is Rosovic slotted in as their first line center at this point? In some like, things, do- and then that other one, like the uh, is it Texier? Texier? How do you say his name? I always Texier. Yeah, he's good, and like so, he could end up being the number one center. He's a little more skilled, I think, but they don't they don't have much up. But the he's, middle. I mean, he, he's just he's just not a number one center. Like, he's yeah. just like that's just like, especially I know I know it's the weakest division, but I, he's just not a number one center to me. All right, none of us have him going the playoffs. I'm assuming no. no. Okay, uh, let's see. Moving right along, the New Jersey Devils. Last season ended. They did not qualify. They finished seventh in the East. Uh, they brought in a big name, though. Dougie Hamilton signed to a big ticket. Uh, Ryan Graves, they also got in a deal. Goalie Jonathan Bernier and Thomas Tuna Tata. Uh, cup odds are 60 to 1. Obviously, they're waiting for a lot of these young guys to uh, step up. Hughes, Heesha, uh, who's been playing well, but, you know, I know he gets picked on. But, uh, I think one of the concerns with, with them, if I was a fan, and I'm not, I, I know I said I hate bringing this up, but the whole Blackwood vaccine situation, and I'm not criticizing them one way or the other. I don't know his medical situation, but. When you're starting goal, you're hopeful starting goal. He might and not. And he's unbelievable. And he, he was great early last year. I know the team kind of fell apart late. But, you know, I, I think that's, a, I don't want to say cause for concern, but it's a, it's a question mark going forward with this team. You know, and again, I'm not judging him one way or the other. I don't know his medical history or anything. But, you know, if your goalie isn't vaccinated and can't travel to certain games and can't go out of the country and it could be ramifications for your team, God forbid he catches something. I don't know, man. I hope that doesn't become a factor, but I think it's part of the story in New Jersey. I'm sorry to bring it up, but anyways, what, what do you got on Jersey? Well, I think they're much improved. Um, I, total, totally confused as to what we'll see because I, I really wouldn't be shocked if they had a really nice season, but I also don't know because there's just some young guys you'll see, like, do, do they take the next step? So that uh, – is it Sharon Govich? Is that how you say his name? Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, th- that guy was nice. Like, in terms of, like, rookie production last year, he was right up there, and he was a good player. And I think Jack Hughes will take a next step. And then, obviously, bringing in Dougie Hamilton just kind of changes being able to get out of your own zone and having a big shot on the power play. I know PK is there, but he can't move remotely close to as well as Dougie skates or anything like that. I think Graves is a great option in terms of a shutdown guy and, and, a, and a, like, penalty kill in your face type defender um it's a good point about blackwood because he is awesome so if all of a sudden you have this team and you get some production out of like 
Tatar, right? He comes over and say that he produces points, which it seems like he always does wherever he is. I think the defensive zone can be an issue, but he can produce. So if they have all these guys, guys like him and Miles Wood, who's tough to play against, and these different players who step up, and then Blackwood's like missing road trips and stuff, it's it's going to be an issue because when he's playing, he's so good that the team could be could be solid and competing for the playoffs. So I, I think they're a huge wild card in terms of this year. Uh, but definitely from a fan standpoint, you're way looking more forward to the season right now than you have in the past few because they made some changes to at least get some excitement in that building. Yeah, I, I agree. I do not know what to expect because any guy that you look in their lineup who like who might have had a good year last year, it's like, well, they just don't – they don't have the longevity to prove it. I mean, a guy like Ty Smith, all of a sudden he gets bumped back to the third D, man, which is a positive, right? He doesn't have that much pressure on him with Graves and uh, Dougie Hamilton coming in. He had a great start to last year, but he's got a half a season under his belt. Same with the forward that you mentioned on, on, on the right side. And then Tatar is a question mark. So, you know, can Jack Hughes end up elevating to actually be a number one center and, and compete with guys in that division going to head-to-head every night? Nico Heischer, a guy that I don't want to say we've been critical of, but just kind of questioning, like, hey, is this guy the real deal? What's that? I said what has. What gets shit well, from the devil's hands? That's, that's, that's not necessarily, he does, and it, that's not necessarily it, it, fair. I've, I've said it in terms of first overall picks. like Right. I think he's and, and now he's slotted in that second spot. So now he's going to have better matchups. So now he's got to elevate his game. He's got to show a higher point production. And then they also have that Zaka. But all in all, man, they got – you know, half their team with a lot of inexperience. So, you know, they, they all seem to really enjoy each other and get along and they got some veteran leadership, but I just, I mean, I don't know, man, this like with all this, uh, these question marks going into, you know, is, is Ty Smith going to have a good sophomore year? Can he sure take the next step? And what can we get from all these other young guys? I just, I just don't know. I know, I, I know that I'm not betting on them to make playoffs. That's for sure. I don't think any of us are right. G no, Devils? No, no playoffs, but I think Jack Hughes has a monster year. No. What do you mean? We'll what do you mean? What, what, in, in terms of points? you have to say that, or the whole fan yeah. base will get yeah, on you. If... I just think I think in in terms of production, I don't think he had a great year last year, and I think he has a big bounce back year this year. So when you say monster year, are you saying like sixty five points or ninety points? No, I think sixty five points. Okay. I I see that. You know what? We'll even say seventy points. I'll okay. say seventy points. All right. All right, moving right along. The New York Islanders, last season ended. Of course, they lost in the semifinals to Tampa, four games to three. A very tough loss. They could have very easily gone on to the cup. Uh, they're waving goodbye to Jordan Eberle and Nick Letty, uh, saying hello to a new bond. The UBS Arena is finally going to open. Also bringing in Zach Parise, Richard Panic, and old friend Zdeno Chara. Uh, cup odds are 17-1. to 1. They're also going to have a healthy end as lead back. I mean, this team's a top contender. Like I just said, they could have just as easily got to the cup last year. That game went down to the last minute. A tough goal they lost on. They probably would have went on to win it if they played Montreal. The Islanders are right there. Uh, obviously getting the playoffs. I think they're, they're a legit cup contender. Paul Bissonette, what do you have to say? I mean, you pretty much said it all. You talked about the guys that they added. I think they get better. Throw Anders Lee in the mix, given that he was injured all of playoffs with that torn ACL. To me, they win the division. And... They, I, 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 I consider them a cup contender this year, and I, and I hate to say it, I'm not on the wagon as, uh, as Wit, Wit might be moving forward here. Are you part of the fan base now, Wit? Are you going to succumb to all the peer pressure, or are you still no. giving it the fuck you Islanders double barrel shotgun here? No, I'm not. I'm not a fan. I'm not joining that fan base. I just, I just rustled around with the idea. There's no chance. But I will say this: the idea. As far as I, as hard as I root against that team, and I hope they lose, and I hope they stink, they're nasty. And they're heads and shoulders above every other team in that division, I think. And I think they win the division, and I do think they can compete for a Stanley Cup. I'll just be along the way rooting against them and Frankie Borelli, that piece of shit. But I promise you that this team is loaded, and I can admit it as a hater. And to get Lee back... And to have that goaltending tandem and to add Chara, who can do a job of 15 minutes and some PK and some leadership, they just really do have it all to, to compete for a Stanley Cup. So nothing would surprise me this year out of them. I hope nothing hap- good happens to them. And I will say this, if they go on that 13-game road trip to start the year and they somehow come back, like, I don't know, like... Nine and four. Yeah, dude. Then you're then you're like, holy shit. I mean, even How even about if, that math? even if you can go eight and five, just 
even 500, right? Like to start the year, that's tough before the building's ready to then come home. They could then just go on a crazy run. Uh, but that is a tough way to start the season. So as long as they don't come back, you know, three and 10 or whatever it is. And even if that's the case, it's enough time to make it all back. But it's a little different uh, beginning of the season, but still it's a great team. Very deep. They're the best coach team in the division. They got an unbelievable fourth line. Their D is incredible. They got a great goalie tandem. And and I, I guess their one issue with how structured they p- play sometimes is filling the back of the net. I just don't see them having an issue with that. I think that Barzell gaining more and more experience and him really coming out of his shell in playoffs last year, this is the team to beat. And I fucking hate to say it. We all agree they're going to be in the playoffs. So second team, yeah, we all winning the division consensus on. All right, a few miles to the west, the New York Rangers. Last season ended. They did not qualify. They were fifth in the East. They made a valiant effort, but couldn't get there. Uh, they're bringing in a new head coach and Gerard Gallant, also forward Barkley Goodrow, forward Sammy Blay, and forward Ryan Reeves to get some toughness in there. Uh, they traded Pavel Buchnevich to St. Louis. Their cup odds are twenty-two to one. Um, you know, the Rangers were very close to a playoff spot last year. I think with Shesterkin, this guy's fucking dynamite. If he can play up to his potential and stay injury-free, 100%, I get the Rangers in the playoffs this year. They're, they're much like uh, Columbus to me with having two young, good studs in net. Uh, is it Gorgiev, the other guy, the backup? Yep. They're, they're top four are incredible with Adam Fox leading the way. And guys like... They have enough stars up front to get it done, and then you just talked about the depth that they added. If Lafreniere and Capo Caco end up coming out of their shell and, and becoming what we think that they're going to be, this team is is going to be fucking dangerous. And I know I said that uh, – who did I have as most improved? Um, I, I kept harping team on it. Team or with, player? Uh, with Chicago. I, I had Chicago as most improved team over the offseason with the additions with – with the potential for some of their guys in their own lineup and organization already to to elevate their play, they're another team I could see as being the most improved. Hundred percent, I think they make playoffs. If not, I think the fucking owner is going to blow the whole team up. <laughs> so they have to make playoffs. I, I wouldn't be shocked if 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 they didn't make playoffs. Gallant was gone after one year. This no. guy's a no. <laughs> that Nolan's fucking nuts, buddy. He fired the GM <laughs> after all the unbelievable moves he made. Who was it? Gorton? Jeff Gorton? Yep. Yeah, their old GM. I, I this guy, think, this guy doesn't give a fuck, dude. He's a billy goat. It's, he'll it's, wear he'll wear he'll wear sneakers with suits. He doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Patrick Nemeth, another defenseman. I forgot to mention they brought in uh, over the season. They signed. He'll be like that Davis guy from Oakland, just going to PF Chang's every day. The billionaire <laughs> cut, uh, unreal ball cut. Um, so they brought in toughness, right? The the, the addition of Reeves now. I think there was a lot of people who didn't like the Buchnevich trade uh, because of how good he was. And, and, and remember when I thought he was um, Anisimov shooting the gun, even though that was like 15 he years He was. He turned earlier. into him. Yeah, exactly. But I, I still think that this team is right on the cusp of playoffs. So I have a tough time, right? I have Columbus and the Islanders, no doubt. I mean, sorry. Carolina and the Islanders, no doubt, getting in from this division. The next two spots, I think it's between the Rangers, Philly, and... Um, I'm sorry, there's four, right? There's two spots for the Rangers, Philly, Pittsburgh, and Washington. And I, I'm having a hard time deciding who I think is going to be the other two. But the Rangers, in terms of the young production, that, that's so important. Like, Zibanejad and Panarin are going to produce. You know that. Yep. So, Strom's been great there since he's been. But yep. then you look at, like, this Kraftsov. He's going to get a chance, the Russian. And you also wonder. So, if I'm looking at, like, Goudreau and the way he played for Tampa – you got to understand, like, you're not really getting much offense there, but can he bring the same type of third-line energy, right? Like, I've seen, I've seen lineups. He's, like, playing with that, that Heedle, Philippe Heedle. It's like, I don't know where he fits in on that on, in the lineup, but it certainly shouldn't be, like, in an offensive role. Um, so, uh, Biz, you said it, Capo Caco and Lafreniere, if they can step up. And, and I think Lafreniere has shown a lot more than Caco. Like, I think he could kind of explode this year. Caco's the question mark. But I also like the two goalies, too. So they got the Russian, Shosturkin, and, and Georgiev, and, and we'll see what goes on. But I can't give you a yes or no in the playoffs yet. I don't know. Fuck. 
There's the, four th- teams that's for why two I, spots. That's why I mentioned those young guys kind of – you know, you got Truba probably making a little bit too much, and you got some of these guys on these bigger deals, but they're fortunate enough where they do have these younger guys. Like Adam Fox, I think, is going to make nine fifty this year. So he kind of offsets Truba as far as what he's making, and you look at a guy like Goudreau who everyone's like, oh, gross overpayment, but that's where they needed to get better. That's where they needed to take some pressure off those, you know, the top lines. So, uh, you know, especially with Kreider as well. I mean, he's a proven guy who's going to get you 40, 50 points. And, yeah, I just – I got him no playoffs. Oh. I got all you biz. I got him no. 100% I got him in the playoffs. G? Or everybody's going to fucking get canned. Biz, uh, Keandre Miller's another guy, too, that's not making a ton of money, young guy, and I think he's going to do awesome this season. They got, season. like, four or five guys on, like, entry-level type deals who can make really big, big impacts. That's going to be the biggest question mark for me, and I think I, that they're going to be able to do it because they do have that high-end talent that can take the pressure off them. And you, you saw Lafreniere, you know, excel a lot in the second half of that season last year. And, I, I mean – a couple cockle from the at least the game sheets that I've seen so far in preseason. Do I put a ton of stake in it? No, but at some point this guy's got to come out of his, out of his shell. Uh, I do have them making the playoffs, RA, and I think Capo Caco puts up thirty this year. All right, so Woo! me busy, me busy. thirty goals. I do, I do. Oh, wow. Uh, so us three do think they're in. Whitney doesn't. All right, moving right along. Philadelphia Flyers. Lots of changes on this team. Will it all mesh? Who knows? Last season ended rough year for the Flyers. Didn't qualify for the playoffs. Sixth in the East. Uh, they traded Jake Voracek, Shane Gostisbehere, Phil Myers, and Nolan Patrick. They brought in Ryan Ellis, Rasmus Ristolainen, Keith Yandel, Song, Martin Jones, Nate Thompson, and Cam Atkinson. Cup odds of 30 to 1. Like we said earlier, our buddy Hazy's going to miss the start of the season. Um, this team, man, it really went off the rails last year. I know Carter Hart had a tough year, and I don't know. They just couldn't fucking seem to put anything together. But these are wholesale changes. I think it's almost like a reboot in some senses. I get, I see them getting the playoffs. I see Hart bouncing back. I know Martin Jones had a rough ending in San Jose. He's probably going to be the backup. But Hart's too young, too good, too much potential. Uh, I think they get in this year for the playoffs. I agree. With I'll you. hand it over to you, Whip. <laughs> I agree with you. Um I do have them in the playoffs, but I don't know if you guys are listening at home, guys and girls, if you if you can tell that there's a common denominator in terms of us discussing playoff teams and it's goaltending. So I, I understand what you're saying, Ari, in terms of how young and talented he is, but Puck, I don't know. Like, if, if he struggles again, it's just like all bets are off with this team. So I, I like that they, they really did improve the D. I think Ellis makes such a big – such oh, a yeah. big contribution because of how good he is at both ends. And people think he's just offensive. Like, this guy can play in his own zone, and he's just a true leader. Uh, Ristolainen's physical. I don't know if they expect him to be top four. That might be a lot. I know that times he looks great at times. It maybe it would be key if he was, uh, you know, the fifth defender. Uh, but Keith coming in, Yan's coming in for the for the power play only helps. I I I like this team because I think of what happened last year. There's a lot of pride in that room, and I also think that Atkinson coming in in replace of well, not in replace, but in the in the trade uh, to Columbus for Voracek. I just think that that he's gonna he's gonna be like hungry to show up and have a big time season. So Broussard's there and. In the end, it's a team that I think there are question marks. But when I look at their like like Farabee and, and some of the young guys, I do see him in the playoffs. So Provorov's also a guy you got to mention in terms of one of the top young defensemen in the league. Works his ass off. Is hu- humongously dedicated to the game, and I only think you're going to see him get better and better. But they're a playoff team in my mind, and it truly depends on Carter Hart. Yeah, and they got guns up front. Uh, much like how you said Islanders need to start out well on the road and get a good start to the season, and if they can, they can win the division. I think with a hazy out of the lineup, if they can get off to a good start and then just having that energy coming back in and what he provides, I think it's just going to accelerate them. So, you know, you're focusing a lot on Carter Hart, and I agree with you, but I do believe that they're able to put up that offense when they do have everyone healthy to, to help out if it's not exactly up to standard. So I think this is a, a, a very good team from top to bottom. They address the issues that they had to. And like you said, R.A., there's no way it's going to be as bad in goaltending or in, goal, in the goalie position as it was last year. It's got to turn, and this is a playoff team in my opinion. All right, Biz. What about, what about you, Grinelli? 
Philly in the playoffs. Uh, yeah, if they stay healthy, I think they can make the playoffs. And the fact that Yans is on the team, if you thought we weren't going to pick these guys to make playoffs, you're an absolute fucking buffoon. <laughs> and <laughs> we got to mention it. Is Yans, is Yans keeping this gold tooth mouth guard? Have you guys I seen hope this? So. It's incredible. Oh, my goodness. What's he doing? <laughs> he's being know. fucking Geeth Yandel. That's what he's doing. All right. Pittsburgh Penguins. Well, we talk about the Bruins and windows closing. I think the same thing in Pittsburgh. I mean, they still got Sid and Gino, but they're not going to be starting the year. It's going to be a tough start without them. Also, Jake Gensel is going to miss at least the opener due to COVID. Last season, they lost in the first round to the Islanders four games to two. They did win the division in the regular season. They brought in uh, forward Brock McGinn and defenseman Cody Ceci. Uh, They lost Brandon Tanner in the expansion draft. Their cup odds are 23 to one. Um, I don't know, man. This team had problems with their goaltending last year, and I think having no Sid and no Gino to start, I see them going behind the eight ball to start the season and not catching up in this division. And yeah, I'm sorry, Pittsburgh. I don't see you in the playoffs this year. I mean, Jeff Carter said it. They're going to have to get it done by committee and and uh, and, and tread water while those guys are out. But guys, I, th- this pains me to say, what I don't think that Pittsburgh's going to make the playoffs. And at some point, they got to start looking to to start replenishing that prospect pool and they need to gain assets in order to look to the future darren drager said it colorado (laughs) sid could be going to colorado and you guys think i'm fucking around but at some point they gotta look to make a move and if if they're not, why are you why are you holding your hands like that? All right. No, I, I was actually somewhat agreeing with you, Biz. I mean, what, what was the football game the whole world watched Sunday night? Tom Brady playing for Tampa Bay against New England. I mean, these things happen all the time. So I would right. I'm, I'm wouldn't surprise me at all to see. Crosby That's why when else. he originally said it, I'm like, it makes way too much sense, and I just don't see Pittsburgh becoming competitive for the duration of 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 Sid and Gino being there. And 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 I I guess like. I guess I contradict myself because I went on the Mark Madden show and the more I thought about it afterward, I'm like, eh. the year they ended up winning, I think it was the cup against Nashville. They lost Latang. Their best defenseman was Dumoulin. And thankfully, they ended up getting incredible goaltending from Matt Murray. And they had the best one-two punch at center and they controlled the middle of the ice and they were able to win that cup. Now, without these guys starting the season and without them having any type of depth and no prospects coming up and no, you know, that none of that young blood. I don't know, man. I just, I just don't see it anymore. And I, and I can't keep lying to myself. And I think that at some point they're going to have to, to move on. And I don't know. I hate, I hate to be a doubter too. Cause like, it's hard, it's hard to discount those two guys, but the fact that they're injured going into the season. And I know that they said the, the, the most amount of time that Sid's going to be out is I believe six weeks, Gino a little bit longer, that's a long time for a very average team from top to bottom to be without their two best players and without unpro- with, with unproven goaltending. And he struggled last year in play- playoffs. And I said, I said it last podcast, I love a comeback story, but, but I don't know. I don't know about this Jari kid. Yeah, I, it, it is weird. I, I, for a few years now, though, people have been saying, like, is this the end of their run? And then they've, like, actually had pretty good regular seasons. They won the division last year, but then the first round becomes an enormous issue. And, like, the depth, and I actually don't have them making the playoffs just because of these guys being out at the beginning of the season. It's so hard to make up losses. And now, granted, they might not be losses. This this team might kind of catch fire early without Sid and Gino, but I, I'd be very surprised to see that. And in the end, it's like, you don't have you don't have prospects there. You don't have young guys coming up. What ends up being in the case with this team? So when you talk about the future and these big names possibly being somewhere else at some point, as crazy as it sounds, yes, it easily could happen. And so when I look at the, the, the entire division, I said Carolina, the Islanders, and then I'm going Philly and Washington as my other two picks. So that would give Rangers and, and Pittsburgh, you know, they'd be on the outside looking in. So... At the same time, like if Sid comes back and has an MVP type season, they'll get into the playoffs. So it's not that crazy to think, but it's just looking at the roster and actually thinking about like who's going to take this next step while these guys are out. Like Carter's a great player. Luckily they have him, and Jason Zucker's good, but it's it's going to be a tough go at the beginning for this team. And 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 Jari's going to be under fire, and we'll see if he can answer. All right, Mikey, do they make the playoffs or no? Uh, I do not think they make the playoffs. But, Biz, to your point about 
uh, trading Sidney Crosby. The Olympics is also this year, so there could be a little tampering going on in China. People trying to convince Ooh. Sid to come over. So you never know. Good G stir in the pot. Love it. Yeah, hey, after fucking Bobby or Joe Montana, Tom Brady, any guy can end up in any uniform. Nothing should surprise anybody anymore yep. at all. All right, we got. I heard. I heard Sid likes no dress code, so who knows? Maybe he ends up with the Coyotes. <laughs> I don't know if he like Houston. All right, one last team in the Metro Division, the old Washington Capitals. Uh, last season, they lost in the first round to the Bruins, four games to one. Um, they really didn't bring in any reinforcements this year. They did lose Zdeno Chara and Brendan Dillon. Uh, cup odds are 27 to one. Um, if they get healthy goaltending, they should be in contention, but I've already picked my four playoff teams from this division, so I don't have the Capitals making it this year. Um, we're just going to watch Ovechkin score a bunch of goals, I would assume, but Biz, we'll go to you first on D.C., um, yeah, I just, like you said, they didn't really address any issues and they got bounced pretty quick. I think that there's just like the high end talent in this division is just too much. And, uh, the goaltending to me is, is the biggest issue. It's unproven. Uh, the one kid ended up getting injured in that first round last year. Right. And that was kind of their demise. They couldn't really get settled in after that, but I don't know, guys, they got that high end talent, but I just, I don't, I don't see them as a, as a playoff team. And I don't really have much else to say about this lineup. I think with Kuznetsov, Ovechkin, John Carlson, Oshie, Tom Wilson, the way he plays in the top line, I I think they're in the playoffs. Mantha looked awesome when he came over. Uh, I I do think they're going to get in. I know, uh, like, there's times when you, like, look at the D and you question things, but in the end, like, Orlov, Carlson, uh, Michael Kempney, and Justin Schultz, top four, those guys can move. I don't know much about, like, this guy Martin Ferrivi, Ferrari. How do you even say his name? Right now he's penciled in the top, top six with Nick Jensen on the bottom pair. I don't know much there. But I just think of the, the top end talent. Now, the biggest thing is Kuznetsov. This guy can be a dog. There's times he he led the playoffs in scoring when they won the cup, and then he just kind of just disappears for a while. So Laviolette's going to have to push the right buttons in terms of getting that guy fired up and ready to play, and hopefully Backstrom's healthy and they can get going. But I, I do have them in the playoffs. I think they've won the division six years in a row or something, have they not? I, no. I bought... I, I bonked on uh, on Washington in the sense of, like, I, I completely forgot who they even had on their team. So I just figured I'd say no playoffs for them because, you know, I'm a big yeah, well, Penguins fan. And this, no disrespect to who I'm going to mention, but, I mean, this is a team that had to start Craig Anderson in a playoff game last year. I know guys got hurt, but they didn't have any organizational depth to bring in. Um, I know they suffered some goalie injuries last year, but I don't know. As far, looking at them after last year, I, I don't – goaltending, I wouldn't call it their strength, so – Wit, you have, are the only one that has them going into the playoffs from that division. So, this so is Chris, a complete... who are your four teams? I got the Rangers. I got the Islanders. I have uh, Flyers. The, 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 you had Flyers, too. And I don't think you had the fourth team. And Carolina. Yes, I did. Yeah, No, he did. Biz has Carolina, the Islanders, the Rangers, um, and uh, Philly. The only other team I would swap out for for Washington making it would probably be the uh, the Rangers, but I just I just think those young legs are going to come through, no and do, that's why no I didn't even always. bother. St- that's why I didn't even bother studying on Washington. I completely forgot Ovechkin was on their team. <laughs> All right, gang. Well, that wraps up our Eastern Conference preview. Hopefully, you enjoyed it. Uh, I do have a message from a sponsor here. You've heard us talk about Revitalite a lot by now. You know the drill. It's the adult version of a certain drink you find in the baby aisle. Well, the guys at Revitalite are taking things to the next level and have teamed up with us to create the ultimate way to save yourself a rough morning after. Introducing Revitalite Black Label, made specifically with stoolies in mind for maximum recovery and the perfect complement for when your life gets a little rough and rowdy. Don't pay for Saturday nights on Sunday morning. Revitalite Black Label pairs perfectly with nightcaps and midnight snacks. Your nightstand will feel naked without Revitalite, so stock up. Pro tip, drink half at night and the other half in the morning for optimal results. This stuff is great. Grab some, get that juice back in your saddle, and pick up your Revitalite Black Label today in store or online at the Barstool store and tweet us or tag us at Drink Revitalite in the morning after your story. So everybody check out Revitalite. All right, boys, uh, I know we've been here for a little while. We had a long interview, a lot of previews. There's not a ton, what I call the et cetera portion of the program. I know, Biz, uh, you sent a, a group assignment out last week. I know some of us were able to do it, not all of us. People have been busy, kids and whatnot. Squid Game on Netflix. Awesome. Holy fuck. 
Wow. You liked it? My God. Amazing. Absolutely I be, I binged it in 24 hours. Incredible. I If I could have stayed up, I fucking would have. It was absolutely brilliant. It was, uh, I mean, I know, and did, oh, that's what I wanna, we want to talk Here, about. Here's how I would summarize it. It was like Parasite, the movie Saw, and Hunger Games had a baby. Is that a fair, is that a fair assessment? Yeah, that's. And the only reason I said parasite is because they have the, the the caption on the bottom that you have to read. Now I I watched it. This is the biggest debate going. Wit, do you ever watch foreign films with a dubbed over voice? Oh, no. Or do so you read? I, I have. I I, I talked to somebody who's watched the show, and my wife said she turned it on after ten minutes. She's like, I don't know. So she's like, I want you to watch it and tell me if you think I'll like it. So I'm going to give it a go. But I did speak to somebody who said. It's not synced up, and that's kind of hard to get used to. With in terms of their their mouse, what are Ray? What the fuck are you shaking your head? No, he's not you, guy. Calm down. I'm shaking he, my head at dubbing. I hate dubbing. It's he, not you. He hates Calm down. Dubbing. Take a fucking he chill pill. That's how fired up he gets about I, dubbing. I, dubbing's awful. It's like watching a fucking 1950 Godzilla's movie. We should have talked roll. about this before breaking down the Capitals because we might have fucking woke up a little bit. This is how intense this conversation <laughs> is going to get. Me and so, wit, wit, I will say of. All the dub movies I've seen, this one wasn't as bad as as I thought. Like the other ones were, I guess. Ra's rolling his fucking eyes. No, dude, I can't. I I can't. I can't spend ten hours watch or or reading the bottom of the screen and not seeing their facial reactions and not paying attention to what's going on. People who can do that, I commend you. But I think it's absolutely ridiculous. Now, I think that we're going to get a 50-50 split on people who would rather watch. You think it's less than that? No, I think I think that more people prefer subtitles than dubbing. By far. <gasps> By we're going to do really? a poll, we're going to do a poll on chicklets. If you're watching the foreign movies, what's better, subtitles or dubbing. I think overwhelmingly I people are going to say subtitles. So now the movie Parasite, do they even offer it in the dubbed over voice? I, I if didn't they look, do, I don't know. I'll I go watch it. <laughs> I, tr- I tried to watch Parasite with, with the, the caption on the bottom. How do would you, you call it captioning on the bottom? Yeah, subtitles, closed caption. E- subtitles, subtitles, excuse yeah, me. Either way, but it didn't bother me at all when watching Squid Game. And I will say it sucked me right in. I binge watched it, as I said, in, tw- in 24 hours. I thought it was excellent. I think we're going to end up seeing a season two. Now, I think that they left it open-ended based on the reaction to it this will go down as the most watched show in netflix history that's how what? much action it's, yeah. what it's, already, if, oh, if it's yeah. not already it's gonna be yeah well, globally the biggest show ever that netflix has ever it was number one in 90 countries uh viewed on be- on netflix because so, they they heavily invested into the international audiences because they let into other countries just make their own stuff and then they could put them out to the rest of the world and it's it's just an incredible movie and i'm sorry show biz and to follow your point i i said it was like hunger games Running Man and then Parasite as well obviously the Korean thing but plus the whole you know st- status thing and people like yep. in different parts of society that uh, that element but uh, just a tremendous show it's nine episodes about an hour long each actually one's about a half hour uh, I highly recommend it. it gets my highest recommendation one of the best things I've watched in ages we're not, we're, we're not going to give any spoilers you said Running Man was that the one with Schwarzenegger yeah it was like a game show like basically great, like, phenomenal great movie phenomenal movie I watched you seen that day. one with I have never seen that, but I just saw your Dude, reaction when he mentioned it. You just both smiled talking about it. I'm going to have to check it out. It's a classic, classic Arnold Schwarzenegger movie from the 80s based on a Stephen King short story when he used to write under this fake name, Richard Bachman. It ended up getting get made into a movie. Just a great, fun movie. Um, a couple other things. That I don't think any of you guys watched it. Uh, the Many Saints of Newark yet, the Sopranos movie. We can table that till next week. I believe I'm the only one who's seen it, right? I haven't no seen thanks. it yet. Yeah, all right, so we'll, we'll wait. We'll wait till you guys watch it. I'd rather have uh, talk at Saw My Cock Off than watch fucking Sopranos uh, movie. I got one last thing, and I I, if, I tweeted it, and I could have the, our account tweeted out as well. 60 Minutes, I, I know I'm the old guy of the crew. I, I still watch 60 Minutes. Well, they did a segment on Tony Bennett last night. He's, you know, Tony Bennett, the, you know, basically ballad singer that your parents and grandparents listen to. He's 95 years old. He's got Alzheimer's. He's, you know, starting to lose his memory. Well, because of COVID, he couldn't tour anymore. So his son was like, well, no, we're not ending like this. So they did a 
final couple pair of concerts at Radio City Music Hall with him and Lady Gaga, who have a, by the way, we shall have friends like Lady Gaga. She's the best. Like, I, I don't even know to listen to music, but she's such a... My dad is obsessed with she's her. She's such a great friend to Tony Bennett. They just have such a great friendship. I watched it today, man. I'm not, I was a puddle watcher. Maybe, maybe I'm in an increased emotional state lately or something, but he, he's, you know, he's got all his enemies. He's 95. But once he got on that fucking stage, man, it just clicks. Like, he just went back to Tony Bennett 40 years ago and did the concert, man. I can't recommend it enough. Watch this segment in 60 minutes. It's heartwarming. It's sad. It's beautiful. It's poignant. It's, it was a very moving thing, and I, I just think everybody should watch it, and it might make I, your day a little better. I think Tony Bennett was the guy who told Gaga, like, hey, your voice is so beautiful. Like, you don't need to dress it up. Is. What? He discovered her? It is. You're right. You're yeah, right. he to- Wait, he was the correct. one who told her, like, stop dressing up like such a goon. Like, just like, you don't need to. And I think that, I, I think she's like really changed her whole look and vibe since like the, the discussion they had whenever that was. I mean, when she was showing up to the red carpet with like meat all yeah. over she had, like, bake, her. She had like a bacon her? dress. Yeah, I'll meet her. I don't know if you've ever seen her doc on Netflix, Piz. It's really good. I mean, I'm not, like I said, I don't listen to her music much i think she's a fascinating person but when you watch this segment if you do watch it it's it's just like i said a really beautiful poignant thing and the way she ties into the whole story man i was i tear not ashamed to say i had tears streaming down my face at the end of it it was just a, a very I'm not nice watching thing. it on my i'm not watching on my cross-country flight to, to yeah Atlanta, i'll tell you that <laughs> all right I'll boys um uh, i was gonna ask you so he, he has alzheimer's so when he got on stage would he remember all of his lyrics Dude, yeah, that's like I almost don't want to spoil it, but some people might not see it. Anderson Cooper did the segment, and like he's sitting there and he's not remembering like five minutes ago, but he went over to his his piano guy, starts playing the piano, and he started singing it. And he for an hour, he didn't have to look at a cue card, a note. It, it was like muscle memory. His doctor comes on and explains like how the brain functions, but he come on, he sang for like an hour just standing by the piano. Like, after not wow. knowing where he was 10 minutes ago. And then to do the concert, like, right when the curtains open, it, it just, it was just such a, uh, like, a wonderful thing to see. And like I'm I said, check it, out it was something sure. I, I, like I said, I was very moved by it. And I just wanted to share with other people. If It's just, a, you know, we, I don't know, maybe I'm getting older in life, a little more sentimental. And we all know people, unfortunately, who have, who have these memory problems and dementia and Alzheimer's. And I, I think it's something people should watch. And I think they would appreciate it. So that's all awesome. I got. I don't know if you boys have any. Well, I was going to hop in on the music part. Yeah. Um, and, and it kind of ties in. To, we can talk about the Brady Belichick the whole game last night, but uh, the Super Bowl halftime show that was announced. Now, I I don't typically get excited about him. Like, I, uh, who, who was who was the guy who did it last year? Uh, the weekend, like, uh, you know, it doesn't get my you know it doesn't get me going that much. This one, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Eminem, Mary J. Blige, and Kendrick Lamar. Now, I'd probably say the funniest thing about this is we sent the picture to the group chat, and Wit was like, I don't know who three of these people are. He didn't even recognize Eminem. <laughs> it didn't <laughs> look like dumb. Eminem, did it? it? No, he looks like the a suburban uncle. The graphic did Eminem dirty. I'm, I'm with Wit there, though. The well, graphic did do Eminem dirty. Well, he does He does have a beard now that he dies. It is a bit weird, and if you haven't seen him in a while, maybe you, I guess you couldn't have recognized, recognized him, but <laughs> you didn't know who Kendrick Lamar was? No, I had no idea what Kendrick Lamar looked like. Couldn't have picked You didn't know who Mary J. Blige was? Yeah, I think really? I said I didn't know who two of the three were, right? I'm... Oh, I thought it was three of them. Anyway, I think it's going to be an awesome show. They only got 12 minutes to share the stage. I think it's 12 to 14 minutes they get for the halftime show, so I don't know how many bangers each they're going to get, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic that that's the lineup. Mary J. Blige, man. What's the 411? One of the fucking best albums ever. Good shit. I can't believe that's almost uh, 30 Not as old. good as the Fugees. Mm, well, could could um, be a debate there in the community. Uh, fuck you, Wit. And, I did uh, not know that was Mary J. Blige. I thought that was Lil' Kim. <laughs> No, little Kim, she kind of she looks a little bit different now, right? She kind of changed up her Dude, look. Dude, Eminem looks like the Undertaker in this graphic. It's ridiculous. <laughs> he does. Oh, uh, dude, I heard one of his songs like when he was popular. I didn't listen to him really all that much. I don't. Know, I, I know he was wildly popular, but I heard one on Zarius the other day, and like, I'm surprised they haven't tried to like retroactively cancel him for like the stuff he said. If he ever come out with that today, they, it wouldn't get past fucking go. No. It's. I mean, I was. Well, he was trying to get canceled big well, right, time with all this. Uh, it was, was out. it was all being a provocateur. And I'm glad he did it. It was it was great art. But I was I happened to catch one of those like really like vicious songs about like killing his ex and all this shit. And I was like, oh my god, this would be fucking make Twitter explode if it came out in this day and age. So, uh, the other thing I had written down, 
Wrote. Written down? Written Wrote. Down? Jesus Christ. We're, it's getting late, folks. It is, boys. Uh, is uh, Steve Belichick mucking uh, an imaginary barn on the side? He definitely got 9 million DM slides after that clip last night. What was he doing? I don't know. He was on a bunch of fucking wolf coaching a football game, it looked like. I don't know, man. I don't know if you knew the camera's on him. I think we all maybe do goofy shit like that when we don't know people are looking, but that was a great Well, clip. I mean, he's the defensive coordinator, so many times the defense is on the field. Like you, he's got he's to know he's getting a pan every now and then. Yeah, he's a, I think he's a, what outside linebacker coach, I think. Yeah. Also, I think, I think P- him and I think oh. him and Mayo are the, the co-defensive coordinators, though. Did you see yeah, the I tweet so from too. PMT? They're like, hey, my friend over there likes you. And it's like, my friend... <laughs> And it was him, like, oh. licking everything. Twitter was out, out of its uh, mind when that was happening. Uh, I was fucking crying, man. Wow, Twitter, Twitter it's was funny yesterday. pretty cool, though, the seeing, um, like, the, the main reception when Brady ran on the field. Like, for me personally and all my buddies and R.A. and Grinelli, like, in my mind, the greatest athlete of all time, the big, the greatest winner of Next all time. Rogers. I know Aaron Rodgers in Biz's book, but not only did he, like, do it in New England, but... We got to watch it at like the best possible age you could ever like. T- I was twenty. I was twenty to forty, basically eighteen to now thirty nine. In terms of like getting to witness like history, so I'll never, I'll never like not root for Tom Brady. I, I love the guy. I think he's just uh, something else. The way he's gone about his entire career, and teammates love him. And it was cool to see him come back and. No surprise he got the W. So awesome, awesome night to watch. Yeah, all thanks to the defense. Yeah. Yeah, isn't it great? When you're older, wit, you appreciate it so much more. Because I was a kid, a teenager during Larry Bird. You know, I I mean, I watched, I went to a lot of Celtics games, but you didn't appreciate it as much as a teenager. Now you're, you know, you appreciate a guy like that more. So thanks. His his post game press conference and even on the on the field afterward, just like deflecting and thanking all his all his receivers, and talk about the emotional build up to that game. He said he was exhausted. Like, and that was a late start, too, for the East Coast. That's just a, a long week and a cool little uh, a cool little meet and greet with uh, Kraft in the hallway before the game after he talked to Breeze. And then on top of that, he, he, he passes the passing yard record yeah, in the game. A little, a, a little uneventful throughout the game in, in the way that it went down. But, it I ended mean, up being a got... pretty great game. I think people were expecting a shootout, but I, I highly entertain a football game. And I mean, ha- second ha- half was awesome. Hats off to Mac, Mac Jones. This kid, he, I mean, you could tell with NFL guys sometimes right away they're going to be good quarterbacks. And, and this kid looks like he's been in the league for a year or two already. So future's bright. Thanks, Tom. We enjoyed it. But what else you got, Biz? Anything? No, just Aaron Rodgers had a great day, too. Kind of overshadowed everything. <laughs> oh, oh, I got one last thing sports related. Teddy Purcell, congratulations on your first ever hole in one. I'm not exactly sure what course it was on, but 155 yards. I'm like, oh, what'd you hit? A seven or eight iron? He's like, no, a pitching wedge. So this guy can play, folks. Oh, and he's got some, uh, he's got uh, some uh, long uh, irons. My buddy and I, uh, Captain Action, the one arm bandit, Andrew Duramio, I brought him up. We won uh, the Anderson Cup uh, four ball this weekend at beautiful, historic Worcester Country Club. I believe it was hosted the first ever Ryder Cup. And um, we shot minus nine for the weekend, took it down uh, in a gross four ball. So that was awesome. And there was a sign on the 11th hole, 10th hole, it's a par three. It says Worcester Country Club, 11th hole, 1925 U.S. Open. So it was the 10th hole, must have been the 11th hole then. A defining moment in the game of golf. During the 1925 U.S. Open, Bobby Jones called a one-stroke penalty on himself for moving the ball as it lie in the high rough upon address. Only Jones saw the ball move. When praised by the press, Jones said, You might as well praise me for not robbing a bank. There is only one way to play the game of golf. So a pretty cool sign and a pretty cool title for the one-armed bandit and myself. So we appreciate everyone listening. That's the Eastern Conference preview. Next week, we'll bring you the Western Conference. And God knows who our Stanley Cup picks are going to be because they'll be coming at you soon enough. But we appreciate you guys all listening. And uh, nice chatting with you, boys. Uh, Bobby Jones, obviously right. not from Charlestown. By the way, the, the site, once again, is storeca.bostoolsports.com. Right, G? That is correct. It's our new store in Canada. If you live there, you want the swag, you can get it there and not pay through the nose anymore. We're so happy to do it for you. Again, thanks for joining us. Hopefully you have a great week, and we'll check back next week with yeah. the Western Conference Preview. 